Contributors Translator Benjamin Jowett, 1800s Translator Chat GPT, 2023 Editor Sir Adam S. Barnett Editor's Notes In Plato's Laws, Book 1 through 12 were changed to chapters and given titles that fit the chapter. New introductions were added to each chapter. Translated version of Bajamin Jowett has been added to the epilogue, this include the original languages that he gave examples of were all converted to modern English for the purpose of being inaudible. Epilogue Benjamin Jowett Translator Chat GPT 2023 the authenticity of the laws is adequately proven by several factors. Firstly, Aristotle, who resided in Athens during the last 20 years of Plato's life, cites the laws in his writings more than 20 times. Aristotle left Athens after Plato's death in 347 BC and returned 12 years later in 335 BC. Secondly, Isocrates, in his speech to Philip, refers to the laws and republics written by philosophers, which suggests that the laws were already in existence at the time of his writing in 346 BC, just a year after Plato's death. Thirdly, the comic poet Alexis, a contemporary of Plato, mentions an enactment about prices that appears in Laws 11. Finally, there is a unanimous consensus among later ancient writers regarding the authenticity of the laws, with no significant doubts raised by any ancient writers. Philippus of Opus, for example, is not credited with composing any part of the laws, but rather with copying them from wax tablets and possibly writing the eponymies. The fact that the longest and one of the best-known works attributed to Plato would be a forgery, even without external testimony, would be highly unusual in ancient literature. While the consensus of later writers is generally considered less reliable than contemporary testimony, their agreement carries more weight in this case because they also express doubts about the authenticity of the eponymies, a spurious work that serves as an epilogue to the larger work and is likely of a much later date. This indicates that the acceptance of the laws was not uncritical. Some modern writers have expressed suspicion about the laws of Plato, based partly on differences in style and form compared to his other works, as well as differences in thought and opinion. These suspicions are further fueled by the presence of similarities to passages in other Platonic writings. Critics note a lack of coherence in the dialogue, as well as a general inferiority in ideas, structure, manners, and style. They find the laws lacking the poetic flow, dramatic realism, vibrant characters, dialectical subtlety, attic elegance, luminous organization, and exquisite urbanity found in Plato's other works. Instead, they find tautology, obscurity, self-importance, sermonizing, rhetorical declamation, pedantry, egotism, awkward sentence structures, and peculiarities in word usage and idioms. The laws lack a sense of unity in their patched and irregular structure. The speculative elements of government and education are overshadowed by a narrow focus on economics and religion. The grace and cheerfulness of Athenian life are absent, replaced by a spirit of moroseness and religious intolerance. The charm of youth is lost, and the mannerisms of old age are unpleasantly evident. The connection between ideas is often imperfect, and there is a lack of organization, particularly in the enumeration of laws towards the end of the work. The laws contain flaws and repetitions, and the Greek text is at times ungrammatical and difficult to understand. Some passages display a cynical levity, while others convey a tone of disappointment and lamentation about human affairs. Critics also note poor imitations of thoughts that are better expressed in Plato's other writings. Lastly, they question how the mind that conceived the Republic could have left the Critias, Hermocrates, and Philosophus incomplete or unwritten, and instead devoted the last years of life to the laws. These suspicions can be categorized into five or six main areas of inquiry, the characters, the plan, the style, the imitations of other Platonic writings, the broader relationship between the laws and the Republic and other dialogues, and the comparison to the existing Athenian and Spartan states. I, in the Philebus, the distinctive character of Socrates has already disappeared, and in the Timaeus, sophist, and statesman, his role as the main speaker is taken over by the Pythagorean philosopher Timaeus and the Eleatic stranger. Plato seems to have realized in his later writings that the character and method of Socrates were no longer suitable for conveying his own philosophy. 
he becomes more dogmatic and less interrogative, speaking with the authority of a legislator. In the laws, Socrates is not mentioned at all. However, in the tradition of antiquity, Socrates is still identified with Plato to such an extent that in Aristotle's supposed critique of the laws in his work called Politics, Socrates is assumed to be the main speaker. The laws are discussed by three representatives from Athens, Crete, and Sparta. As expected, the Athenian takes the leading role as the protagonist, while the Cretan, as a leader of a new colony, has a special interest in the conversation. At least four-fifths of the answers are put into his mouth. The Spartan is every inch a soldier, a man of few words himself, better at deeds than words. The Athenian talks to the two others, although they are his equals in age, in the style of an expert lecturing to his students, he frequently praises himself, he has an exceptionally low opinion of the intelligence of his companions. Certainly, the boastfulness and rudeness of the laws is the opposite of the refined irony and courtesy that characterize the earlier dialogues. We are no longer in such good company as in the Phaedrus and Symposium. Manners are disregarded in the seriousness of the speakers, and dogmatic assertions replace poetic imaginings. The scene is set in Crete, and the conversation takes place during a walk from Gnosis to the cave and temple of Zeus, which occurs on one of the longest and hottest days of the year. The companions start at dawn and reach the point in their conversation that concludes the fourth book around noon. The god they are going to worship at the temple is the lawgiver of Crete, and this may be assumed to be the very cave where he gave his prophecies to Minos. However, the external details of the scene, which are briefly and poorly described, quickly disappear, and we abruptly dive into the subject of the dialogue. By contrast, we are reminded of the higher art of the Phaedrus, in which the summer's day, the cool stream, the chirping of the grasshoppers, the fragrance of the Agnes Castus, and the legends of the place are present in the imagination throughout the discourse. The typical Athenian apologizes for his countrymen's tendency to spin a long discussion out of slender materials, and in a similar spirit, the Lacedaemonian Megillus apologizes for the Spartan brevity, compare Thucydid, while also acknowledging that there may be occasions when long speeches are necessary. Megillus family is the proxenus of Athens and Sparta, and he pays a beautiful compliment to the Athenian, indicating the character of the work, which, although borrowing many elements from Sparta, is also influenced by an Athenian spirit. A good Athenian, he says, is more than ordinarily good because he is inspired by nature and not shaped by law. The love of listening, which is attributed to the Timocrat in the Republic, is also exhibited in him. The Athenian, on his part, takes pleasure in speaking to the Lacedaemonian about the struggle in which their ancestors jointly fought against the Persians. A connection with Athens is also indicated by the Cretan Clinias. He is related to Epimenides, whom, by an anachronism of a century, perhaps arising, as Zeller suggests, Platt. Stud, from a confusion of the visit of Epimenides and Diotima, SYMP, comma he describes as coming to Athens, not after the attempt of Silon, but ten years before the Persian War. The Cretan and Lacedaemonian hardly contribute at all to the argument, of which the Athenian is the explainer, they only provide information when asked about the institutions of their respective countries. They are ascribed a kind of simplicity or stupidity. At first, they are dissatisfied with the free criticisms that the Athenian makes about the laws of Minos and Lycurgus, but they accept his greater experience and worldly knowledge. They admit that there can be no objection to the inquiry, for in the spirit of the legislator himself, they are discussing his laws when there are no young men present to listen. They are unwilling to believe that the Spartan and Cretan lawgivers could have been mistaken in honor and courage as the first part of virtue and are puzzled to hear for the first time that goods are only evil to the evil. Several times they are on the verge of quarreling, and with effort, they learn to control their natural feelings, compare Shakespeare, Henry V, Act Three. SC2. In Book 7, the Lacedaemonian momentarily expresses irritation at the accusation that the Athenian makes against Spartan institutions, claiming that they encourage licentiousness in their women, but he is reminded by the Cretan that the permission to freely criticize them has been given and cannot be retracted. His only criterion for truth is the authority of the Spartan lawgiver, he is. Interested in the novel speculations of the Athenian but tends to prefer the ordinances of Lycurgus. All three interlocutors speak in the character of old men, 
which creates a pleasant bond between them. They have the feelings of old age towards youth, the state, and human affairs in general. Nothing in life seems to be of great importance to them, they are spectators rather than participants, and to the Athenian speaker, men in general appear to be the playthings of the gods and circumstances. Nonetheless, they have a paternal care for the young and are deeply influenced by religious sentiments. They would give confidence to the elderly by increasing their use of wine, which, as they grow older, is meant to loosen their tongues, and make them sing. The prospect of the existence of the soul after death is constantly on their minds, although they can hardly be said to possess the cheerful hope and resignation that animates Socrates in the Phaedo or Cephalus in the Republic. Plato seems to be expressing his own feelings and remarks of this kind. At the time of writing the first book of the Laws, he was at least 74 years old, if we assume he is alluding to the victory of the Syracusans under Dionysius the Younger over the Locrians, which occurred in the year 356. Such sadness was a natural result of declining years and diminishing abilities, which make men ask, after all, what profit is there in life? They feel that their work is coming to an end and are ready to say, all the world is a stage, or, in Plato's actual words, let us play as good plays as we can, although we must be sometimes serious, which is not agreeable, but necessary. These are feelings that have crossed the minds of reflective individuals throughout history, and there is no reason to associate the laws any more than other parts of Plato's writings with the very uncertain narrative of his life or to imagine that this melancholy tone is due to disappointment at failing to convert a Sicilian tyrant into a philosopher. 2. The structure of the laws is more irregular and less connected than any other of Plato's writings. As Aristotle states in the Politics, the majority of the text consists of laws, in books v. 6, 11, and 12, the dialogue almost completely disappears. These sections are more like raw materials for a work rather than a finished composition that can be compared to the other Platonic dialogues. To use Plato's own metaphor, some stones are neatly placed in the building, others are lying on the ground, ready to be used. It is likely true that the laws were not published until after Plato's death. It is easy to believe that he left behind imperfections that would have been corrected if he had lived a few more years. The arrangement could have been improved, the logical connections of the argument could have been made clearer, and the sentences could have been more precisely crafted. Some of the shortcomings may also be attributed to the weakness of old age. Even a rough draft of the Phaedrus or Symposium would have had a quite different appearance. However, there is an interest in possessing one of Plato's writings that is still in the process of creation. We must strive to find a thread of order that will guide us through this relative disorder. The first four books are described by Plato himself as the preface or introduction. After concluding that each law should have an introduction, Plato has the fortunate idea at the end of the fourth book that the preceding discourse serves as the introduction to the entire work. This introduction can be summarized as follows, the institutions of Sparta and Crete are acknowledged by the Lacedaemonians and Cretans to have had one purpose only, to instill courage in times of war. To this, the Athenian objects that a true legislator should frame laws with the aim of cultivating all virtues, not just one. It is better to possess both temperance and courage than to have courage alone, it is better to be faithful in civil conflicts than to be a good soldier only. Peace is better than war, and reconciliation is better than defeating an enemy. And one who seeks to attain all virtues should be trained in both pleasure and pain. Therefore, there should be social gatherings among the citizens, and a person's temperance should be tested in social settings, just as their courage is tested in times of danger. They should possess a fear of the right kind, as well as courage of the right kind. At the beginning of the second book, the discussion of pleasure leads to the topic of education, which in the early years of life is primarily a discipline imparted through the experience of pleasure and pain. The discipline of pleasure is primarily instilled through the practice of song and dance. The forms of these should be fixed and not subject to the whims of the masses. There will be choruses of boys, girls, and adults, all repeating the same refrain that virtue is happiness. One of them will set the standard for the rest, this will be the chorus of elderly minstrels, who will sing the most beautiful and useful songs. They will require a little wine to soften the harshness of old age and make them receptive to the laws. After establishing the first principle of politics, which is that peace, 
not war, is the true goal of the legislator, and briefly discussing music in social gatherings, Plato digresses at the beginning of the third book to speak about the origin of society. He first describes the family, then the patriarchal stage, which is an aggregation of families, and then the founding of regular cities like Ilium. Finally, he discusses the establishment of a military and political system like that of Sparta, which he also identifies with Argos and Messini, dating from the return of the Heraclidae. However, the aims of states should be good, or else, like the prayer of Theseus, they may be ruinous to themselves. This was the case in two out of three of the Heraclide kingdoms. They did not understand that the powers in a state should be balanced. The balance of powers saved Sparta, while the excessive tyranny in Persia and the excessive liberty in Athens have been the downfall of both. This discourse on politics suddenly becomes immediately practical, as Cleinias the Cretan is about to establish laws for a new colony. At the beginning of the fourth book, after examining the circumstances and location of the colony, the Athenian proceeds to make further reflections. Chance, God, and the skill of the legislator all play a role in the formation of states. The most favorable condition for the foundation of a new state is when the government is in the hands of a virtuous ruler who has the good fortune to live during the time of a great legislator. However, a virtuous ruler is a contradiction in terms. At best, we can hope to have magistrates who are servants of reason and the law. This leads to the question of what the political system of our new state should be. The answer is that we should fear God, honor our parents, and cultivate virtue and justice as our guiding principles. Laws must be clear, and we should instill in the citizens a predisposition to obey them. The legislator will teach as well as command, and to achieve this, they will include preambles before their main laws. The fifth book begins with a sort of hymn like passage, with another and higher preamble about the honor due to the soul. From this, the duties of a person to their parents, friends, supplicants, and strangers are derived. A person should be truthful and just, free from envy and excessive behavior of all kinds, forgiving of crimes that are not incurable and are partly involuntary, and possess a true sense of taste. The most noble life has the greatest pleasures and the fewest pains. After completing the introduction and addressing some preliminary matters, we now turn to the laws, starting with the establishment of the state. This state is not the best or ideal state, where everything is held in common, but rather the second best, where the land and houses are to be distributed among 5,040 citizens divided into four classes. There will be no gold or silver among them, and they are to have moderate wealth, respecting number, and numerical order in all things. In the first part of the sixth book, Plato finishes outlining the constitution by appointing officers. He explains how guardians of the law, generals, priests, wardens of town and country, ministers of education, and other magistrates are to be appointed. He also discusses the establishment of courts of appeal and the filling of gaps in the law. Next, the laws officially begin with regulations regarding marriage and the procreation of children, as well as property ownership, including slaves and other possessions. The laws also cover topics such as houses, married life, and communal dining for both men and women. The question of age in marriage leads to a discussion about the appropriate age for holding offices and military service, which had been previously overlooked. Resuming the order of the previous book, the discussion moves from marriage and birth to education in the seventh book. Education is to start before birth and continue for a period under the supervision of the state, with mothers and nurses playing a role. The education system includes music and physical training, with music encompassing reading, writing, playing musical instruments, arithmetic, geometry, and a basic knowledge of astronomy to prevent impiety in the future. Physical training is primarily focused on preparing for war. The topic of education, which was briefly touched upon in Book 2, is now fully explored. The eighth book contains regulations for civil life, beginning with festivals, games, contests, and military exercises. Plato envisions young men and women coming together during these occasions, which leads him to discuss relationships between the sexes, the negative consequences of indulging in passions, and potential remedies. He then moves on to agriculture, arts, and trades, buying and selling, and foreign commerce. The remaining books, 9 to 12, 
primarily deal with criminal offenses. The first category includes offenses against the gods, particularly sacrilege or theft from temples. Offenses against the state, such as conspiracy, treason, and theft, follow. The mention of theft prompts a distinction between voluntary and involuntary offenses, as well as curable and incurable offenses. Plato then delves into the more serious crime of homicide, differentiating between mere homicide, manslaughter, which is partly voluntary and partly involuntary, and murder, motivated by greed, ambition, or fear. He also addresses murders committed by relatives or slaves, intentional or unintentional wounds, anger-inflicted injuries, crimes involving or against slaves, and disrespect towards parents. Various forms of purification or degrees of punishment are assigned to these offenses, and the fear of punishment in the afterlife is invoked. At the beginning of Book X, all acts of violence, including sacrilege, are summarized in a single law. This law is preceded by a warning, in which offenders are informed that no one commits unholy acts or speaks unlawful words while maintaining belief in the existence of the gods. Instead, they either deny the gods' existence, believe that the gods do not care for humans, or think that sacrifices and prayers can influence the gods' actions. The rest of the book is dedicated to refuting these three categories of unbelievers and outlining the means for their reformation, as well as announcing their punishments if they persist in their obstinacy and lack of remorse. The eleventh book focuses on laws and admonitions concerning individuals, presented in no order. It covers laws regarding deposits and the discovery of treasure, slaves and formerly enslaved people, retail trade, bequests, divorces, enchantments, poisonings, magical arts, and similar topics. The twelfth book continues with the same subjects, passing laws concerning violations of military discipline, the important role of examiners in their burial, oaths in their violation, and the punishments for those who neglect their duties as citizens. The discussion then turns to foreign travel and the permission granted to citizens to journey abroad. The treatment of visiting strangers is also addressed, along with guidelines for their reception. Laws are added regarding sureties, property searches, possession rights through prescription, witness abduction, theatrical competitions, private warfare, and bribery in offices. Rules are established for taxation, economy and religious rituals, judges and their duties and sentences, as well as burial places and ceremonies. This is where the laws conclude. Lastly, a nocturnal council is established to safeguard the state. It consists of older and younger members who are expected to embody the virtue that forms the foundation of the state. They are to understand the unity within diversity and receive education in divine knowledge and other forms of knowledge that will enable them to fulfill their duties. 3. The style of the laws differs in several important ways from Plato's other dialogues. 1. It lacks character, power, and vivid illustrations. 2. It exhibits frequent mannerisms. Compare the introduction to the Philebus. 3. The sentences are structured and rhythmically different. 4. There is a variation in word usage. On the other hand, there are many passages, 5, characterized by a sore of ethical grandeur, and, 6, displaying a greater understanding of human nature and practical wisdom than any other of Plato's writings. 1. The conversation of the three elderly men is described by themselves as a game of play for old men. However, their treatment of the subject lacks the liveliness typically associated with a game. They do not engage in back-and-forth discussion but rather two of them listen while the third constantly asserts his superior wisdom and knowledge, apologizing, with good reason, for his own lack of clarity in speech. He claims to carry them over the stream, answering for them when the argument becomes too complex for their understanding. He fears their ignorance of mathematics and believes that discussing physical exercise would be more comprehensible to them. Despite repeating his words several times, they still cannot grasp his meaning. The subject matter does not lend itself well to dialogue, and the literary vigor of Plato has diminished. The old men speak as one would expect, and this adds a touch of dramatic truth. Plato has given the laws of form or lack thereof that indicates a failure of natural ability. There is no clear plan, no awareness of what has come before or what will follow, which is necessary for a perfect style. However, there are several attempts at a plan, the argument is interrupted, 
and frequent explanations are offered for introducing certain topics. The fictional elements in the laws lack the believability found in the Phaedrus, the Timaeus, or even the Statesman. It is unlikely that an educated Athenian would have placed Epimenides' visit to Athens ten years before the Persian War or imagined that a war with Messene prevented the Lacedaemonians from coming to the aid of Greece. The narrative of the origin of Dorian institutions, attributed to a fear of the growing power of the Assyrians, is a plausible invention that can be compared to the story of Atlantis and Solon's poem but it lacks the same deceptive artistry. The claim that the Dorians were Achaean exiles gathered by Dorius, and the assertion that Troy was part of the Assyrian Empire, have some basis, compare Diodorus Siculus for the latter point. Throughout the laws, there is a lack of vividness and detailed scene setting, which is characteristic of Plato as well as some modern novelists. The old men are afraid of being ridiculed and do not often make jokes. In one of the few instances of humor, the unfinished book of the laws is compared to a headless monster wandering about. However, the atmosphere of humor that pervades the symposium and the euthydemus is absent. Instead, the laws often leave an impression of dullness and weakness. Some of the most amusing descriptions, such as children crying for the first three years of life, or Athenians walking into the countryside with fighting cocks under their arms, or the slave doctor who mistreats his patients while the gentleman doctor persuades them politely, or the method of maintaining order in the theater with a hint from a stick, are narrated with a mundane seriousness. However, when we encounter this dry humor, it is safe to assume that the writer intended to make us laugh. The seriousness of old age replaces the joviality of youth. Life should have its holidays and celebrations, yet we scold ourselves when we laugh and take our pleasure sadly. The irony found in the earlier dialogues, with some traces appearing in the tenth book, is replaced by a severity that hardly acknowledges human affairs. Let us say, if you please, that man is of some account, but I was speaking of him in comparison with God. The imagery and illustrations are poor in themselves and are not enhanced by the surrounding language. In the Republic and the earlier dialogues, figures of speech such as the wave, the drone, the chase, and the bride appear and reappear at intervals. Certain themes are repeated, like notes in a musical composition. None of this subtle artistry is present in the laws. The illustrations, such as the two types of doctors, the three types of funerals, the fear potion, the puppet, the painter leaving a successor to restore his painting, the person stopping to consider where three ways meet, and the old laws about water that cannot be diverted from its course do not showcase Plato's inventive abilities. The quotations from poets have lost the fanciful quality that made them charming in the earlier dialogues. We grow tired of metaphors drawn from navigation, archery, weaving, painting, medicine, and music. However, comparisons such as life being a tragedy, the workings of the mind being akin to the revolution of the self-moved, or an aged parent being the image of a god dwelling in the house, or the reflection that man is made to be the plaything of God, and that this, when properly considered, is the best part of him, possess great beauty. 2. The clumsiness of the style is evident in frequent mannerisms and repetitions. The perfection of the Platonic dialogue lies in the precision with which the question and answer fit together, and the regularity with which the steps of the argument progress. This polished style is no longer present in the laws. The answers lack variety, the respondents can only provide simple responses like yes or no, true, of course, and so on. The insipid phrases what do you mean, and to what are you referring, constantly recur. The speaker in the text is repeatedly accused, or accuses himself, of being unclear, and promises to explain his views more clearly. The writer's thought process is evident on the surface. The Athenian character praises himself unabashedly, unlike the ironic tone found in earlier dialogues. For example, he declares that the laws are a divine work given by some inspiration of the gods, and that youth should commit them to memory instead of the compositions of the poets. The use of prosopopoeia, which Plato employed in the Protagoras and other dialogues, is repeated to the point of weariness. The legislator is always addressing the speakers or the youth of the state and the speakers are constantly making addresses to the legislator. There is also a tendency towards paradoxical statements, such as we must have drinking and we must have a virtuous tyrant. 
These statements are too much for the less intelligent individuals from Lacedaemon and Crete, who initially react with surprise. The tone of the dialogue is predominantly hortatory, the laws are not only laws, but also sermons. They are considered to have a religious sanction and to be based on a religious sentiment in the minds of the citizens. The words of the Athenian are attributed to the Lacedaemonian and Cretan characters, who are supposed to have made them their own, as in the earlier dialogues. The text frequently resumes topics that were only partially addressed in previous passages. The organization lacks the clarity of art and the freedom of nature. Irrelevant remarks are scattered throughout, and there are illustrations that are not properly integrated. The dialogue is generally weak and labored, and in the later books, it seems to be abandoned because it is unsuited to the subject of the work. The long speeches or sermons of the Athenian, often spanning several pages, lack the grace and harmony found in the earlier dialogues. Plato is not capable of sustained composition, his genius lies more in the dramatic rather than the oratorical realm. He can converse, but he struggles to make a speech. Even in the Timaeus, which is one of his most polished works, there are abrupt transitions. The difference between the dialogue and the continuous discourse of Plato is like the distinction between the narrative and speeches of Thucydides. The perfection of style lies in variety within unity, freedom, ease, clarity, and the ability to express anything and evoke any human emotion without impropriety. Plato possesses this divine gift of language in the Symposium and Phaedrus. However, there are many shortcomings in the laws. Firstly, the sentence structure is rhythmic and monotonous, as the formal and sophistical manner of the time supersedes Plato's natural genius. Secondly, many sentences are excessively long, and the latter part often forgets the beginning. It seems that they were never given a second thought by the author. The emphasis is often misplaced, clauses lack a clear point, absolute cases are not properly separated from the rest of the sentence, words are aggregated without showing their relation to each other, and connecting particles are omitted at the beginning of sentences. The use of relative and antecedent pronouns is more indistinct, and there are more frequent changes in person and number. Examples of pleonasm, tautology, periphrasis, antitheses of positive and negative, false emphasis, and other affectations are more numerous in the laws compared to Plato's other writings. There is also a more common and sometimes meaningless use of qualifying phrases, such as os epos ipian, as it were to say, kata dunamine, according to one's ability, and double expressions like pant pantos, all in every way, udam udamos, neither at all, opos kaiope, in whatever way. These occurrences are too numerous to be attributed to errors in the text. Furthermore, there is an excessive preoccupation with the adjustment of verbs and participles, nouns, and epithets. Artificial forms of cadence and expression replace natural variety. Thirdly, the absence of metaphorical language is notable. The style is not devoid of ornamentation, but the ornamentation is of a debased rhetorical kind, added on rather than growing naturally from the subject. Plato has a great command of words, but his use of them feels labored. There are forced attempts at metaphor in several passages, such as paracatuing logois, to cultivate with words, ta men os tithemena ta dos paratithemena, what is set down and what is added, oinos kalazamenos euponifantos eterithiu, wine punished by the cloud of another god, and plays on the word nomos, law, such as nude yenom, mind's distribution, and ode etera, songs wanderings. Fourthly, there is a foolish extravagance of language in other passages, such as the swinish ignorance of arithmetic, the justice and suitableness of the discourse on laws, and overemphasis, such as calling all Greeks best of Greeks. Fifthly, poor and insipid illustrations are also common. Lastly, there is an excessive use of climax and hyperbole, such as Iskron Legion Cre pros autis dolan te kai dolan kai pi da kai e i p o s oyan te olan ten oikian. It is shameful to say that they should be slaves and slaves and children and whatever else in their own households, and doki i tuto to epididuma kata fusin tas peri ta aphrodisiae donas o u monan anthropon ala kaitherion diaphtharkani, this seems to be a natural result, that the pleasures of love should be shared not only by men but also by animals. Zeller and Stahlbaum have collected peculiarities in the use of words in the laws. These include nouns such as allodemia, 
foreignness, apeniotesis, lack of poverty, glucothymia, sweetness of temper, diatheter, one who has a will, thrasicenia, boldness towards strangers, koros, satiety, metalanoia, boastfulness, and pedoergia, childishness. They also include adjectives such as ace tor, unmanly, biodotes, giver of life, ectodopos, hateful in appearance, ithios, truly, chronios, lasting, and adverbs such as anititai, without distinction, anity, upwards, nepoivii, in a dreamlike manner. In terms of verbs, they include athurian, to be insolent, isian, to praise, ipian, to say, euthymonesthi, to be prosperous, parapodizesthi, to disobey, sebian, to worship, temeline, to cut, and tetan, to stretch. Stahlbaum notes that these words are formed according to analogy and are supported by poetic or other authorities. Zeller and Stahlbaum have also collected forms of words in the laws that differ from the forms of the same words found elsewhere. For example, blabos instead of blabe, stammer, abios instead of abiotos, unlivable, acaristos instead of acharis, ungracious, deleos instead of delicos, slavish, pedelos instead of pidicos, childish, exagrio instead of exagriano, to be wild, iliumai instead of alaskamai, to propitiate, and the ionic word sophronistus, correction. Zeller has also noted a fondness for substantives ending in ma and cis, such as georgima, farming, diapama, a drink, epithomoma, desire, zemioma, injury, comedema, a joke, amalima, a song, blapsis, a reproach, loiteresis, abuse, paragelsis, command, and others. There is also a use of substantives in the plural that are commonly found only in the singular, such as maniae, madnesses, atheotetes, godlessness, thonoi, envies, phoboi, fears, fusius, natures. Additionally, there is a peculiar use of prepositions in composition, such as anargo, to work out, apoblapto, to hinder, dianomathedio, to distribute, diaretai, to divide, dulabasthi, to take by force, and others. The laws also frequently uses the ionic dative's plural in ac and oisi, perhaps for the sake of giving an ancient or archaic effect. He has added a list of peculiar expressions and constructions to these unique characteristics of words. Some of the most notable ones include, athutopalican spermata, unusual mixtures of seeds, amorphoi edri, shapeless beds, osa axiomata pros arcantas, whatever principles for rulers, oikata palan kairoi, the times according to the city, muthos, used in several places to mean the discourse about laws, and the frequent use of paramuthian and paramutheistai in the general sense of address or addressing. Other examples include imulos eros, unrequited love, adaphoi praxius, unlawful actions, muthos akephalos, headless discourse, and ethos euthuperon, well-disposed character. The author also notes the frequent use of abstract words instead of concrete ones, such as euparesia for superiors, fugai for fleas, mechani in the sense of contrivers, delia for slaves, basilii for kings, and menomena kadumata for mad women. Other examples include e crea ton paidon in the sense of needy children, and paidon iconotes, sufficiency of children. The phrase to ethos tes aperias is used instead of e iothuia aperia. The poverty of experience, and cooperitin ups te kaikali thaumasia is used instead of cooperitoi mala upsali kaikale, more abundant heights and beauties. The author also notes some interesting uses of the genitive case, such as filius omologiae, confessions of love, maniae orgs, madness of anger, lamargiae edens, songs of lamentation, kaimanon anipadesiae, unshod winters, and anogioi plegin tolmai, unholy blows of daring. The dative case is used in phrases like omilii ekthroys, speeches to enemies, and nomothesiae epitropois, laws to guardians. The author also mentions some uncommon periphrases, such as thremata nilu, roarings of the Nile, zugginator technon, child of a foreigner, mouses lexis, speech of muses, zagraphon pades, painter's children, and anthropon spermata, seeds of men. The author also notes the fondness for particles of limitation, especially tis and ge, as seen in phrases like sun tisi chirizi, with some grace, and toys ge dinaminois, to those who are able. 
the pleonastic use of tannin, OS, OS eros ipian, and echistote is also mentioned, as well as the periphrastic use of the preposition peri. The author also observes the tendency to use hyperbola or transpositions of words, as well as rhythmical uniformity and grammatical irregularity in sentence structure. Stahlbaum finds some sort of authority for nearly all the expressions that Zeller uses as arguments against the authenticity of the laws. There is no real reason to doubt that the work was written by Plato simply because it contains words that are not found in his other writings. An imitator may preserve a writer's usual phraseology better than the writer himself. However, the fact that authorities can be quoted in support of most of these word uses does not mean that the diction is not peculiar. Several of them seem to be poetic or dialectical and show an attempt to expand the boundaries of Greek prose by incorporating Homeric and tragic expressions. Most of these expressions do not seem to have had any lasting impact on the later Greek language. Like some language experiments of writers during the Elizabethan era, they were eventually lost and, although occasionally found in Plutarch and imitators of Plato, they were not accepted by Aristotle or integrated into the common dialect of Greece. The laws, despite their uneven style, contain a few passages that are very grand and noble. For example, the address to the poets, best of strangers, we also are poets of the best and noblest tragedy, for our whole state is an imitation of the best and noblest life, which we affirm to be indeed the very truth of tragedy. Another example is the depiction of young men and women in friendly interaction, which suggests the dangers that youth face from the intensity of passion. There is also an eloquent condemnation of unnatural desires in the same passage. The work includes the thought-provoking idea that the best legislator orders war for the sake of peace and not peace for the sake of war. There is a charming allusion to Athenians as inhabitants of Attica, with the suggestion that they are worthy of being named after the goddess Athena because they return to first principles. There is also a concise statement that many a victory has been and will be suicidal to the victors, but education is never suicidal. The work includes the powerful expression that the walls of a city should be allowed to sleep in the earth, and that we should not attempt to unearth them. There is the observation that God is the measure of all things in a sense far higher than any man can be, and the belief that a man should be from the first a partaker of the truth, that he may live a true man as long as possible. The principle is repeatedly emphasized that the sins of the fathers are not to be visited on the children. The laws describe the funeral rites of priestly sages who depart in innocence and express the noble sentiment that we should treat slaves more justly than equals. There is a curious observation, perhaps based on Plato's own experience, that there are a few divine men in every state, however corrupt, whose conversation is of inestimable value. The work also makes the astute observation that public opinion should be respected because people's judgments about virtue are often better than their actions. The Tenth Book of the Laws is characterized by a deep religious and modern feeling, regardless of what one may think of the arguments presented. It conveys a sense of the duty to live as part of a whole and to depend on the will of God, who cares for the smallest things as well as the greatest. The book includes a depiction of parents praying for their children, not as if there were no truth or reality in other religions, but as if there were the greatest truth and reality. These passages are particularly striking to us. It is important to remember that unlike the Republic, the laws do not present an ideal state, but are meant to reflect human motives and feelings. They are also influenced by popular religion, although in an elevated and purified form. Therefore, there is an attempt to show that what is pleasant is also just. However, the priority of the soul over the body and of God over the soul is always emphasized as the true motivation for virtue, especially at the beginning of Book V. The work of legislation is traced back to the fundamental principles of morality. No other writing by Plato demonstrates such a profound understanding of the world and human nature as the laws. The idea that cities will continue to suffer until they are better governed is a theme present in both the laws, the statesmen, and the republic. The concept of the balance of power preserving states, the belief that no one lives their entire life in disbelief of the gods, the observation that a person's character is best seen in social interactions, the recognition that the people should not only participate in government but also in the administration of justice, the desire to create laws that promote all virtues and not just courage, 
the understanding that education begins at birth, the attempt to purify religion, the modern. Reflections that punishment is not meant to be vindictive and that limits must be placed on inheritance, the impossibility of convincing victims of fraud and deception, the provision for clean water and other health requirements, and the respectful treatment of the dead while minimizing harm to the living, all of these ideas demonstrate a great depth of political wisdom, especially considering that they were written during a time when political thought was still in its early stages. The laws of Plato contain numerous passages that closely resemble other passages in his writings. At first glance, one might suspect that this repetition is evidence of an imitator with an uneven hand. Why would a writer repeat, in a less perfect form, what they had already expressed in their most polished style? However, it can also be argued that as an author's original abilities begin to decline, they become more prone to repetition, both in conversation and in their written works. They may have forgotten what they had previously written or be unaware of their own diminishing skills. This raises an interesting question regarding the authenticity of ancient writers. Is there a way to distinguish genuine similarities from spurious ones, or in other words, the repetition of a thought or passage by the author themselves from its appropriation by another? This question has perhaps never been fully explored and does not lend itself to a precise answer. However, a few general considerations can be offered. Firstly, is the difference in style such as one might expect to arise from different stages of life or varying circumstances? It would not be surprising for a writer to lose some of their originality as they age and become more influenced by the spirit of their time. The famous English author who exclaimed, What a genius I had when I wrote that book, upon revisiting one of their early works in old age, exemplifies this phenomenon. It would also be unsurprising for a writer to experience a decline in their ability to express themselves and create a harmonious composition with language. If the variation in style is consistent, it is more likely attributable to natural causes rather than the imitator's artifice. The inferiority may result from a weakening and less active mind. However, the natural decline of a great author would typically differ from the artificial weakness of an imitator, it would be continuous and uniform. The imitator, on the other hand, would tend to insert irregular patches into their work, sometimes directly taken from the writings of the author they are impersonating, but rarely capturing their spirit. Their imitation would be obvious, irregular, and superficial. The patches of brilliance would stand out amidst their worn-out and tattered prose. They would rarely take the effort to express the same thought in different words. While there were successful forgeries in English literature 50 or 100 years ago, it is doubtful whether such attempts could go undetected today, given the availability of the same authors or contemporaneous writings for comparison. Ancient forgers were far less skilled than their modern counterparts, lacking the mastery of deception and often lacking a motive for such deception. Secondly, the imitator is typically least capable of understanding or imitating the most characteristic aspects of a great writer. In every writer's work, there is something unique to them that sets them apart from others and gives them their individuality. To appreciate this hidden quality would require a kindred mind, as well as meticulous study and observation. There are certain similarities that can be considered unintentional coincidences, so distant from one another that they cannot be borrowed. Yet, when compared, they find a natural explanation in the fact that they are the product of the same mind. The imitator may copy the stylistic turns, repeat images or illustrations, but they cannot penetrate the inner circle of Platonic philosophy. They may understand the parts of Plato's philosophy that became popular in the next generation, such as the doctrine of ideas or numbers, or the concept of communism. However, the deeper insights of Plato regarding the science of dialectic, the unity of virtue, or the idea of a person who is above the law would be unintelligible to the imitator. Lastly, the argument from imitation takes on a different character when the supposed imitations are found alongside other passages that bear the mark of original genius. The strength of the argument from unintentional coincidences in style is greatly enhanced when they are juxtaposed with thoughts and expressions that could only have come from a genuinely great and original writer. The great excellence, not only of the entirety, but even of the individual parts of writings, is a strong proof of their authenticity because while a great writer may fall short, a forger or imitator cannot surpass themselves by much. 
whether we can attribute the worst parts of a work to a forger and the best to a great writer as is the case with some of Shakespeare's plays depends on the likelihood that they have been added later or are the result of collaboration between two writers. This can only be established through explicit evidence or by comparing other writings of the same kind. If it could be shown that the interpolation or dual authorship of Greek writings during Plato's time was common, then a question, perhaps unsolvable, would arise not about the entirety, but about which parts of the Platonic dialogues are genuine, and if only parts, which parts. Hebrew prophecies, Homeric poems, and the laws of Manu may have grown together in ancient times, but there is no reason to believe that any of Plato's dialogues are the result of a similar process of accumulation. Therefore, it is hasty to say, as Ankin does, in Dystotsler de Aristoteles, that the form in which Aristotle knew Plato's laws must have been different from the form in which they have been passed down to us. It must be acknowledged that these principles are difficult to apply. Yet, a criticism based on probabilities or impressions may still be worth making. There will be great disputes about the merits of different passages, about what is truly characteristic and original versus trivial and borrowed. Many have considered the laws to be one of Plato's greatest writings, while Mr. Grote believes they hardly rise above the level of forged letters. The way in which a writer would or would not have written at a particular stage of life must be recognized as a matter of conjecture. But enough has been said to demonstrate that certain types of similarities, whether criticism is able to detect them, may be attributed to an original writer rather than a mere imitator. Applying these principles to the laws, we can now point out that they contain the kind of refined or unconscious similarities that indicate authenticity. The parallelisms are like the repetitions of favorite thoughts that everyone is prone to in conversation or writing. They are found in a work that contains many beautiful and remarkable passages. Therefore, we can begin by claiming this presumption in their favor. These unintentional coincidences, as we may call them, include the following, the concept of justice as the combination of temperance, wisdom, and courage, laws, republic, the implicit idea of dialectic implied in the notion of dividing laws according to the types of virtue, laws, the approval of the method of deriving one idea from many things, which no truer method was ever discovered by any man. Compare Republic, or the description of the laws as parents, laws, Republic, the assumption. That religion has already been settled by the Oracle of Delphi, laws, Republic, to which an appeal is also made in specific cases, laws, the notion of the battle with oneself, a paradox for which Plato somewhat apologizes in both the laws and the Republic, the remark, laws, that just men, even if they are physically deformed, can still be perfectly beautiful in terms of the excellent justice of their minds, compare Republic, the argument that ideals are not worse because they cannot be. Realized, laws, Republic, the close approximation to the idea of the good and the principle which is common to all four virtues, a truth that the guardians must be compelled to recognize, laws, compare Republic, or the recognition through reason of the right pleasure and pain, which had previously been a matter of habit, laws, Republic, or the blasphemy of saying that the excellence of music is to give pleasure, laws, Republic, again, the story of the Sidonian Cadmus, laws, which is a variation of the Phoenician tale of the earth-born men, Republic, the comparison of philosophy to a yelping female dog, both in the Republic and in the laws, the remark that no man can practice two trades, laws, Republic, or the advantage of the middle condition, laws, Republic, the tendency to speak of principles as molds or forms, compare the imitation of song, laws, and the forms of religion, republic, or the remark, laws, that the relaxation of justice makes many cities out of one, which can be compared with the republic, or the description of lawlessness creeping in little by little through the fashions of music and overturning all things a paradox to us, but a fixed idea in Plato's mind which is found in the laws as well as in the republic, or the figure of the parts of the human body under which the parts of the state are described, laws, republic, the apology for delay and verbosity, which occurs frequently in the republic, is taken to an extreme in the laws. Compare Theotetus, the remarkable thought, laws, that the soul of the sun is better than the sun agrees with the relationship between the idea of the good and the sun in the republic, and with the substitution of mind for the idea of the good in the philebus the passage about the tragic poets, laws, generally agrees with their treatment in the Republic, 
but is more finely conceived and developed in a nobler spirit. Some lesser similarities of thought and style should not be overlooked, such as the mention of students at 30 years old in the Republic and choristers at 50 years old in the laws, or the creation of citizens out of wax, laws, compared to the other metaphor, Republic, or the number of the tyrant, 729, which is nearly equal to the number of days and nights in a year, 730 compared to the slight correction of the sacred number 5040, which is divisible by all numbers from 1 to 12 except 11, and divisible by 11 if two families are subtracted, or once again, we can compare the complaint about the ignorance of solid geometry in the Republic and the puzzle about fractions with the difficulty in the laws regarding commensurable and incommensurable quantities and the malicious emphasis on the word gunikios, laws, with the use of the same word, Republic. These and similar passages indicate that the author of the Republic is also the author of the laws. They are echoes of the same voice, expressions of the same mind, coincidences too subtle to have been invented by the ingenuity of any imitator. The force of the argument is strengthened when we consider that no passage in the laws is exactly copied, nowhere do five or six words occur together that are found together elsewhere in Plato's writings. In other dialogues of Plato, as well as in the Republic, there are parallels with the laws. These resemblances, as we might expect, occur mainly, but not exclusively, in the dialogues that we can assume, for other reasons, to be of a later date. For example, the punishment of evil is to be like evil men, laws, as he also says in the Theotetus. We can also compare the interdependence of tragedy and comedy, which he explains in the laws, for serious things cannot be understood without laughable, nor opposites at all without opposites, if a man is really to have intelligence of either. Here he presents the principle that forms the basis of Socrates' thesis in the Symposium, that the genius of tragedy is the same as that of comedy, and that the writer of comedy ought to be a writer of tragedy also. There is a truth and right that is above the law, laws, as we also learn from the statesman. The idea that men are the possession of the gods, laws, is a reflection that also occurs in the Phaedo. The remark, whether serious or ironic, laws, that the sons of the gods naturally believed in the gods, because they had the means of knowing about them, is found in the Timaeus. The reign of Kronos, who is the divine ruler, laws, is a recollection from the statesman. It is noteworthy that in the sophist and statesman, sophomore, Plato, speaking as the Eleatic stranger, has already assumed the role of the old man. The madness of the poets, again, is a favorite notion of Plato's, which also appears in the Laws, as well as in the Phaedrus, Ion, and other works. There are traces in the Laws of the same desire to base speculation on history that we find in the Critias. Furthermore, there is a striking parallel with the paradox of the Gorgias, that if you do evil, it is better to be punished than to be unpunished, in the Laws. To live having all goods without justice and virtue is the greatest of evils if life be immortal, but not so great if the bad man lives but a short time. The question to consider is whether these are the kind of parallels that would be the work of an imitator. Would a forger have had the wit to select the most peculiar and characteristic thoughts of Plato? Would he have grasped the spirit of his philosophy? Instead of openly borrowing, would he have half concealed his favorite ideas? Would he have formed them into a whole like the laws? Would he have given someone else the credit he could have obtained for himself? Would he have remembered and made use of other passages from Plato's writings and never deviated from their phraseology? While we cannot assert these arguments as certain, we must acknowledge that such a comparison provides a new and weighty reason to believe that the laws is a genuine work of Plato. v. The relationship between the Republic and the laws is clearly explained by Plato in the laws. The Republic represents the best state, while the laws represents the best possible state under the existing conditions of the Greek world. The Republic is the ideal, a state in which no one claims anything as their own, which may or may not have existed in some distant land, under the rule of some god or son of a god, who can say, but is, in any case, the model for all other states and the example for human life. The laws explicitly acknowledge what the Republic only partially admits that the ideal is unattainable for us, but that we should lift up our eyes to the heavens and strive to regulate our lives according to the divine image. The citizens are no longer to have wives and children in common, and they are no longer to be governed by philosophers. 
However, the spirit of communism or communal living is to continue among them, although now the foundation of the state is reverence for the sanctity of the family and respect of children for their parents, rather than promiscuous unions. The sexes are to be as equal as possible, they are to dine together and engage in warlike pursuits, if the women consent, and they are to receive a common education. The legislator has taken the place of the philosopher, but a council of elders is retained, who will fulfill the duties of the legislator after he has passed away. The addition of younger individuals to this council through co-optation is an improvement on the governing body of the republic. The educational system and the laws is of a much lower kind than the one Plato conceived in the Republic. In the Republic, he wanted the rulers to be trained in all knowledge, with a focus on the idea of the good, of which the various branches of mathematical science are mere servants or ministers. In the laws, he primarily discusses popular education, stopping at the preliminary sciences. These sciences are to be studied partly for their practical usefulness, which he devalues in the Republic, and even more so to avoid impiety, which he does not mention in the Republic. He only lightly touches on dialectic, which is still to be retained for the rulers. However, traces of the old educational ideas remain in the laws. Plato still advocates for the banishment of poets, and since he finds the works of prose writers equally dangerous, he suggests replacing them with the study of his own laws. He strongly emphasizes the importance of mathematics as an educational tool. He remains opposed to Greek mythology, just as he did in the Republic, although he prefers not to speak openly about it out of respect for antiquity. He is willing to use fictional stories if they have a moral purpose. He often thinks about a golden age in which people respected oaths and were more inclined to believe in the gods. However, he acknowledges that we must create laws for the world as it is now, since the old beliefs have faded away. Although he is no longer as passionate about dialectic, he still wants the guardians to have a comprehensive understanding of various ideas and to recognize the common principle underlying the four virtues. He still recognizes the significant influence of music and believes that every young person should be trained in it for three years. He attributes the decline of Athenian society and the decline in morals partly to musical innovations, such as separating the instrument from the voice and divorcing rhythm from words. He also blames the influence of the mob who controlled the theaters. He advocates for equal education in music and physical training for both sexes, and he still sees physical training as having a primarily military purpose. In terms of marriage, his goal is still to produce the best children for the state. Like in The Statesman, he believes in uniting different types of people in marriage, such as passionate individuals with more reserved ones, and courageous individuals with gentle ones. He also reintroduces the concept of a virtuous tyrant, which was absent in the Republic. Throughout his writings, he consistently expresses a strong sense of disappointment and frustration with the rulers of his time. In the laws, philosophers are either ignored or, at best, not banished like the poets. Religion takes the place of philosophy in guiding human life. However, it is important to note that Plato's concept of religion is closely tied to morality and is a purified form of religion and mythology, as he discusses in Book Two of the Republic. There is no real contradiction between the two works. In a practical treatise like The Laws, Plato focuses more on religion rather than philosophy. Similarly, he appears to equate virtue with pleasure and seeks to find the common element among virtues, rather than maintaining his previous paradoxical claims that they are one or identical to knowledge. The dialectic and the idea of the good, which even Glaucon struggled to understand in the Republic, would be out of place in a less idealistic work. It is also possible that Plato's own interests and priorities shifted as he grew older, leading him to place less emphasis on the purely intellectual aspects of philosophy. There is some confusion in the passage when Plato mentions the Republic and refers to a third state that he plans to explain later. This illusion is unclear because it is not fully developed. Aristotle mentions a state that is neither the absolute best nor the best under existing conditions, but an imaginary state that lacks the necessities of life. This state seems to resemble the primitive society described in Book 3 of the Laws, but it is not certain if this is what Plato intended with his third state. It is possible that Plato intended to provide a historical sketch that would serve as a bridge between the laws and the unfinished Crishas, 
like how the Republic and the laws relate to each other. Alternatively, he may have wanted to describe a state that is closer to existing Greek states than the laws. Compared to the laws, the statesman is a much shorter work, but it combines both dialectic and political themes, which the larger work lacks. There are several similarities and differences between the two dialogues. In some ways, the statesman is even more idealistic than the Republic, as it looks back to a past state of paradise where the gods ruled over humanity, like the mention of Kronos' kingdom in the laws. Additionally, in the statesman, the Eleatic stranger goes beyond the concept of law to consider the living voice of the lawgiver who can address individual cases. This idea is echoed in the laws, where it is suggested that if someone could utterly understand the nature of things, they would not need laws to govern them, as knowledge surpasses any external authority. The theme of uniting opposite natures, which forms the basis of the political fabric, is also present in both dialogues. The laws are acknowledged by Plato as a second best, an inferior ideal that he turns to when he realizes that the city of philosophers is not feasible in practical politics. However, it is interesting to note that the higher ideal always resurfaces, as seen in Aristotle's politics, and that Plato does not seem to be any closer to reality or more in touch with ordinary life in the laws than in the Republic. It is also worth noting that the new ideal always falls short, and Plato does not consider one to be more achievable than the other. Managing human beings is challenging, and the legislator cannot account for the infinite variety of circumstances. Ultimately, the administration of laws must be left to future generations. And although Plato would have preferred to make the laws as permanent as they are in Egypt, he cannot escape the necessity of change. Eventually, Plato found it necessary to establish a nocturnal council, which was intended to preserve the intentions of the legislator. Some members of this council were even expected to travel abroad and observe the institutions of foreign countries, to lay the groundwork for changes in their own society. These changes, while not as extreme as those that might be proposed by a popular assembly, were still inconsistent with the stability that Plato sought to establish in Hellenic institutions. Plato himself became aware of this inconsistency, acknowledging that in the execution, things for the most part fall short of our conception of them, republic. This realization applies to ideals of government in general, we are always disappointed by them. It is impossible to achieve great things within the limited span of a human life, which is why we look to the future, Republic. As we grow older, we recognize that we no longer can actively pursue our ideals. We have had our chance and do not aspire to be more than human. We have received our wages and are going home. However, we do not despair for the future of humanity, because we have accomplished so little in comparison to the whole. We search in vain for consistency in both people and things. But we have witnessed enough progress in our own time to justify our belief that the world is worth working for and that a good person's life is not wasted. These reflections can help us understand and reconcile the various, seemingly inconsistent statements made by Plato in the laws. In the laws, the Republic can be described as the Spartan constitution attached to a government of philosophers. However, the laws also introduce an Athenian element. Many laws are borrowed from Athens, including the four classes from the constitution of Cleisthenes, which Plato considers the best form of Athenian government. The guardians of the law also bear some resemblance to the archons. In the laws, almost all officials are elected through a popular vote and by lottery. However, the assembly only exists for the purpose of elections and has no legislative or executive powers. The Nocturnal Council, which is the highest authority in the state, has several functions like the ancient Athenian Areopagus, which it seems to be modeled after. Life is meant to have a joyful and festive atmosphere, like Athens. There are backsheet choruses, and moderate drinking is encouraged for mature individuals. On the other hand, common meals, public education, and the crypt EIA are borrowed from Sparta, not Athens. The supervision of private life which is to be carried out by the governors, also has its roots in Sparta. Plato strongly dislikes naval power and extreme democracy, which is contrary to Athenian views. The best governed Hellenic states attributed the origin of their laws to individual lawgivers. These lawgivers were real people, although it is uncertain to what extent they created or only modified the institutions attributed to them. 
However, the lawgiver, while not a myth, was a fixed idea in the mind of the Greeks as fixed as the Trojan War or the earthborn Cadmus. The Athenians would often say, this is what Solon meant or said, to express their own understanding of right and justice or to argue a point of law. Plato's constant reference to the lawgiver and the laws is consistent with Greek ways of thinking and speaking. There is also a Pythagorean element in the laws, like the Republic. The highest form of education is arithmetic. Understanding the order of the heavenly bodies and reconciling the apparent contradictions in their movements is an important part of religion. The lives of citizens, as well as their vessels and coins, are to have a common measure. The number 5040 is considered a great blessing for the state. Plato is deeply impressed by the ancientness of Egypt and the unchanging nature of their ancient songs and dances. He is also amazed by the progress that the Egyptians made in the mathematical sciences, which made the Greeks seem inferior in comparison. However, he criticizes the Egyptians for their stinginess and inhospitality towards strangers. Plato has traced the development of states from their humble beginnings with a philosophical mindset. However, he remains silent about any future life or growth of the Hellenic world. He reflects that past time shapes states, Book 3, but he does not argue that this process is ongoing or that the institutions of nations are relative to their stage of civilization. If he could have permanently imprinted the will of the legislator on Hellenic states, he would have been satisfied. The most he expects from future generations is that they will address any omissions or correct any errors that younger statesmen may identify in his laws. Once institutions have undergone this process of criticism, he believes they should be fixed forever. The Preamble Book 1 Strangers, let me ask you a question, were your laws created by a god or a human? A god, stranger. In Crete, it is said that Zeus was their author, and in Sparta, as Megillus will tell you, it was Apollo. You Cretans believe, as Homer says, that Minos went to converse with his divine father every ninth year and brought back laws from him. Yes, and there was Radamanthus, his brother, who is considered among us to have been a very just judge. That is a reputation befitting the son of Zeus. And as you and Megillus have been trained under these laws, I may ask you to give me an account of them. We can discuss them during our walk from Gnosis to the cave and temple of Zeus. I have been told that the distance is considerable, but there are likely shaded areas under the trees where we, no longer young, can rest and converse. Yes, stranger, a little further ahead there are beautiful groves of cypresses and green meadows where we can rest. My first question is, why is the law ordained that you should have communal meals, practice physical exercise, and bear arms? My answer is that all our institutions have a military character. We live a military life even in times of peace, maintaining the organization of an army and having communal meals. Since our country is not suitable for heavy cavalry or infantry due to its ruggedness, our soldiers are archers equipped with bows and arrows. The legislator believed that war was the natural state of all mankind, and that peace is only a facade. He thought that possessions have no value unless they are protected against enemies. And do you think that superiority in war is the proper aim of government? Certainly, and my Spartan friend will agree with me. And are there wars not only between states, but also between villages, families, and individuals? Yes. And is a man his own enemy? You touch upon fundamental principles, like a true follower of the goddess Athena. This is even better as you will quickly recognize the truth of what I am saying, that all men everywhere are enemies of all, and everyone is an enemy of every other and of himself. Furthermore, there is a victory and defeat the best and the worst that each person experiences, not at the hands of another, but of themselves. And does this extend to states and villages as well as individuals? Certainly, there is a better element in them that is conquered or conquers the worse. Whether the worse ever truly conquers the better is a question that can be left for now, but your meaning is that bad citizens sometimes overcome the good, and in doing so, the state is conquered by itself. Conversely, when the bad are defeated, the state is victorious over itself. Similarly, in a family, there may be several brothers, and the bad may form a majority. When the bad majority conquers the good minority, the family becomes worse than themselves. 
the use of the terms better or worse than himself or themselves may be uncertain, but there can be no dispute about the intended meaning. Very true. Such a struggle could be resolved by a judge. And which judge would be better, the one who eliminates the worse and allows the better to rule, the one who allows the better to rule and makes the others voluntarily obey, or the one who eliminates only reconciles the two parties? Clearly, the last option. But the objective of such a judge or legislator would not be war. True. And since there are two types of war external and internal, with the internal being far worse, would not the legislator primarily focus on the latter? They would reconcile the conflicting factions and unite them against external enemies. Certainly. Every legislator aims for the greatest good, and the greatest good is not victory in war, whether civil or external, but mutual peace and goodwill. Just as in the body, health is preferable to the elimination of disease. A true statesman does not make war their objective, but rather peace. And yet, stranger, the laws of both Crete and Sparta primarily focus on war. Perhaps so but let us not argue about your legislators. Let us be understanding. They were just as serious as we are, and we must try to understand their intentions. The poet Tertius, you are familiar with his poems in Crete, and my Spartan friend is too familiar with them, he was an Athenian by birth and a Spartan citizen. Well, he says, I do not sing. I do not care about any man, however rich or happy, unless he is brave in war. Now, in the name of all of us, I would like to ask the poet a question. O Tertius, I would say to him, we agree with you in praising those who excel in war, but which kind of war do you mean? That dreadful war known as civil war, or the milder kind waged against foreign enemies. You say that you abhor those who are not eager to taste their enemies' blood, and you seem to primarily refer to their foreign enemies. Certainly, he does. But we argue that there are men far better than your heroes, Tertius. Another poet, Theognis the Sicilian, says that in a civil conflict, they are worth their weight in gold and silver. For in a civil war, not only courage, but also justice, temperance, and wisdom are required. All virtues are better than a part. The mercenary soldier may be ready to die at their post, but they are often violent and senseless creatures. The legislator, whether inspired or not, will create laws with the highest virtue in mind. This virtue is not mere courage, but loyalty in times of danger. Tertius' virtue, although necessary in his time, is truly of a lower quality. You are lowering the status of our legislator. No, we are not lowering him, but ourselves if we believe that the laws of Lycurgus and Minus were solely focused on war. A divine lawgiver would have considered all different kinds of virtue and arranged their laws accordingly. They would not have made laws only after the need for them arose laws about inheritances, heiresses, assaults, and the like. As you rightly said, virtue is the concern of the legislator. However, you made a mistake by attributing all legislation to a part of virtue, and to a lesser part at that. The purpose of laws, whether in Crete or any other place, is to make people happy. Now, happiness or good can be divided into two types, divine and human goods. Those who possess divine goods also possess human goods, but those who have lost the greater divine goods are deprived of both. The lesser goods include health, beauty, strength, and wealth. I am not referring to the blind god Pluto, but rather to a god who has eyes to see and follows wisdom. Wisdom, or the mind, is the most divine of all goods, followed by temperance. Justice arises from the combination of wisdom and temperance, and courage is the fourth and final virtue. These four virtues take precedence over other goods, and the legislator should organize all laws accordingly, with the human goods leading back to the divine goods, and the divine goods leading back to the leader, the mind. The laws should cover topics such as marriage, education, the various states, emotions, and experiences of people at every age in times of prosperity and adversity, in war and peace. The laws should establish a system of praise and blame for all these matters. There should also be regulations regarding property, contracts, rewards, punishments, and even funeral rites and honors for the deceased. The lawgiver should appoint guardians to oversee these matters, and the mind should harmonize the laws, ensuring that they align with temperance and justice. 
Now, I would like to know if the laws of Lycurgus and Minus, or rather, the laws of Apollo and Zeus, follow the same principles. We must examine the virtues, starting with courage, and then we can demonstrate how what came before is related to virtue. The Lacedaemonian says, I wish, stranger, that you would first critique Clinias and the Cretan laws. Yes, I will critique Clinias, as well as you and myself. Tell me, Megillus, were the communal meals and physical training established by your legislator with the intention of preparing for war? Yes, and hunting comes next in importance, followed by endurance of pain in boxing contests and beatings as punishment for theft. There is also the so-called Cryptia, or secret service, where our youth wander the country day and night without supervision, even going barefoot in winter and sleeping without beds. Additionally, they wrestle and exercise under the scorching sun, and they have many similar customs. Well, is courage only about facing fear and pain, or does it also involve facing pleasure and flattery? I would say it involves both. And which is worse, being overcome by pain or by pleasure? The latter. But did the lawgivers of Crete and Sparta legislate for a courage that is only capable of facing pain but not pleasure, or for a courage that can face both? I would say they legislated for a courage that can face both. If that is the case, where are the institutions that train your citizens to be equally brave against pleasure and pain, and to be superior to both internal and external enemies? We admit that we have no noteworthy institutions of this kind. I am not surprised, so I ask for patience from all of you in case the pursuit of truth leads any of us to criticize the laws of others. Remember that I am more accustomed to hearing criticisms of your laws than you are, for in well-ordered states like Crete and Sparta, although an old man may sometimes speak privately to a ruler or elder about them, the same liberty is not granted to the young. But now, since we are alone, we will not offend your legislator by conducting a friendly examination of his laws. Feel free to express your thoughts. My first observation is that your lawgiver instructed you to endure hardships because he believed that those who had not undergone this discipline would flee from those who had. However, he should have also considered that those who had never learned to resist pleasure would be equally vulnerable to those who had, and these individuals are often among the worst of humanity. Pleasure, like fear, would overpower them and take away their courage and freedom. Perhaps, but I must not hastily agree. Now, let us discuss temperance. What institutions do you have that promote temperance? We have communal meals and physical exercises. These practices have both positive and negative aspects, and, as in medicine, what is beneficial for one person at one time may be harmful for another person at another time. While communal meals and physical exercises have their benefits, they also contribute to civil unrest and seem to encourage unnatural love as has been observed in Miletus, Boeotia, and Thurii. It is said that the Cretans invented the story of Zeus and Ganymede to justify their immoral practices by citing the example of the god who was their lawgiver. Leaving aside the story, we can observe that all laws deal with pleasure and pain. These two sources are constantly present in human nature, and those who partake of them in the right amount and at the right time are happy, while those who indulge excessively are miserable. You may be right but I still believe that the Lacedaemonian lawgiver did well in prohibiting pleasure, judging by the outcome. There are no drunken revelries in Sparta, and anyone found intoxicated is severely punished. They are not excused, as an Athenian would be in Athens during a festival. I have personally witnessed Athenians drunk during the Dionysia, and I have seen the entire city of Tarentum, our colony, intoxicated on a similar occasion. I agree that these festivals should be properly regulated. However, I would respond, yes, Spartans, which is not your fault, but look at home and remember the promiscuity of your women. And to all such accusations, each one of us can reply in turn, do not be surprised, stranger, different countries have different customs. This may be a sufficient answer, but we are discussing the wisdom of lawmakers, not the customs of men. Now, let us return to the question of drinking. Should we practice total abstinence, like you do, or engage in heavy drinking, like the Scythians and Thracians, or moderate drinking, like the Persians? Give us weapons, and we will make all these nations flee before us. My dear friend, B. 
Be humble. Victories and defeats often arise from unknown causes and do not prove the goodness or badness of institutions. The stronger overcomes the weaker, just as the Athenians have overcome the Scenes, or the Syracusans have overcome the Locrians, who are perhaps the best governed state in that part of the world. People are quick to praise or criticize practices without investigating their nature. This is the case with drinking. One person brings many witnesses who sing the praises of wine, while another claims that sober men defeat drunkards in battle, only to be refuted in turn. I would like to approach the argument in a different manner, for if we consider numbers, there are two cities on one side and ten thousand on the other. I am willing to pursue any method that is likely to lead us to the truth. Let me present the matter in this way. Someone praises the useful qualities of a goat, while another has seen goats running wild in a garden and blames a goat or any other animal without a keeper. How absurd! Would a pilot who is seasick be a good pilot? No. Or a general who is sick and drunk with fear and ignorant of war be a good general? He should be a general of old women. But can anyone form an opinion of any society, intended to have a ruler, that they only see in a disorderly and lawless state? No. There is a convivial form of society, is there not? Yes. And has this convivial society ever been properly ordered? Of course, you Spartans and Cretans have never witnessed anything of the sort, but I have had extensive experience and made many inquiries about such societies and have rarely found anything right or good in them. We acknowledge our lack of experience and desire to learn from you. Will you admit that in all societies there must be a leader? Yes. And in times of war, this leader must be a courageous person, completely devoid of fear, if possible? Certainly. But we are now discussing a leader who presides over gatherings of friends, and as these tend to be rowdy, they above all others require a governor. Very well. This governor should be a sober and worldly person who will maintain, create, and increase the peace of the society. A drunkard in charge of drunkards would be remarkably fortunate if they avoided causing serious harm. Indeed, they would. Suppose someone were to criticize such gatherings, they may be right, but they may have only known them in their disorderly state, under a drunken host, and a drunken general or pilot cannot save their army or their ships. True, but although I see the advantage of an army having a good general, I do not equally see the benefit of a feast being well managed. If you are asking what benefit the state derives from the proper training of a single youth or a single chorus, I would reply, not much. But if you are asking about the overall benefit of education, I would answer that education produces good men, and good men act nobly and overcome their enemies in battle. Victory often leads to the downfall of the victors because it causes them to forget their education, but education itself never leads to downfall. You imply that the regulation of convivial gatherings is a part of education, how will you prove this? I will tell you. But first, let me offer an apology. We Athenians are often seen as talkative, while the Lacedaemonians are known for their brevity, and the Cretans are considered wise and reserved. Now, I fear that I may be accused of stretching a long discourse for meager material. For drinking cannot be properly ordered without a correct understanding of music, and music is connected to education, and discussing all these matters may be tedious, if you prefer, we can move on to another part of our subject. Are you aware, Athenian, that our family is your representative at Sparta, and that since my childhood, I have regarded Athens as a second home, and having fought your battles in my youth, I have become attached to you and love the sound of the Attic dialect? The saying is true that the best Athenians are exceptionally good because they are naturally good, therefore, rest assured that I will be glad to hear you speak as much as you please. I, too, adds Cleinias, have a connection that binds me to you. You know that Epimenides, the Cretan prophet, came and offered sacrifices in your city by the command of an oracle ten years before the Persian War. He told the Athenians that the Persian army would not come for ten years and would eventually leave, having suffered more harm than they had inflicted. Now, Epimenides was from my family, and when he visited Athens, he formed a friendship with your ancestors. I see that you are willing to listen, and I have the desire to speak, if only I had the ability. But first, I must define the nature and power of education, and through this path, we will journey to the god Dionysus. 
the man who wants to excel in anything must receive early training. The future builder must play at building, and the farmer at digging. The soldier must learn to ride, and the carpenter to measure and use tools. All the thoughts and pleasures of children should be focused on their future profession. Do you agree with me? Certainly. And we must remember that we are talking about the education of a perfect citizen who knows how to rule and how to obey, not a trainer or a ship captain. This education aims at virtue, not wealth, strength, or mere cleverness. To the good man, education is the most valuable thing and always needs to be renewed. We agree. And we have previously agreed that good men are those who can control themselves, while bad men are those who cannot. Let me give you an example that will support our argument. Man is one, but within him there are two foolish counselors who contend with each other, pleasure and pain. He has expectations from both, which we call hope and fear. He can reason about good and evil, and when the state affirms reason, it becomes law. We cannot follow you. Let me explain it differently, every creature is controlled by the gods, whether they are mere playthings or have any serious purpose, we do not know. But what we do know is that they are pulled in different directions by cords and strings. There is a soft golden cord that pulls them towards virtue, which is the law of the state. And there are other cords made of iron and hard materials that pull them in other directions. The golden influence of reason does not have the nature of force, so it requires ministers to overcome the other principles. This explains the idea that cities and citizens both conquer and are conquered by themselves. The individual follows reason, and the city follows law which is embodied reason either derived from the gods or from the legislator. When virtue and vice are distinguished in this way, education will be better understood, especially its relation to social gatherings. And now let us bring wine into the picture. Do you agree that wine stimulates passions? Yes. And does wine equally stimulate the reasoning faculties? No, it brings the soul back to a state of childhood. In such a state, a man has the least control over himself and is therefore at his worst. Very true. Then how can we believe that drinking should be encouraged? You seem to think that it should. And I am ready to defend my position. We would like to hear you prove that a man should make a beast of himself. You are talking about the degradation of the soul, but what about the body? Would any man willingly degrade or weaken his body? Certainly not. And yet, if he goes to a doctor or a fitness trainer, does he not make himself ill in the hope of getting well? Because no one would want to always take medicine or always be in training. True. And could convivial meetings serve a similar remedial purpose? And if so, wouldn't they be preferred over other forms of training because they are painless? But do they have such a purpose? Let us see, aren't there two kinds of fear, fear of evil and fear of a bad reputation? There are. The fear of a bad reputation is opposed to both the fear of pain and the love of pleasure. The legislator calls this reverence and greatly honors it, as does every good man. On the other hand, confidence, which is the opposite quality, is the worst fault of both individuals and states. This kind of fear or reverence is one of the two main causes of victory in war, with fearlessness of enemies being the other. True. So, should not everyone be both fearful and fearless? Yes. The right kind of fear is instilled in a person when they face shame, cowardice, or the temptations of pleasure and must overcome them. They must learn through many trials to conquer themselves if they are ever to become perfect. That is reasonable enough. And now, suppose that the gods had given mankind a drug that exaggerated every kind of evil and danger causing even the bravest man to lose his composure and become a coward. Courage and fearlessness are cultivated in the face of danger, but we must also consider how to train fear. We want to achieve fearlessness and confidence without the arrogance and boldness that often accompany them. Because love, ignorance, greed, wealth, beauty, and strength can both inspire courage and cloud the mind, don't they also drive the soul to madness and intoxication? Is there a better and more innocent way to test someone's character than through festive interaction? Would you make a deal with someone to determine their honesty? Or would you entrust your wife or daughter to them to see if they are licentious? 
no one would argue that the proposed test is fairer, faster, and safer than any other. Such a test would be particularly useful in political science, which seeks to understand human nature and character. Very true. Book 2. Are there any other uses for well-ordered drinking? There are, but to explain them, I must reiterate what I mean by proper education, which, if I am not mistaken, depends on the proper regulation of social interaction. A bold claim. Virtue and vice are initially experienced by children as pleasure and pain. Reason and fixed principles come later, and fortunate is the person who acquires them even in old age, for the one who possesses them is the ideal person. When pleasure and pain, love, and hate, are properly instilled in the still unconscious soul, and after reason is attained, they are found to be in harmony with reason, this harmony of the soul is virtue, and the stage before reason, anticipating reason, is what I call education. However, the refined sense of pleasure and pain tends to diminish over the course of life. Therefore, the gods, pitying the toils and sorrows of mortals, have allowed them to have holidays and have given them the Muses, Apollo, and Dionysus as leaders and companions. All young creatures love movement and play, and express sounds of delight. But only humans can find pleasure in rhythmic and harmonious movements. Education begins with these activities, and the uneducated person is one who has never experienced the discipline of the chorus, while the educated person is one who has. The chorus involves both dance and song, so the well-educated person must be skilled in both. But when we say, he sings and dances well, we mean that he sings and dances what is good. And if he believes that what is profoundly good is good, he will possess a much higher level of music and harmony within him and be a far greater master of imitation and sound and gesture than someone who does not hold this belief. True. So, if we know what is good and bad in song and dance, then we will know what education is. Very true. Let us now consider the beauty of physical form, melody, song, and dance. Will the same figures or sounds be equally suitable for the brave and the cowardly when they are in distress? How can they be, when their facial expressions are different? Figures and melodies have a rhythm and harmony that are suited to expressing different emotions. I should note, by the way, that the term color, which is a favorite word of music teachers, does not truly apply to music. And one type of harmony is akin to courage and all virtue, while the other is akin to cowardice and all vice. We agree. Do all people equally enjoy all dances? Far from it. So, do some figures appear beautiful when they are not? Because no one would admit that the forms of vice are more beautiful than the forms of virtue, or that they prefer the former to the latter. And yet, most people say that the purpose of music is to provide pleasure. But this is impious. However, others offer a more plausible explanation, basing excellence on personal likes or dislikes. Sometimes nature contradicts habit, or vice versa. And then they say that certain fashions or gestures are pleasant, but they do not want to display them in front of sensible people, even though they enjoy them in private. Very true. Do immoral rhythms and melodies cause harm, or do virtuous rhythms and melodies cause good to those who love them? Probably. Say, rather, certainly, because the leniency that we often show to immoral people inevitably leads us to become like them. And what could be worse than this? Nothing. Therefore, in a well-governed city, the poet will not be allowed to create songs for the people however they please, or to train their choruses without considering virtue and vice. Certainly not. However, they may do this anywhere except in Egypt, where ages ago they discovered the great truth that I am now asserting that the young should be educated in forms and melodies of virtue. They established and consecrated these forms and melodies in their temples and no artist or musician is allowed to deviate from them. They are the same as they were 10,000 years ago. And their practice suggests that legislation regarding music is not an impossible thing. However, the specific laws must be the work of God or of someone inspired by God, just as in Egypt, where their ancient chants are said to be the composition of the goddess Isis. The melodies that possess a natural truth and correctness should be enshrined in law so that the desire for novelty is not strong enough to change the old traditions. Isn't the origin of music as follows? 
we rejoice when we believe that we are prospering, and we believe that we are prospering when we rejoice. At such times, we cannot remain still, but our young men dance and sing, and our old men, who have lost the vigor of youth, delight in memories of the past as they observe the life and energy of the young. Most true. People say that the person who gives us the most pleasure at such festivals is the one who should win the prize. Are they correct? Possibly. Let us not rush to a decision, but first imagine a festival where the host proclaims that the victor will be the one who brings the most pleasure, regardless of the source. Let us also assume that there are performances by rhapsodists, musicians, tragic and comic poets, and even puppeteers. Which of these pleasure makers will win? Shall I answer for you? The puppeteers will entertain the children, the youth will prefer comedy, young men, educated women, and the public will prefer tragedy, and we old men are lovers of Homer and Hesiod. Now, which of them is correct? If you and I were asked, we would certainly say that the way of thinking of the old men should prevail. Very true. So far, I agree with the majority that the quality of music should be measured by the pleasure it brings. However, that pleasure must come from the good and educated, or even better, from a supremely virtuous and educated individual. The true judge must possess wisdom and courage. They must lead the crowd and not be led by them, and they must not weakly succumb to the noise of the theater or give false judgments after invoking the gods. The ancient custom of Greece, which still exists in Italy and Sicily, left the judgment to the spectators, but this custom has been the downfall of the poets, who only seek to please their patrons, and has degraded the audience by portraying inferior characters. What is the conclusion? The same one we have drawn many times before, that education is the training of young minds in what the law affirms, and the elders approve. And since the soul of a child is too young to be trained seriously, a kind of education has been invented that entices them with plays and songs, just as the sick are tempted with pleasant food and drinks. The wise legislator will compel the poet to express noble thoughts in appropriate words and rhythms in their poems. But does this practice exist anywhere other than in Crete and Sparta? In other states, as far as I know, dances and music are constantly changed according to the preferences of the audience. I am afraid I may have misled you. Not wanting to always find fault with humanity as it is, I described how it should be. But let me understand, you are saying that these customs exist among the Cretans and Lacedaemonians, and that the rest of the world would be greatly improved by adopting them? Much improved. And do you force your poets to declare that the righteous are happy and that the wicked, even if they are as rich as Midas, are unhappy? Or, in the words of Tertius, I do not sing, I do not care about him who is a great warrior but lacks justice, if he is unjust, I would not have him face death calmly or be swifter than the wind, and may he be deprived of every good thing that is, every true good thing. Even if a person has the things that people consider good first, health, next, beauty, and thirdly, wealth, there are others as well. A person may have all their senses purified and improved, they may be a tyrant and do whatever they please and live forever. But you and I will argue that all these things are good for the just, but for the unjust, they are the greatest of evils, if life is immortal, not as great if they only live for a short time. If a person had health, wealth, and power, and was insolent and unjust, their life would still be miserable. They may be attractive and rich and do as they please, but they would live disgracefully, and if disgracefully, then unhappily. I cannot agree with you on that. Then may heaven grant us the spirit of agreement, for I am as convinced of the truth of what I say as I am that Crete is an island. And if I were a legislator, I would exercise censorship over the poets, and I would punish them if they said that the wicked are happy or that injustice is profitable. And these are not the only matters in which I would have my citizens speak differently from the rest of the world. If I asked Zeus and Apollo, the divine legislators of Crete and Sparta, are the just and pleasant life the same or not the same, and they replied, not the same, and I asked again, which is happier, and they said, the pleasant life, this would not be a suitable answer for a god to give. Therefore, I should ask the same question to some legislator. And if they replied, the pleasant life, then I would say to them, O oh my father, didn't you tell me that I should live as justly as possible? And if being just means being happy, 
What is that principle of happiness or good that is superior to pleasure? Is the approval of gods and men considered good and honorable, even if it is unpleasant, and their disapproval the opposite? Or is neither doing nor suffering evil considered good and honorable, even if it is not pleasant? But you cannot make people like what is not pleasant, so you must make them believe that justice is pleasant. It is the legislator's task to clarify this confusion. They will show that the just and the unjust are the same as the pleasurable and the painful, from the perspective of the just person, and the opposite for the unjust person. And which judgment is truer? Surely that of the better soul. If it is not the truth, it is the best and most moral of fictions. The legislator who desires to spread this useful lie can take comfort in knowing that people have believed the story of Cadmus and the dragon's teeth, and therefore they can make people believe anything. They only need to consider which fiction will do the greatest good. This shall be our theme, that the happiest is also the holiest. It will be sung by all three choirs. First, the children's choir will enter, lifting their voices high. Following them, the young men will pray to the god Pian for favor and to confirm the truth of their words. Then, the choir of elder men, aged between thirty and sixty, will come forth. Lastly, the old men will share stories that reinforce the same virtues, speaking as if with the voice of an oracle. Now, you may ask, who are the members of the third choir? I previously spoke of the restless nature of young creatures, who jump about and call out in a disorderly manner. I mentioned that no other animal attains any perception of rhythm, but the gods gave us Apollo, the Muses, and Dionysus to be our playmates. I have already spoken of the first two choirs, and now I will speak of the third, or Dionysian, choir. This choir is composed of those who are between thirty and sixty years old. We agree that men, women, and children should always delight themselves with virtuous strains and that there should be a variety in these strains so as not to become weary of them. The most beautiful and beneficial strains will be sung by the elder men, and therefore we cannot exempt them. But how can we make them sing? Discreet elderly men are ashamed to hear their own voice in private, let alone in public. The only solution is to give them drink, which will soften the harshness of age. No one should be allowed to taste wine until they are eighteen. From eighteen to thirty, they may have a little. But when they reach forty years, they may be initiated into the mystery of drinking. This will make them more tender and receptive. When a man's heart is warm within him, he will be more inclined to delight himself and others with song. Now, what song shall they sing? In Crete and Lacedaemon, we only know choral songs. That is because your way of life is military. Your young men are like wild colts feeding in a herd together. No one takes an individual colt and trains him separately, attempting to give him the qualities of a statesman as well as a soldier. A colt trained in this way would be a greater warrior than those mentioned by Tertius, for he would possess courage and understand that courage is only the fourth virtue in importance. Once again, I must clarify, stranger, that I am not intentionally criticizing your lawgivers. I am simply following where the argument leads and trying to find a style of poetry suitable for those who dislike the common sort. In all things that have charm, either that charm is their good, or they have some accompanying truth or advantage. For example, in eating and drinking, there is pleasure and profit, which is health. In learning, there is pleasure and truth. The imitative arts also have a charm, as well as a law of proportion or equality. However, the pleasure they provide, however innocent, is not the measure of their truth. The test of pleasure can only be applied to things that have no other good or evil, no truth or falsehood. But that which possesses truth must be judged by the standard of truth alone. Therefore, imitation and proportion must be judged solely by their truth. As music is imitative, it cannot be judged by the criterion of pleasure. The muse we seek is not the muse of pleasure, but of truth, for imitation holds a truth. Therefore, the judge must know what is being imitated before deciding on the quality of the imitation. One who does not know what is true will not know what is good. Will anyone be able to imitate the human body if they do not know the number, proportion, color, or shape of its limbs? It is impossible. But suppose we know that a picture or figure is an exact resemblance of a man. 
Should we not also require knowing whether the picture is beautiful or not? The judge of the imitation must know the original, the truth, and the merit of the execution. Let us not tire in our attempt to bring music to the standard of the muses and of truth. The muses are not like human poets. They never spoil or mix rhythms or scales, or blend instruments and human voices, or confuse the manners and strains of people, or of freemen and slaves, or of rational beings and brute animals. They do not practice the baser forms of musical arts that the mature judgments mentioned by Orpheus would ridicule. However, modern poets separate meter from music and melody and rhythm from words. They use the instrument alone without the voice. As a result, the meaning of the rhythm and time are not understood. I am attempting to show how our 50-year-old choristers are to be trained and what they are to avoid. The opinion of the multitude on these matters is worthless. Those who are only made to step in time by sheer force cannot be critics of music. Therefore, our newly appointed minstrels must be trained in music sufficiently to understand the nature of rhythms and systems. They should select those that are suitable for men of their age and will enable them to give and receive innocent pleasure. This is a knowledge that surpasses that of both the poets and their general audience. Because while the poet must understand rhythm and music, they do not necessarily need to know whether the imitation is good or not, which was the third requirement for a judge. However, our chorus of elders must know all three to be the instructors of youth. Now, let us return to the original argument, which can be summarized as follows, a convivial gathering tends to become chaotic as the drinking continues, every person becomes intoxicated and believes they can rule the world. Certainly. And did we not say that the souls of the drinkers, when subdued by wine, become more pliable and malleable under the guidance of the legislator? They regain the docility of childhood. However, at times they become too bold and disorderly, drinking out of turn, and interrupting one another. And it is the legislator's task to instill in them that divine fear, which we call shame, to counteract this disorderly boldness. But to discipline them, there must be guardians of the drinking laws, and sober leaders who will oversee the common drinkers, they are as necessary in drinking as they are in fighting, and anyone who disobeys these Dionysian commanders will be equally disgraced. Very good. If a drinking festival were well regulated, people would leave not as greater enemies, as they do now, but as better friends. I am hesitant to speak about the greatest gift of Dionysus, for fear of being misunderstood. What is that? According to tradition, Dionysus was driven mad by his stepmother Hera, and to seek revenge, he inspired mankind with back-chic madness. But these are stories that I would rather not repeat. However, I do acknowledge that all men are born in an imperfect state and are initially restless, irrational creatures. This, as you will recall, has already been stated by us. I remember. And didn't Apollo, the Muses, and Dionysus give us harmony and rhythm? Very true. The other story suggests that wine was given to punish us and make us mad, but we argue that wine is a balm and a cure, a source of modesty in the soul, and of health and strength in the body. Furthermore, the work of the chorus is synonymous with the work of education, rhythm and melody correspond to the voice, and the movements of the body correspond to all three. The sound enters and educates the soul in virtue. Yes. And the activity that, when pursued as entertainment, is called dancing, when studied with the intention of improving the body, becomes gymnastics. Shall we now proceed to discuss this? What Cretan or Lacedaemonian would approve of you omitting gymnastics? Your question implies agreement, and you will easily understand a subject that is familiar to you. Gymnastics is based on the natural inclination of every animal for rapid movement, and humans add a sense of rhythm that is awakened by music. Music and dancing together form the choral art. But before we continue, I must add a final word about drinking. Like other pleasures, it has a lawful use but if a state or an individual is inclined to drink excessively, I cannot allow it. I would go further than Crete or Lacedaemon and adopt the law of the Carthaginians, where no slave of either sex is allowed to drink wine at all, and no soldier while on a campaign, and no magistrate or officer while on duty, and no one should drink during the day or on their wedding night. 
and there are so many other occasions on which wine should be prohibited that there will not be many vineyards or vineyards required in the state. Book 3. If a person wants to understand the origins of states and societies, they should view them from a historical perspective. Countless cities have come into existence and disappeared again over infinite ages, each with its own forms of government. If we can determine the cause of these changes in states, that will likely explain their origins. What do you think of ancient traditions about floods and the destruction of mankind, and the preservation of a remnant? Everyone believes in them. Then let us imagine that the world was destroyed by a flood. The survivors would be ill shepherds, a small remnant of humans, living in isolation and unaware of the arts and vices of civilization. We can also imagine that the cities on the plains and the coast have been wiped out, and that all inventions and knowledge have been lost. Why, if everything were as it is now, nothing would have ever been invented. All our famous discoveries have been made within the last thousand years, and many of them are recent. Yes, Kleinias, and we must not forget Epimenides, who was truly recent, he practiced the lesson of moderation and abstinence that Hesiod only preached. True. After the great destruction, we can imagine that the earth was a desert, with only a few herds of cattle and a few goats, hardly enough to sustain those who tended to them. The survivors would know nothing of politics and governments. And from this situation, arts and laws have emerged, along with a great deal of virtue and a great deal of vice. Little by little, the world has become what it is. Initially, the few inhabitants would have had a natural fear of descending into the plains. Although they would have wanted to interact with one another, they would have had difficulty getting around, having lost the arts, and having no means of extracting metals from the earth or cutting down trees. Even if they had saved any tools, these would have worn out quickly, and they could not obtain more until the art of metallurgy was revived. Faction and war would be extinguished among them, for being solitary they would be inclined to be friendly, and having an abundance of pasture and plenty of milk and meat, they would have nothing to quarrel about. We can assume that they also had dwellings, clothes, and pottery, as the weaving and pottery arts do not require the use of metals. In those days, they were neither poor nor rich, and there was no insolence or injustice among them, for they had noble natures, lived up to their principles, and believed what they were told. They knew nothing of land or naval warfare, or of legal practices or party conflicts. They were simpler, more temperate, and more just than the people of our time. Very true. I am showing why the need for lawgivers arises, for in primitive ages they neither had nor wanted them. Men lived according to the customs of their fathers, in a simple manner, under a patriarchal government, which still exists among both Greeks and barbarians, and is described in Homer as prevailing among the Cyclopes, they have no laws, and they dwell in rocks or on the tops of mountains, and every one is the judge of his wife and children, and they do not trouble themselves about one another. That is a charming poet of yours, though I know little of him, for in Crete foreign poets are not much read. But he is well known in Sparta, though he describes Ionian rather than Dorian manners, and he seems to take your view of primitive society. May we not suppose that government arose out of the union of single families who survived the destruction, and were under the rule of patriarchs, because they had originally descended from a single father and mother? That is very probable. As time went on, men increased in number and cultivated the land, living in a common habitation, which they protected with walls against wild animals. However, the several families retained the laws and customs that they separately received from their first parents. They would naturally prefer their own laws over any others and would already be shaped by them when they came together in a common society. Legislation thus began among them imperceptibly. In the next stage, the associated families would appoint representatives who would select and present to the chiefs the laws they deemed best. The chiefs, in turn, would make further selections and become the lawgivers of the state, which they would form into an aristocracy or a monarchy. Probably. In the third stage, various other forms of government would arise. This state of society is described by Homer when speaking of the foundation of Dardania, which, he says, was built at the foot of many fountained Ida, for Ilium, the city of the plain, as yet was not. Here, as well as in the account of the Cyclopes, the poet, through some divine inspiration, has attained truth. 
but let us continue with our story. Ilium was built in a wide plain, on a low hill, which was surrounded by streams descending from Ida. This shows that many ages must have passed, for the people who remembered the flood would never have placed their city at the mercy of the waters. As mankind began to multiply, many other cities were built in similar situations. These cities waged a ten-year war against Troy, both by sea and land, as people were no longer afraid of the sea. Meanwhile, while the army chiefs were at Troy, their homes fell into chaos. The youth revolted and refused to obey their own fathers, leading to deaths, murders, and exiles. Under the new name of Dorians, given to them by their leader Dorius, the exiles returned. The rest of the story is part of the history of Sparta. Thus, after digressing from the subject of laws into music and drinking, we return to the establishment of Sparta which, in terms of laws and institutions, is like Crete. We have witnessed the rise of a first, second, and third state over the course of ages, and now we arrive at a fourth state. By comparing all four, we aim to understand the nature of laws and governments, and the changes that may be desirable in them. If, replies the Spartan, our new discussion is likely to be as good as the last, I would think the longest day too short for such an occupation. Let us imagine the time when Lacedaemon, Argos, and Messene were all under the rule of your ancestors, Medillus. Later, they divided the army into three portions and established three cities, Argos, Messene, and Lacedaemon. Yes. Temenus was the king of Argos, Cresphontes of Messene, and Procles and Eurysthenes ruled in Lacedaemon. Just so. And they all swore to assist any one of their number whose kingdom was overthrown. Yes. But didn't we say that kingdoms or governments can only be overthrown by themselves? That is true. Yes, and this truth is now proven by facts, there were certain conditions under which the three kingdoms were to assist one another. The government was to be mild and the people obedient, and the kings and people were to unite in assisting either of the other two when they were wronged. This latter condition was of great security. Clearly. Such a provision goes against the common notion that the lawgiver should only make laws that the people like. Instead, we argue that the lawgiver should be like a physician, prepared to effect a cure even if it involves considerable suffering. Very true. The early lawgivers had another great advantage, they were saved from the reproach that comes with dividing land and abolishing debts. No one could argue with the Dorians for dividing the territory, and they had no long-standing debts. They did not. Then what was the reason their legislation failed so significantly? For there were three kingdoms, and two of them quickly lost their original constitution. That is a question that we cannot refuse to answer if we intend to continue our old man's game of investigating laws and institutions. The Dorian institutions are particularly worthy of consideration, as they were clearly intended to protect not only the Peloponnese, but all of Greece, from the barbarians. The capture of Troy by the Achaeans had greatly offended the Assyrians, who ruled over that region at the time, and they were likely to seek revenge. Therefore, the royal Heraclid brothers devised a military constitution that was far superior to the old Trojan expedition. The Dorians themselves were also superior to the Achaeans, who had participated in that expedition and were defeated by the Dorians. This plan, undertaken by men who had shared hardships and dangers, and sanctioned by the Delphian oracle under the guidance of the Heraclidae, seemed to promise permanence. However, this has not been the case. Instead of being united, the three groups have always been at war. If they had been united, as originally intended, they would have been invincible. So, what caused their downfall? Have you ever noticed that there are beautiful things that people often say, what wonders they would have achieved if used correctly? Yet, this may be a mistake. I say the same about the Heraclidae and their expedition, which I may have been justified in admiring, but it also makes me think about the general reflection, what wonders could strength and military resources have achieved if the possessor knew how to use them? Consider this, if the army generals had known how to organize their forces, could they not have given their subjects everlasting freedom and the power to do as they pleased in the world? Suppose someone expresses admiration for wealth or rank. Do they not do so with the belief that these things can help them achieve their desires? 
everyone wants to have control over everything and is always praying for what they desire. And we ask for our friends what they ask for themselves. A father holds his son dear, yet if the son is young and foolish, he may often pray for something that the father prays he does not obtain. And when the father, in the heat of youth or the senility of old age, makes a rash prayer, the son, like Hippolytus, may have reason to pray that his father's words are ineffective. Do you mean that a person should pray to have right desires before praying for those desires to be fulfilled, and that wisdom should be the first object of our prayers? Yes, and you will remember that I said wisdom should be the primary goal of the legislator, but you said that defense in war comes first. I replied that there are four virtues, while you acknowledged only one courage and not wisdom, which guides all the others. And I repeat, perhaps in jest, but I am willing for you to take my words seriously, that the prayer of a fool is full of danger. If you allow me, I will prove to you that the ruin of those states was not caused by cowardice or ignorance in war, but by ignorance of human affairs. Please proceed, our attention will show better than compliments that we value your words. I maintain that ignorance is, and always has been, the downfall of states. Therefore, the legislator should seek to banish it from the state. The greatest ignorance is the love of what is known to be evil and the hatred of what is known to be good. This is the ultimate conflict between pleasure and reason in the soul. I say it is the greatest because it affects the larger part of the soul. Just as the passions are to the individual what the people are to a state, when they oppose reason or law and instruction no longer helps, that is the ultimate ignorance of states and individuals. I agree. Let this be our first principle, a citizen who does not know how to distinguish between good and evil should not have authority, even if they possess great intelligence and many talents, for they are truly a fool. On the other hand, someone who has this knowledge may be unable to read or swim, yet they shall be considered wise and allowed to rule. For how can there be wisdom without harmony? The wise person is the savior, and the one devoid of wisdom is the destroyer of states and households. There are rulers and subjects in states. The first claim to rule is that of parents over their children. The second is that of the noble over the ignoble. Thirdly, the elder must govern the younger. Fourthly, the slave must obey their master. Fifthly, there is the power of the stronger, which the poet Pindar declares to be natural. Sixthly, there is the rule of the wiser, which is also natural, as I must inform Pindar if he does not know and it is the rule of law over obedient subjects. Most certainly. And there is a seventh kind of rule that the gods love, where the ruler is chosen by lot. So, now, we playfully say to the person who thinks it is easy to make laws, you see, legislator, the many and conflicting claims to authority. Here is a source of troubles that you must address. First and foremost, you must help us consider how the kings of Argos and Messini in ancient times destroyed their famous empire. Did they forget the saying of Hesiod that half is better than the whole? And do we think that the ignorance of this truth is less fatal to kings than to peoples? Probably the evil is exacerbated by their way of life. The kings of those times violated the laws and broke their oaths. Their actions did not align with their words, and their foolishness which they believed to be wisdom, led to the downfall of the state. How could the legislator have prevented this? The solution is clear now, but it was not easy to foresee at the time. What is the solution? The institutions of Sparta can teach you, Megillus. Wherever there is excess, whether it be a ship with too large a sail, a body with too much food, or a mind with too much power, destruction is inevitable. Similarly, a person who possesses absolute power is quickly corrupted and becomes detested by their closest friends. To guard against this evil, the god who watched over Sparta gave you two kings instead of one, so that they could balance each other out. Furthermore, to temper the strength and self-sufficiency of youth with the moderation of age, some human wisdom mixed with divine power created your senate. A third savior restrained your growing power with ephors, who were chosen by lot and resembled elected officers. In this way, the power of the kings was preserved and became the preserver of everything else. If the constitution had been established by the original legislators, not even a portion of Aristodemus would have been saved, for they lacked political experience and believed that a young spirit invested with power could be restrained by oaths. 
now that God has taught us the art of legislation, there is no merit in recognizing all of this or in gaining wisdom after the fact. However, if the impending danger could have been foreseen and unity preserved, then no Persian or other enemy would have dared to attack Greece. In fact, our victory over the enemy is not as commendable as our disloyalty to one another is disgraceful. Of the three cities, only one fought on behalf of Greece, while Argos refused to help, and Messenia was actually at war with Sparta. If the Spartans and Athenians had not united, the Greeks would have been absorbed into the Persian Empire and scattered among the barbarians. We reflect on past and present legislators because we want to discover what another course could have been taken. We were just saying that a state can only be free, wise, and harmonious when there is a balance of powers. There are many words that express the goals of the legislator temperance, wisdom, friendship, but we need not be troubled by the variety of expressions, as these words all have the same meaning. I would like to know what you believe the legislator should aim for. Listen to me, then. There are two fundamental forms of government, monarchy, and democracy. The Persians have the highest form of monarchy, and the Athenians have the highest form of democracy. No government can be well governed without including both. There was a time when both the Persians and Athenians had more of a constitutional state character than they do now. During the time of Cyrus, the Persians were both free and rulers of others. Their soldiers were free and equal, and the kings utilized and honored all the talent they could find. As a result, the nation grew great because there was freedom, friendship, and a sense of community. However, Cyrus, though a wise general, did not concern himself with the education of his family. He was a soldier from a young age and left his children, who were born into privilege, to be educated by women who indulged and spoiled them. Truly a rare education. Yes, it was the kind of education that princesses who had recently become wealthy might be expected to provide in a country where men were solely focused on war. Likely enough. Their father had possessions of men and animals and did not consider that the people he was entrusting them to had been educated in a quite different manner. They were not like the Persian shepherds who could take care of themselves and their own. He did not realize that his children had been raised in the Median fashion, by women and eunuchs. As a result, one of Cyrus' sons killed the other and lost the kingdom due to his own foolishness. Once again, we see that Darius, who restored the kingdom, did not receive a royal education. He was one of the seven chiefs, and when he ascended to the throne, he divided the empire into seven provinces. He established equal laws and fostered friendship among the people. As a result, his subjects were deeply attached to him and willingly helped him expand his empire. Next came Xerxes, who received the same royal education as Cambyses and met a similar fate. It naturally makes us wonder how Darius, with all his experience, could have made such a mistake. The downfall of Xerxes was not a mere accident, but the result of the dissolute lives typically led by the sons of the very wealthy and royal. This is what the legislator must seriously consider. The Spartans deserve praise for not giving special honor to birth or wealth as such advantages are not highly esteemed without virtue. Even virtue itself is not esteemed unless it is accompanied by temperance. Explain. No one would want to live in the same house as a courageous man who lacks self-control or with a talented artist who is a rogue. Justice and wisdom cannot be separated from temperance. However, when considering these qualities in relation to the honor and dishonor assigned to them in states, would you say that temperance, if existing without the other virtues in the soul, is valuable or worthless? I cannot say. You have answered well. It would be absurd to consider temperance as belonging to the category of honorable or dishonorable qualities because all other virtues in their respective categories require temperance to be added to them. With the addition of temperance, they are honored not in proportion to it, but to their own excellence. And shouldn't the legislator be the one to determine these categories? Certainly. So, let's suppose, without going into details, that we divide them into three main categories. The most honorable are the goods of the soul, assuming temperance as a condition for them. Secondly, there are the goods of the body. And thirdly, there are external possessions. Any legislator who arranges them in a different order is doing something unholy and unpatriotic. 
These remarks were inspired by the history of the Persian kings, and now I will return to that topic. The downfall of their empire was caused by the loss of freedom and the rise of despotism. All sense of community disappeared. Hatred and plunder replaced friendship, and the people no longer fought wholeheartedly for their rulers. The rulers, realizing that their vast numbers were useless in battle, turned to mercenaries as their only hope for salvation. They were forced by their circumstances to proclaim the most foolish of falsehoods, that money is more important than virtue. But enough about the Persians. The Athenians teach a different lesson, showing that limited freedom is far better than unlimited freedom. Ancient Athens, at the time of the Persian invasion, had such limited freedom. The people were divided into four classes based on their wealth, and their universal love of order, as well as their fear of the approaching enemy, made them obedient and willing citizens. Darius had sent Datus and Artaphernes, commanding them under the threat of death to subjugate the Eritreans and Athenians. A report, whether true or not, reached Athens that all the Eritreans had been captured, and in fear, the Athenians sought assistance from all over Greece. Only the Lacedaemonians came to their aid, but they arrived a day too late, after the Battle of Marathon had already been fought. Eventually, Xerxes came to power, and the Athenians heard about the bridge over the Hellespont, the Canal of Athos, and the countless army and fleet. They knew that these were intended to avenge the defeat at Marathon. Their situation seemed desperate, as there was no Greek likely to help them on land, and they were attacked at sea by over a thousand ships. Their only hope, however slim, was in victory, so they relied on themselves and the gods. Their common danger and the influence of their ancient constitution greatly promoted harmony among them. Reverence and fear, fear that the coward never knows, compelled them to fight for their altars and homes, saving them from being scattered across the world. Your words, Athenian, are worthy of your country. And you, Megillus, who possess the virtues of your ancestors, are worthy to hear them. Let me ask you to take the moral of my story. The Persians lost their liberty and became absolute slaves, while we have become completely free. In ancient times, the Athenian people were not the masters, but the servants of the laws. Which laws? First, there were laws about music, and there were various types of music. There were hymns, lamentations, the paean, the dithyram, and the so-called laws or melodies played on the harp. The regulation of such matters was not left to the whistling and clapping of the crowd. There was silence while the judges decided, and the boys and the audience in general were kept in order with the rap of a stick. But eventually, a new generation of poets emerged. They were certainly talented, but they cared little for musical truth and propriety. They made pleasure the only measure of excellence. This was a test that the spectators could apply for themselves. The whole audience, instead of being silent, became loud, and a rule by the theatergoers replaced rule by the aristocracy. If the judges had been free, no great harm would have been done. A musical democracy would have been acceptable, but conceit has been our downfall. Everyone thinks they know everything and is ready to say anything. The age of reverence is gone, and the age of irreverence and licentiousness has taken its place. Very true. And with this freedom comes disobedience to rulers, parents, elders, and eventually even the law. The end returns to the beginning, and the old rebellious nature of the titans reappears. People have no regard for the gods or for oaths, and it seems as if the evils of humanity will never cease. Where are we headed? Once again, we must reign in the argument with restraint and control, lest, as the proverb says, we fall off our donkey. Good. Our purpose in what we have been saying is to prove that the legislator should aim to secure three things for a state, freedom, friendship, and wisdom. We chose two states as examples, one representing freedom and the other representing despotism, and we showed that they both reached their highest perfection in moderation. In a similar spirit, we spoke about the Dorian expedition, the settlement on the hills and plains of Troy, music, the use of wine, and everything that came before. And now, has our discussion been of any use? Yes, stranger. By a strange coincidence, the Cretans are about to send out a colony, and the settlement has been entrusted to the people of Knossos. Ten commissioners, of which I am one, are to give laws to the colonists, 
and we can give any laws we please, whether Cretan or foreign. So let us select from what has been said and proceed with the construction of the state. Particularly good. I am at your service. And I too, says Megillus. Book 4. And now, what is the city? I do not want to know its name, as that will be determined by some accident, like a river or a local deity, but I want to know its location. Is it a coastal city or an inland city? The city will be approximately 11 miles away from the sea. Are there harbors? Excellent. And is the surrounding countryside self-sufficient? Almost. Any neighboring states? No, and that is the reason for choosing the location, which has been abandoned for as long as anyone can remember. And is there a fair balance of hills, plains, and forests? Like Crete in general, there are more hills than plains. Then there is some hope for your citizens, if the city had been by the sea and dependent on other countries for support, no human power could have prevented corruption. Even the distance of eleven miles is hardly enough. The sea, although pleasant, is a dangerous companion, and a pathway for unfamiliar customs and manners as well as commerce. But since the land is only moderately fertile, there will be no significant export trade and no large influx of gold and silver, which are the downfall of states. Is there timber for shipbuilding? There is no pine, nor much cypress, and very little stone pine or plain wood for the interior of ships. That is good. Why? Because the city will not be able to imitate the bad ways of its enemies. What does that mean? To explain my point, I would ask you to remember what we said about the Cretan laws, that they were focused solely on warfare, whereas I argued that they should have encompassed all virtues. And I hope that you, in turn, will hold me accountable if I deviate from my own principle. For I believe that the lawgiver should aim directly at virtue and justice, disregarding wealth and any other good when separated from virtue. What I mean by the imitation of enemies, I will illustrate with the story of Minos, if our Cretan friend will allow me to mention it. Minos, who was a great sea king, imposed a cruel tribute on the Athenians, for in those days they were not a maritime power, they had no timber for shipbuilding, and therefore they could not imitate their enemies, and it would have been far better, as I argue, for them to have lost many lives in paying the tribute than to have turned soldiers into sailors. Naval warfare is not a praiseworthy art, men should not be taught to land and then quickly return to their ships, or to find excuses for discarding their weapons, bad customs should not be disguised with fine words. And retreat is always bad, as we learn from Homer, when he portrays Odysseus warning Agamemnon of the danger of ships being nearby when soldiers are inclined to flee. An army of lions trained in such ways would flee before a herd of deer. Furthermore, a city that owes its preservation to a multitude of pilots, oarsmen, and other undeserving individuals cannot properly bestow honors and rewards, and this is the downfall of states. Still, in Crete we say that the Battle of Salamis saved Greece. That is the prevailing opinion. But Megillus and I argue that the Battle of Marathon initiated the deliverance, and the Battle of Plataea completed it, for these battles made men better whereas the battles of Salamis and Artemisium did not. And we further assert that mere existence is not the greatest political good for individuals or states, but the continuation of the best existence. Certainly. Let us then strive to follow this principle in colonization and legislation. And first, let me ask, who will be the colonists? Can anyone come from any city in Crete? Surely you would not extend a general invitation to all of Greece. Yet I notice that in Crete there are people who have come from Argos and Aegina and other places. Our recruits will be drawn from all of Crete, and we would prefer Peloponnesians from other parts of Greece. As you observed, there are Argives among the Cretans, moreover, the Gortinians, who are the best of all Cretans, have come from Gordes and Peloponnesus. Colonization is somewhat easier when the colony departs from one country in a large group, due to population pressure, revolution, or war. In this case, the advantage is that the new colonists share a common race, language, and laws. However, they are less obedient to the legislator, and often they are eager to maintain the very laws and customs that caused their downfall at home. On the other hand, a mixed multitude is more manageable, although there is a challenge in getting them to work together. 
Nevertheless, nothing perfects virtue more than legislation and colonization. Yet I have a thought that may seem to diminish the role of legislators. What is that? I was going to make the sobering observation that accidents of all kinds are the true legislators, wars, plagues, famines, and the frequent occurrence of bad seasons. The observer may be inclined to say that almost all human affairs are a matter of chance, and this is certainly true of navigation, medicine, and the art of war. But there is another perspective that can be equally valid. What is it? That God governs all things, and that chance and opportunity work in conjunction with Him. And according to a third view, art also plays a part, for surely in a storm it is beneficial to have a pilot? The same is true of legislation, even if circumstances are favorable, a skilled lawgiver is still necessary. Very true. All artists would pray for certain conditions under which to practice their art, and would not the legislator do the same? Certainly. So, legislator, let us say to him, what are the conditions that you desire? He will reply, grant me a city ruled by a tyrant, and let the tyrant be young, mindful, teachable, courageous, magnanimous, and let him possess the essential quality of all virtue, which is temperance, not prudence, but that natural temperance which is inherent in children and animals, and is not typically considered a good thing, with this, he must be endowed if the state is to achieve the form most conducive to happiness in the quickest manner. And I must add one other condition, the tyrant must be fortunate, and his good fortune must consist in his having the cooperation of a great legislator. When God has done all this, he has done the best which he can for a state, not so well if he has given them two legislators instead of one, and less and less well if he has given them a great many. An orderly tyranny most easily transitions into the perfect state, in the second degree, a monarchy, in the third degree, a democracy, an oligarchy is worst of all. I do not understand. I suppose that you have never seen a city which is subject to a tyranny. I have no desire to see one. You would have seen what I am describing if you ever had. The tyrant can quickly change the manners of a state and affix the stamp of praise or blame on any action which he pleases, for the citizens readily follow the example which he sets. There is no quicker way of making changes, but there is a counterbalancing difficulty. It is hard to find the divine love of temperance and justice existing in any powerful form of government, whether in a monarchy or an oligarchy. In olden days there were chiefs like Nestor, who was the most eloquent and temperate of mankind, but there is no one as equal now. If such a person ever arises among us, blessed will he be, and blessed they who listen to his words. For where power and wisdom and temperance meet in one, there are the best laws and constitutions. I am trying to show you how easy under the conditions supposed, and how difficult under any other, is the task of giving a city good law. How do you mean? Let us old men attempt to mold in words a constitution for your new state, as children make figures out of wax. Proceed. What constitution shall we give democracy, oligarchy, or aristocracy? To which of these classes, Megillus, do you refer your own state? The Spartan constitution seems to me to contain all these elements. Our state is a democracy and an aristocracy, the power of the ephors is tyrannical, and we have an ancient monarchy. Much the same, adds Cleinias, may be said of Gnosis. The reason is that you have polities, but other states are mere aggregations of men dwelling together, which are named after their several ruling powers, whereas a state, if an ocracy at all, should be called a theocracy. A tale of old will explain my meaning. There is a tradition of a golden age, in which all things were spontaneous and abundant. Kronos, then lord of the world, knew that no mortal nature could endure the temptations of power, and therefore he appointed demons or demigods, who are of a superior race, to have dominion over man, as man has dominion over the animals. They took care of us with great ease and pleasure to themselves, and no less to us, and the tradition says that only when God, and not man, is the ruler, can humans cease from ill. This was the manner of life which prevailed under Kronos, and which we must strive to follow as far as the principle of immortality still abides in us and we live according to law and the dictates of right reason. But in an oligarchy or democracy, when the governing principle is a thirst for pleasure, the laws are trampled underfoot, and there is no possibility of salvation. 
is it not often said that there are as many forms of laws as there are governments, and that they have no concern either with any one virtue or with all virtue, but are relative to the will of the government? Which is as much as to say that might makes right. What do you mean? I mean that governments enact their own laws, and that every government makes self-preservation its principal aim. He who transgresses the laws is regarded as an evildoer and punished accordingly. This was one of the unjust principles of government which we mentioned when speaking of the different claims to rule. We were agreed that parents should rule their children, the elder the younger, the noble the ignoble. But there were also several other principles, and among them Pinder's law of violence. To whom then is our state to be entrusted? For many a government is only a victorious faction which has a monopoly of power, and refuses any share to the conquered, lest when they get into office, they should remember their wrongs. Such governments are not polities, but parties, nor are any laws good which are made in the interest of classes only, and not of the whole. And in our state, I mean to protest against making any man a ruler because he is rich, or strong, or noble. But those who are obedient to the laws, and who win the victory of obedience, shall be promoted to the service of the gods according to the degree of their obedience. When I call the ruler the servant or minister of the law, this is not a mere paradox, but I mean to say that upon a willingness to obey the law the existence of the state depends. Truly, stranger, you have a keen vision. Why, yes, every man when he is old has his intellectual vision most keen. And now shall we call on our colonists and make a speech to them? Friends, we say to them, God holds in his hand the beginning, middle, and end of all things, and he moves in a straight line towards the accomplishment of his will. Justice always accompanies him and punishes those who fall short of his laws. He who would be happy follows humbly in her train, but he who is lifted up with pride, or wealth, or honor, or beauty, is soon deserted by God, and being deserted, he lives in confusion and disorder. To many, he appears to be a great man, but in a short time, he will face complete destruction. Therefore, considering these things, what should we do or think? Every person should follow God. So, what kind of life pleases God? There is an old saying that like agrees with like, measure with measure, and God should be our measure in all things. The temperate person is a friend of God because they are like him, while the intemperate person is not his friend because they are not like him. Therefore, the best thing for a good person is to pray and make offerings to the gods. However, the bad person has a polluted soul, so their service to the gods is wasted, while the good person's offerings are accepted. I have told you about the goal for which we should strive. You may ask, how and with what means? First, we affirm that after the Olympian gods and the gods of the state, we should honor the gods below, offering them everything in even numbers and of lesser quality. The auspicious odd numbers and everything of higher quality are reserved for the gods above. Next, we must honor demigods or spirits, followed by heroes, and then family gods, who should be worshipped at their designated places according to the law. Furthermore, we must not forget to honor our parents, we owe everything we have to them, and this debt must be repaid with kindness and care in their old age. We must not speak disrespectfully in front of them, for there is a vengeful angel who hears their anger, and the child should understand that the parent has a right to be angry when wronged. After their death, they should have a moderate funeral, like what their ancestors had before them, and there should be an annual commemoration of them. By living in this way, we will be accepted by the gods and live with hope. The law will determine our various duties towards relatives, friends, and other citizens and the entire state will be happy and prosperous. However, if the legislator wants to persuade as well as command, they should add prefaces to their laws that will predispose the citizens to virtue. Even a small effort to win the hearts of people is valuable. Most people are not in a hurry to become good, as Hesiod says, long and steep is the first half of the way to virtue, but when you have reached the top, the rest is easy. Those are excellent words. Yes. But may I tell you the effect that the preceding discourse has had on me? I will express my meaning in an address to the lawgiver, O oh lawgiver, if you know what we should do and say, you can surely tell us. You are not like the poet, who, as you were just saying, does not know the effect of his own words. The poet may argue that when he sits down to write, he is not in his right mind, and being a mere imitator, 
he can say all sorts of contradictory things and cannot determine which is true. But this license cannot be granted to the lawgiver. For example, there are three types of funerals, excessive, modest, and moderate. You claim that the moderate funeral is the right one. Now, if I had a wealthy wife and she asked me to arrange her funeral and I were to compose a song about it, I would praise the extravagant type. A poor man would commend a more modest funeral and a person of moderate means would prefer a moderate funeral. But as the legislator, you must precisely define what you mean by moderate. Very true. Shouldn't our lawgiver provide a preamble or interpretation of their laws, offering advice to their subjects, like some doctors? Aren't there two types of doctors? One is gentle and the other is rough. The gentle doctors are freemen who learn and teach scientifically, while the doctor's assistants gain their knowledge empirically by serving their masters. Of course, there are. Have you ever noticed that the gentleman doctors treat freemen, while slave doctors only treat slaves? The latter travel around or wait for slaves at dispensaries. They do not engage in conversations with their patients about their diseases or the remedies. They practice based on experience and give their orders in an arbitrary manner. After treating one patient, they move on to the next, treating them with the same confidence. Their duty is to relieve the master of the burden of caring for their sick slaves. On the other hand, the other doctor, who treats freemen, follows a completely different approach. They consult with their patient and learn from them, never acting until they have convinced the patient of what they are doing. They rely on influence rather than force. Isn't the use of both methods far better than using either one alone? We can use both methods advantageously in legislation. Let me provide an example. The laws regarding marriage naturally come first, so let us start with them. The simple law would be as follows, a person should marry between the ages of 30 and 35. If they do not, they will be fined or deprived of certain privileges. The double law would add the reason, since humans desire immortality, which they achieve through procreation, no one should deprive themselves of their share in this good. Those who obey the law are blameless, but those who disobey should not benefit from their celibacy. Therefore, they shall pay an annual fine and will not be allowed to receive honor from the young. This is an example of what I call the double law, which can help us determine the extent to which the addition of persuasion to threats is desirable. Lacedaemonians in general, stranger, prefer brevity, in this case, however, I prefer length. But Cleinias is the true lawgiver, and he should be consulted first. Thank you, Megillus. Whether there should be many or few words is a foolish question, the best forms, not the shortest, are always to be approved. Legislators have never considered the advantages they could gain by using persuasion along with force, but instead rely solely on force. I have something else to say about this matter. We have been discussing laws from early morning until noon, and everything we have said so far is only the preamble to the laws we are about to give. I mention this because I want you to understand that songs and melodies always have preludes, but laws, although they are called by the same name, no moi, never have any preludes. Now, I propose to give preludes to laws, dividing them into two parts, one containing the despotic command, which I described as the image of the slave doctor, and the other the persuasive part, which I call the preamble. The legislator should provide preludes or preambles to his laws. That will be the way in my colony. I am glad that you agree with me, this is an important point to remember. A preamble is not always necessary for a law. The lawgiver must determine when it is needed, just as a musician determines when there should be a prelude to a song. Very true. Now, with a preamble, let us continue our discussion. We have said enough about gods and parents, and we can now proceed to consider what pertains to the citizens, their souls, bodies, properties, their occupations and amusements, and thus arrive at the nature of education. The first word of the laws introduces the thought that Plato has in mind throughout the work, namely, that laws of divine origin. As a great English writer said, her seat is the bosom of God, her voice the harmony of the world. Although the specific laws of Sparta and Crete had a narrow and imperfect aim, this is not true of divine laws, which are based on the principles of human nature and not designed to meet the needs of the moment. 
they also have their natural divisions, corresponding to the different virtues, unlike the conflicting enactments of an Athenian assembly or an English parliament. However, we can observe two inconsistencies in Plato's treatment of the subject, first, a minor one, in that he does not clearly distinguish between the Cretan and Spartan laws, which are exclusively focused on war, and the other laws of Zeus and Apollo, which are said to be divine and encompass all virtue. Secondly, we can turn his own complaint against Sparta and Crete back on him, as he himself has given us a code of laws that mostly have a military character, and we cannot point to any obvious examples of similar institutions concerned with pleasure, except for the regulation of convivial interactions. The military spirit that he condemns at the beginning of the laws reappears in the seventh and eighth books. The mention of Minos, the great lawgiver, and Radamanthus, the just administrator of the law, suggests the two divisions of the laws into enactments and appointments of officers. The legislator and the judge stand side by side, and their functions cannot be completely distinguished. For the judge is, in some sense, a legislator, at least in small matters, and his decisions, becoming precedents, must determine the countless details that arise from conflicting circumstances. Plato proposes to leave these matters to a younger generation of legislators. He seems to have overlooked the role of courts of law in making law, probably because the Athenian law courts were popular assemblies, and he can hardly be said to have had the ideal of a judge before his eyes, except in a mythical form. When reading the laws of Plato or any other ancient writing about laws, we should consider how gradual the process is by which not only a legal system but also the administration of a court of law becomes perfected. There are other subjects that Plato introduces early in the work, as is his style. First, he provides an overview of the subject of laws, which are meant to encompass all aspects of human life, from infancy to old age, and from birth to death, although the proposed plan is not fully executed in the subsequent books, partly due to the need to describe the constitution as well as the laws of his new colony. Secondly, he touches on the power of music, which can have a significant influence on the character of individuals for good or ill. He specifically mentions the offense of altering the modes and rhythms, as well as separating the words from the music, which he had previously condemned in the Republic. Thirdly, he condemns the prevalence of unnatural loves in Sparta and Crete, which he attributes to the practice of communal meals and physical exercises and considers to be almost inseparable from them. He returns to this subject again in the eighth book. Fourthly, he affirms that the virtues are inseparable from one another, even if they are not identical. This is a principle that he reiterates at the end of the work. As in the beginnings of Plato's other writings, here too we find several notes struck, which serve as preludes to longer discussions, although the hint is less cleverly given, and the promise less fully fulfilled than in the earlier dialogues. Plato did not yet understand the distinction between ethics and politics. He believed that law existed somewhere in between the two. He believed that all actions and laws of a state should be guided by virtue. However, he did not realize that politics and law have their own unique conditions and are different from ethics. Politics deals with collective or representative actions, while law is concerned with external acts that affect others. Ethics, on the other hand, encompass a person's duty to themselves and others. Plato never reflected on these differences. He believed that shaping the life of a state was as easy as shaping the life of an individual. He supported a balance of power but did not consider that this balance could lead to a stagnant state. He also did not recognize the problems that arise from confusing vice and crime, or the need for governments to refrain from excessive interference with their subjects. However, this confusion between ethics and politics also has a positive side. Although Plato failed to grasp important distinctions, he sought to elevate the lower to the higher. He did not lower the principles of men to their practices or narrow the concept of the state to immediate political necessities. Political ideals of freedom and equality, and the belief in a divine government, have greatly influenced and uplifted humanity. While Plato may not have been the first to introduce these ideals, as they are as old as Hesiod, he has had a greater impact than any other writer in spreading them to the world. In one of his later works, The Laws, Plato introduces a new thought about education. He believes that just as true courage is connected to temperance, there should be an education that trains people to resist pleasure as well as endure pain. 
one cannot guard against something they have no experience with. A perfectly trained citizen should be accustomed to facing their enemy and measuring their strength against them. This education in resisting pleasure is to be achieved through festive gatherings and through music and dance. The youth should learn music and physical exercise, while the elders should be trained and tested at drinking parties. According to the old saying, in vino veritas, in wine, there is truth, people will reveal their true characters when they are open and visible under the influence of alcohol. Additionally, they will be more obedient to the laws and more easily shaped by the legislator. The first reason is interesting but not significant, while the second reason does not deserve much attention. However, if Plato means to say that society is one of the main instruments of education in later life, he has expressed, albeit obscurely, a true principle that was new to his contemporaries. The idea that moral discipline can be exercised at a banquet is original but Plato has not yet learned to express this idea in an abstract form. He understands that moderation is better than complete abstinence and that asceticism is an imbalanced form of training. He makes the wise observation that those who are able to resist pleasure may often be among the worst of mankind. He is aware, like modern utilitarians, that the pursuit of pleasure is a major motivator of human action. This cannot be eradicated, so it must be regulated, and the pleasure must be of the right kind. These reflections seem to be the true foundation of the discussion, although they are imperfectly expressed. In various parts of the laws, such as the comparison between Bakshik madness and the gift of Dionysus, or the discussion of pleasure as the object of imitative art, or the illustration of the failure of Dorian institutions through Theseus' prayer, we must gather Plato's meaning as best as we can from the context. The feeling of old age is discernible in this passage, as well as in several others in the laws. Plato has reached a stage in life where he observes and contemplates rather than actively participates. He is willing to allow himself and others the few pleasures that remain. Wine is meant to cheer them now that their bodies are old, and their blood runs cold. They are the best critics of dancing and music, but they cannot be persuaded to sing unless they have been enlivened by drinking. Youth does not need the stimulation of wine, but age can only regain its youthfulness through its invigorating influence. Plato's principle is total abstinence for the young and moderate, gradually increasing consumption for the old. The excessive fire in the young must be brought to the old. In Greek culture, drunkenness, like madness, had a sacredness and mystery. While it could degrade a whole population, it was also a form of worshipping the god Dionysus, practiced on certain occasions. Furthermore, the intoxication caused by wine was different from the cruder forms of drunkenness seen in some modern societies. A modern physician would limit an old man's consumption of wine. They would argue that strength cannot be restored through stimulation. Wine can revive the vital powers during illness, but it cannot rejuvenate old age. In his teachings on health and longevity, Plato acknowledges the importance of a simple diet but fails to emphasize the crucial principle of moderation. His praise of wine is likely a passing fancy, influenced by his own habits or preferences. He is not the only philosopher whose theory is based on personal practice. Plato's restriction of wine for the young and approval of it for the elderly can be compared to the temperance debate of our time. Wine has both religious and celebratory uses. It is praised in both the Old and New Testament and has been celebrated by countless poets. It can truly be said to have a healing effect on both the body and mind. However, wine is also prone to excess and abuse, which is why it is prohibited by Muslims and, in recent years, by many Christians, as well as the ancient Spartans. To seriously extol its virtues seems paradoxical. Yet, we can agree with Plato that the abuse of a good thing does not negate its proper use. Total abstinence is not the best rule, moderate indulgence is. A temperate consumption of wine may contribute certain qualities to social life that we cannot afford to lose. It helps people come out of their shells, enables them to forget themselves and reveal their true nature, making them more human and better friends to others. It provides them with new experiences teaches them to exercise self-control while enjoying themselves, and sometimes restores the innocence of childhood. We fully agree with Plato's prohibition of wine for the young, but when we reach maturity, there are occasions when we derive refreshment and strength from moderate drinking. 
abstinence should be the general rule, but there may be exceptions. Wine benefits us in both a literal and metaphorical sense. This question leads to broader ones. What is the overall effect of asceticism on human nature? And must there not be a certain balance between human aspirations and abilities? These questions have been extensively debated by ancient and modern philosophers. By comparing the past and present, we can sometimes better understand Plato's teachings in the context of our own lives. Just as Plato emphasizes the importance of festive gatherings, his ranking of courage as the fourth virtue seems somewhat rhetorical and exaggerated. However, he is referring to courage in a narrow sense, excluding loyalty and temperance. In this passage, he does not insist, as he does in the Protagoras, on the unity of virtues or, as in the Latches, on the identity of wisdom and courage. Instead, he states that all virtues depend on the leadership of the mind, and that justice arises from the combination of wisdom, temperance, and courage. In other places, he considers temperance to be a condition of all virtue rather than a specific virtue. He generalizes temperance, just as he generalizes justice in the Republic. The virtues are interconnected, and Plato makes only a faint effort to distinguish them in many passages. He continues to quote poets, sometimes expanding or playing with their meanings. The martial poet Tertius and the oligarch Theognis provide him with apt illustrations of the two types of courage. Plato acknowledges the division of goods into human and divine, the recognition that peace and reconciliation are preferable to resorting to violence, the analysis of temperance as resisting pleasure and enduring pain, and the distinction between education for a trade or profession and education for life. These are important and likely innovative ethical concepts. Plato also recalls his earlier paradox, in the Gorgias, that punishment is preferable to going unpunished when he states that death is the only relief for the wicked. In the laws, as in the Gorgias and Republic, he remains idealistic in many passages. However, his ideas are heavy, and he cannot sustain a consistent argument. The first book of the laws has more dramatic effect than the later parts of the work. The outburst of martial spirit from the Lacedaemonian, the Cretans protest against an insult to his lawgiver, and their mutual agreement that laws should not be publicly debated by those subjects to them, as well as their shared difficulty in following the Athenians' speculations, are all highly characteristic. In the second book, Plato further develops his idea of education through the proper use of pleasure. He begins by imagining an endless capacity for youthful life which is to be regulated and harmonized through music and rhythm. Humans differ from animals in their capacity for musical discipline. However, music, like all art, must truly imitate what is true and good. Art and morality both reject pleasure as the standard of goodness. True art is inseparable from the highest and most noble ideas. Plato only recognizes the identity of pleasure and good when the pleasure is of a higher nature. He opposes songs without words, which he believes have a confusing or enervating effect on the mind of the listener. He also opposes the modern degeneration of drama, which he would likely exemplify with the works of Euripides and Agathon, as Aristophanes did. From this passage, we can gain a better understanding of art than from any other of Plato's writings. He recognizes that art is both imitative and ideal, serving as an accurate representation of truth and the highest truth. This dual perspective on art can also be found in a comparison of the third and tenth books of the Republic, but it is expressed more clearly and directly here. It is possible that Plato exaggerates the actual influence of song and dance, both here and in the Republic. However, we must also consider the Greek people's susceptibility and their mastery of these arts. Additionally, the music had a sacred and Pythagorean nature, and the dance was part of a religious festival. It was only during these festivals that people mingled in public, and young men were observed by their elders. At the beginning of the third book, Plato abruptly asks the question, what is the origin of states? The answer is infinite time. We have already seen in the Theotetus that Plato understands the concept of long periods of time, suggesting that every person has had countless ancestors over the ages, including kings, slaves, Greeks, and barbarians. In the Critias, he also mentions that 9,000 years have passed since the island of Atlantis fought with Athens. Plato envisions human society being interrupted by natural disasters, 
and starting from the most recent one, he traces the development of the family into the state. He describes how the original scattered society gradually became more civilized and eventually evolved into military organizations like those in Crete and Sparta. His understanding of the origin of states is more accurate in the laws than in the Republic. However, it is important to note that in the laws, he presents a historical picture of the growth of society, while in the Republic, he presents an idealized picture. Modern scholars, like Plato, have also found infinite ages to be an explanation for the origin of states, as well as languages, humans, animals, and even the world itself. Similarly, they have discovered remnants of a patriarchal society in later institutions, just as Plato did. Plato speaks as a spectator of all time and all existence, someone who may have intuited truths that would later be revealed. He rises above the common belief that Greece is the civilized world or that civilization only began with the arrival of the Greeks. However, he lacks specific knowledge of the pre-flood era. When he approaches more historical times and prepares the way for his theory of mixed government, he argues with bias and inaccuracies. He aims to demonstrate that unlimited power is destructive to any state, leading him to attribute a tyrannical spirit to the first Dorian kings. He cites the decline of Argos and the destruction of Messini as evidence of their failure. According to him, Sparta was only saved by the limitations imposed by wise legislators. However, there is no reason to assume that the Dorian way of life in Sparta was ever practiced in Argos and Messini, just as there is no reason to assume that Dorian institutions were created to protect the Greeks from the power of Assyria. These ideas were primarily based on analogies which played a significant role in early historical and geographical research. Plato draws parallels between the Persian Empire, which was the natural enemy of the Greeks, and an assumed Assyrian Empire with a similar hostility. He also incorporates elements of the Persian struggle into the fable of Atlantis and the Trojan War. Similarly, Herodotus compares the Nile to the Ister and the Nile Valley to the Red Sea. In the Republic, Plato disregards facts and possibilities, while in the laws, he constructs history through analogies. In the former, he appears to lack a sense of history, much like some modern philosophers. In the latter, he is on par with Herodotus or even Tisias, rather than Thucydides or other critical historians of Greece. Plato's main objective in tracing the origin of society is to illustrate the point at which regular government replaced patriarchal authority and the diverse customs of different families were organized into laws agreed upon by all. According to Plato, the only sound basis for any government is a mixture or balance of power. The balance of power saved Sparta when the other two Heraclid states fell into disorder. This is likely the earliest trace of a political idea that has had a significant impact in both ancient and modern times. However, we can question, parodying Plato's language, whether unanimity is merely the struggle for existence or if the balance of powers in a state is superior to their harmony. In the fourth book, we delve into the realities of politics, and Plato begins to develop his main argument. The reign of Kronos has ended, and various forms of government have emerged, all based on self-interest and self-preservation. Right and wrong are no longer determined by the will of God but are created by the laws of the state. Plato strongly emphasizes the spiritual nature of religion, asserting that without holiness, no man is accepted by God and emphasizes the duty of filial obedience, stating honor your parents. The legislator must teach these principles and not just command them. He is to be the educator as well as the lawmaker of future ages, and his laws are themselves to form a part of the education of the state. Unlike the poet, he must be clear and rational, he cannot be allowed to say one thing at one time, and another thing at another he must know what he is doing and yet legislation has a poetic or persuasive element and must find words that will touch the hearts of people. Laws must be announced before they are put into effect, and mankind must be reasoned with before they are punished. The lawmaker, when he announces a particular law, will politely ask those who are willing to listen to him. Only the rebellious will face severe consequences. A sermon and a law in one, combining secular punishment with religious sanction, appeared to Plato as a new idea that could have a great impact on reforming the world. The experiment of reasoning with mankind had never been tried before, the laws of others had never had any preambles, 
and Plato seems to take great pleasure in contemplating his discovery. In these quaint forms of thought and language, he enunciates great principles of morals and legislation for the first time. They all trace back to the mind and God, who holds the beginning, middle, and end of all things in his hand. The balance of the divine and human elements in the world is conceived in the spirit of modern popular philosophy, differing not much in the way it is expressed. At first glance, the lawmaker appears to be powerless, for all things are subject to chance. But we also acknowledge that God governs all things, and that chance and opportunity work together with him, compare the saying, that chance is the name of the unknown cause. Lastly, while we recognize that God and chance govern mankind and provide the conditions for human action, experience does not allow us to deny the importance of art. We know that it is useful to have a pilot, even though the storm may overwhelm him, and a lawmaker is needed to ensure the happiness of a state, even though he will pray for favorable conditions under which he can exercise his art. Book 5. Hear now, all of you who heard the laws about gods and ancestors, of all human possessions, the soul is the most divine, and most truly a person's own. For in every person, there are two parts a better part that rules, and an inferior part that serves and the ruler is to be preferred over the servant. Therefore, I urge everyone, after the gods, to honor their own soul, and they can only honor it by making it better. A person does not honor their soul by flattery, or gifts, or self-indulgence, or arrogance in knowledge, nor when they blame others for their own mistakes, nor when they indulge in pleasure or refuse to endure pain, nor when they think that life at any cost is good, because they fear the underworld which, far from being an evil, may be the greatest good, nor when they prefer beauty over virtue without realizing that the soul, which came from heaven, is more honorable than the body, which is born of the earth, nor when they desire dishonest gains, of which no amount is equal in value to virtue, in short, when they consider what the lawmaker declares as evil to be good, they degrade their soul, which is the most divine part of them. They do not consider that the true punishment for wrongdoing is to become like evil people and to avoid the company of the good, and that those who associate with such people must do and suffer what they naturally do and say to one another, which is not justice but retribution. For justice is noble, but retribution is only the companion of injustice. And whether a person escapes punishment or not, they are equally miserable, for in one case, they are not cured and in the other case, they perish so that the rest may be saved. The glory of a person is to follow the better part and improve the inferior part. And the soul is the part of a person that is most inclined to avoid evil and dwell with the good. Therefore, the soul is second only to the gods in honor, and in the third place, the body is to be esteemed, which often has a false honor. For honor is not to be given to the beautiful or the strong, or the swift or the tall, or to the healthy, any more than to their opposites, but to the moderate states of all these qualities, and the same goes for property and external goods. No person should accumulate wealth to leave it to their children. The best condition for them, as well as for the state, is a moderate one, in which there is freedom without luxury. And the best inheritance for children is modesty. But modesty cannot be instilled through admonition alone that elders must set the example. Those who wish to educate the young must first educate themselves. Those who honor their relatives and family can expect that the gods will bless them with children. Those who desire friends must value the favors they receive from them and not focus on what they do for others. Those who prefer winning the palm of obedience to the laws over winning an Olympic or any other victory serve the state and their fellow citizens best. Engagements with strangers are to be considered most sacred because the stranger, having neither relatives nor friends, is immediately under the protection of Zeus, the god of strangers. A prudent person will not wrong a stranger, and even more carefully, they will avoid wronging a suppliant, which is an offense that the gods never overlook. Now I will discuss those specific matters that are only a matter of praise and blame, and although not enforced by the law, greatly affect the inclination to obey the law. Truth holds the highest position among the gifts bestowed by both gods and humans, as truth breeds trust. However, one should not trust someone who willingly tells lies, and a person who unknowingly spreads falsehoods is foolish. Neither the ignorant nor the untrustworthy can find happiness, as they have no friends in life and die without anyone mourning or caring for them. 
A good person is one who does not commit injustice, a better person is one who prevents others from doing so, and the best person is one who joins the rulers in punishing injustice. This applies to all goods and virtues in general. The person who possesses them and shares them with others is the most admirable, the person who would share them if they could is second best, and the person who possesses them but is reluctant to share them should be criticized, although their goods or virtues should still be valued. Every person should strive in their endeavors without envy, as an unenvious person strengthens the community. By being at the forefront of their pursuits, they do not harm others with slander. On the other hand, an envious person is weak themselves and drives their rivals to despair with their malicious gossip, thus depriving the entire community of motivation to practice virtue and tarnishing its reputation. Every person should be gentle, but also passionate, as they must have the spirit to fight against incurable and malignant evil. However, when dealing with evil that can be remedied, one should approach it with more sorrow than anger. An unjust person should be pitted in any case as no one willingly does evil or allows evil to exist in their soul. Therefore, when dealing with those who can be cured, one must be patient and tolerant, but those who cannot be cured should face the full extent of our anger. The greatest evil of all is self-love, which is considered natural and excusable, and even enforced as a duty, yet it is the cause of many errors. The person in love is blinded by their affection and prioritizes their own interests over truth and righteousness. However, a genuinely great person seeks justice above all else. Self-love leads to an ignorant overestimation of one's own knowledge, resulting in constant action without success. Therefore, every person should avoid self-love and follow the guidance of those who are wiser than themselves. There are lesser matters that a person should keep in mind, as wisdom is like a flowing stream that comes and goes, and recollection comes when knowledge is lacking. One should not laugh or grieve excessively, but rather control their emotions in times of good or bad fortune, believing that the gods will lessen the hardships and increase the blessings of the righteous. These thoughts should always occupy the mind of a good person, remembering them in both light-hearted and serious moments, and reminding others of them. This concludes the discussion of divine matters and the relationship between humans and gods. However, humans are still humans and are influenced by pleasure and pain. Therefore, it is important to develop a true understanding of both. What is a true understanding? This can only be explained by comparing one life to another. Pleasure is something desired, while pain is something to be avoided. The absence of pain is preferable to pain, but not to pleasure. There are countless types and degrees of both pleasure and pain, and we choose the life that offers more pleasure and avoid the one that offers less. However, we do not choose a life in which the elements of pleasure are weak or equally balanced with pain. All the lives we desire are pleasant, and choosing any other life is due to inexperience. Now, there are four types of lives, the temperate life, the rational life, the courageous life, and the healthy life. Let us contrast these with four other types, the intemperate life, the foolish life, the cowardly life, and the diseased life. The temperate life experiences gentle pains and pleasures and has calm desires, while the intemperate life experiences intense delights and even stronger desires. The pleasures of the temperate life outweigh the pains, while the pains of the intemperate life outweigh the pleasures. If this is true, then no one willingly chooses to be intemperate, but those who lack temperance are either ignorant or lack self-control, as people always choose the life they believe offers more pleasure. The wise, healthy, and courageous lives also have the advantage of offering more pleasure than their counterparts. In general, a life of virtue is far more pleasurable, honorable, beautiful, and happier than a life of vice. This should serve as the introduction to our laws, with further discussion to follow. In the constitution of a state, there are two main aspects to consider, the selection of rulers and the laws they must administer. However, before delving further into this topic, there are some preliminary matters to address. Just as with animals, a selection must be made among humans as well. The bad must be eliminated, and the good must be retained. The legislator must purify the population, although this task is difficult if they are not a despot. Harsher forms of purification are carried out when major offenders are punished with death or exile. 
However, there is a milder process that is necessary when the poor show a tendency to attack the property of the rich. In such cases, the legislator will send them to another land, establishing them as a colony. In our case, we only need to purify the streams before they converge. This can be a troublesome task, but in theory, we can assume that the operation has been performed and the desired purity has been achieved. We will prevent evil individuals from entering and welcome the good as friends. Like the old Heraclid colony, we are fortunate to avoid the issues of debt abolition and land distribution, which are complex and dangerous matters. But, perhaps, now that we are discussing this topic, we should explain how, if the danger exists, the legislator should try to prevent it. He would turn to prayers and trust in the healing power of time. He would foster a friendly spirit between creditors and debtors, those who have should give to those who do not, and poverty should be seen as an increase in one's desires rather than a decrease in one's property. Goodwill is the only safe and lasting foundation of a political society, and our city will be built upon it. The wise lawgiver will not proceed with organizing the state until all disputes about property are resolved. It would be foolish for him to introduce new reasons for conflict. Now let us move on to the distribution of our state and determine the size of the territory and the number of allotments. The territory should be sufficient to sustain the citizens in moderation, and the population should be large enough to defend themselves and occasionally assist their neighbors. We will set the number of citizens at 5040, and the number of houses and portions of land will correspond to this number. Let the number be divided into two parts and then into three. This is very convenient for distribution purposes and allows for 59 divisions, 10 of which proceed without interruption from 1 to 10. These numbers are sufficient for times of war and peace, and for all contracts and transactions. These properties of numbers are true and should be determined for practical use. When carrying out the distribution of land, a prudent legislator will be careful to respect any provisions for religious worship that have been approved by ancient tradition or by the oracles of Delphi, Dodona, or Ammon. All sacrifices, altars, and temples, regardless of their origin, should remain as they are. Each division should have a patron god or hero, and a portion of the land should be dedicated to them. The inhabitants of the district should gather at their temples from time to time for mutual assistance and friendship. All the citizens of a state should know each other, for without knowledge of each other's character, there can be no justice or fair administration. Every person should be honest and sincere and not allow themselves to be deceived by others. And now the game begins, and we start moving the pieces. At first glance, our constitution may seem unusual and unsuitable for a legislator who does not have absolute power. However, upon further consideration, it will be seen as the second best, if not the absolute best. There are three forms of government, the first, the second, and the third best, from which Kleinias must now choose. The first and highest form is one in which friends have everything in common, including wives and property. They share common fears, hopes, and desires, and do not even consider their eyes or hands as their own. This is the ideal state, the truest and best state that can exist, whether inhabited by gods or the children of gods, and it brings happiness to its inhabitants. This is the model that we must always keep in mind, but we are now concerned with the next best form, and we will later move on to the third. Since our citizens are not naturally or educationally prepared to accept the idea of having everything in common, let them keep their houses and private property, but use them in service to their country, which is their god and parent, as well as the gods and demigods of the land. Their priority should be to preserve the number of their lots. This can be ensured in the following way, when the owner of a lot dies, they shall pass it on to their most beloved child who will become the inheritor of all duties and interests and will serve the gods, the family, the living, and the dead. Of the remaining children, the females must be married according to a law that will be established later, and the males may be assigned to citizens who do not have children of their own. Equalizing families and allotments will be one of the main responsibilities of the guardians of the laws. When parents have too many children, they may give some to those who have none, or couples may choose not to have children, or if there is a lack of offspring, special efforts may be made to obtain them. Conversely, if the number of citizens becomes excessive, we may send the surplus to establish a colony. 
If, on the other hand, a war or plague reduces the population, new citizens must be introduced. If possible, these new citizens should not be of low birth or have inferior education, but even God, it is said, cannot always fight against necessity. Therefore, we will address our citizens as follows, good friends, honor order and equality, and above all, the number 5040. Secondly, respect the original division of the lots, which must not be violated by buying and selling, for the law states that the land a person possesses is sacred and given to them by God. Priests and priestesses will offer frequent sacrifices and pray that anyone who sells their house or lot receives the punishment they deserve. These prayers will be inscribed on cypress wood tablets for future generations to learn from. The guardians will closely watch over the citizens and punish those who disobey God and the law. To fully appreciate the benefits of such an institution, one must be well educated, as it is unlikely that one will amass wealth in our state where all menial occupations are forbidden to free citizens. The law also states that no private individual shall possess gold or silver, except for a small amount of currency for daily use, which will not be accepted in other countries. The state must also have a common national currency, but this is only to be used for funding expeditions, embassies, or while a person is traveling abroad. However, in the latter case, they must return any excess currency to the treasury in exchange for an equal amount of local currency upon their return. Failure to do so will result in the loss of the excess amount. Additionally, anyone who fails to report an offender will be fined an equal amount. It is prohibited to give or receive money as a dowry or to lend money with interest. The law will not protect a person in recovering either interest or principal. These regulations indicate that the goal of the legislator is not to make the city as wealthy or powerful as possible, but rather to make it the best and happiest. It is difficult for individuals to be both virtuous and wealthy at the same time. This is because someone who earns and saves twice as much as they should, receiving money where they should not and not spending where they should, will be at least twice as wealthy as someone who earns money where they should and spends where they should. On the other hand, a completely immoral person is generally wasteful and poor, while someone who acquires wealth honestly and spends it on noble pursuits can hardly be very wealthy. Therefore, a very wealthy person is not a good person and therefore not a happy one. The purpose of our laws is to make the citizens as friendly and happy as possible, which cannot be achieved if they are constantly in conflict and harming each other in the pursuit of wealth. Therefore, we declare that there shall be no silver or gold in the state, no usury, and no breeding of lower quality livestock. Instead, the focus shall be on agriculture, but only to the extent that it does not cause individuals to neglect the things for which money is made, namely the soul and the body. Both are not of much value without music and physical exercise. Money shall be held in the lowest or third position of importance, with the highest interests being those of the soul, and the second highest being those of the body. This is the correct order of legislation, which would be disrupted by placing health before self-control and wealth before health. It would be ideal if every person could come to the colony with equal property, but equality is impossible. Therefore, we must avoid causing offense by valuing property and equalizing taxation. To achieve this, let us create four classes in which citizens can be placed based on the amount of their original property and changes in their fortune. The greatest evil is revolution, which is caused by extremes of poverty or wealth. The limit of poverty shall be the minimum amount of property, which cannot be decreased and may be increased up to five times. Anyone who exceeds this limit must surrender the excess to the state. If they fail to do so and are reported, the surplus will be divided between the informant and the gods, and the offender will pay a sum equal to the surplus from their own property. All property, other than the minimum amount, must be registered to easily resolve any disputes that may arise. The city shall be located in a suitable position, as close to the center of the country as possible and shall be divided into twelve wards. First, we will build an acropolis surrounded by a wall, within which the temples of Hestia, Zeus, and Athena will be located. From this, lines will be drawn to divide the city and the country into twelve sections. The country will be further divided into 5,040 lots. Each lot will have two parts, one farther from the city and the other closer. 
the distance of one part will be compensated by the proximity of the other, with the size of the lots varying based on their quality. Twelve lots will be assigned to twelve gods, and they will give their names to the tribes. The divisions of the city will correspond to those of the country, and each person will have two residences, one near the center of the country and the other at the outskirts. It is natural to object that all the advantages we have discussed will never come together. Citizens will not accept a settlement in which they are deprived of gold and silver, have their family size regulated, and have the location of their houses determined by law. It will be argued that our city is merely an ideal that cannot be realized. The legislator will respond, I understand, but I believe that we should present an ideal that is as perfect as possible. If difficulties arise in implementing the plan, we must overcome them and carry out the rest. However, the legislator must be allowed to complete their idea without interruption. The number 12, which we have chosen for the divisions, must be used throughout the state, including fraternities, villages, ranks of soldiers, coins, and measures of volume and weight, all of which should be made commensurable with each other. There is nothing wrong with requiring the smallest vessels to have a common measure, as the divisions of numbers are useful for measuring height, depth, sounds, and movements in all directions. The legislator should emphasize the value of arithmetic to the citizens, as it is a powerful tool for sharpening and inspiring the intellect. No other educational instrument has as much power or contributes as much to intellectual development. But the lawmaker must be careful to instill a noble and generous spirit into the students, or they will tend to become cunning rather than wise. This can be proven by the example of the Egyptians and Phoenicians, who, despite their knowledge of arithmetic, are degraded in their general character. Whether this defect in them is due to some natural cause or a bad lawmaker is unclear. It is evident that different regions have varying abilities to produce good individuals, as factors such as climate, water, and food have significant effects on both the body and soul. Regions that have holy air and are favored by the gods are particularly fortunate. The lawmaker must pay attention to all of this to the best of their ability. Now, we will consider the appointment of magistrates and the determination of the laws they will administer. It is worth noting that laws, no matter how good, are useless and even harmful if the magistrates are incapable of enforcing them. Therefore, the potential rulers of our hypothetical state should be tested from their youth until the time of their election. Additionally, those who will elect them should be trained in the habits of law so that they can make informed judgments about good and bad individuals. Uneducated colonists who are unfamiliar with each other are unlikely to make wise choices. So, what should we do? I will tell you, the colony will be entrusted to ten commissioners, of whom you are one, and I will assist you in them. This is why I have created this story. I cannot bear for the tale to wander around the world without direction, it would be an unsightly monster. Yes, and I will fulfill my promise if God is gracious and old age allows. But let us not forget how audaciously mad this city of ours is. Why do I say this? Well, our courage is demonstrated by our belief that the new colonists will willingly accept our laws. No one likes to receive laws when they are first imposed. If only we could wait until those who have been educated under these laws have grown up and are of voting age, there would be a greater chance of our institutions lasting. That is absolutely true. The founders of Gnosis should take great care in the matter of the colony and the election of higher officers, especially the guardians of the law. The guardians should be appointed in the following manner, the Gnosians, who are leading the colony, along with the colonists, will choose 37 individuals. Nineteen of them will be colonists, and the remaining eighteen will be Nosians. You must be one of the eighteen and become a citizen of the new state. Why don't you and Megillus join us? Athens and Sparta are proud, and they are both far away. But let me continue with my plan. Once the state is established, the election process will be as follows, all those who are serving or have served in the army will be eligible to vote. The election will take place in the most sacred temple. The voter will place a tablet on the altar, inscribing the name of their preferred candidate, as well as the candidate's father, tribe, and ward. They will also sign their own name in the same manner. If they are not satisfied with any of the tablets, they may remove them and place them in the agora for 30 days. 
the 300 candidates with the most votes will be officially announced, and from them, there will be a second election of 100. Finally, there will be a third and final election of 37, accompanied by the solemnity of the electors passing through victims. But who will organize all of this? There is a common saying that the beginning is half the whole, and I would say it is even more than half. The only way to start is from the parent city. Although the bond may be broken and conflicts may arise in later years, in the early days, the child naturally looks to the mother for care and education. As I mentioned before, the notion should take an interest in the colony and select 100 elders from their own citizens. These elders will be joined by 100 of the colonists to arrange and supervise the first elections and scrutinies. Once the colony is established, the notions can return home and leave the colonists to govern themselves. The 37 magistrates who have been elected as described will have the following duties. First, they will be guardians of the law. Second, they will oversee the registers of property in the four classes, excluding the surplus of one, two, three, and four minie. Anyone found to possess property that is not recorded in the registers will have their property confiscated and will be subject to legal proceedings. If found guilty, they will lose their share in public property and money distributions, and their sentence will be inscribed in a public place. The guardians will hold office for 20 years only, starting at the age of 50. If elected at 60, they will not remain in office after 70. Now, we need to elect generals, commanders of horse, and brigadiers of foot. The generals must be natives of the city and will be proposed by the guardians of the law. They will be elected by those who are or have been of the age for military service. Anyone can challenge the nominated person and propose another candidate, whom they affirm, under oath, to be better qualified. The three individuals who receive the highest number of votes will be elected. These elected generals will then nominate the taxiarchs or brigadiers, and the process of challenging and voting will occur in the same manner as before. Initially, the elective assembly will be overseen by the guardians of the law in a sacred location until the praetanes and council are established. The citizens will be divided into three divisions, hoplites, cavalry, and the rest of the army, each group being placed separately. All citizens will vote for generals and cavalry officers. Only hoplites will vote for brigadiers. The cavalry will then choose phylarchs for the generals, while the generals themselves will appoint captains for archers and other irregular troops. The same individuals who vote for the generals will also propose and vote for the cavalry officers. The two individuals with the highest number of votes will become the leaders of the entire cavalry. Disputes regarding the voting process may be raised twice, but if a third dispute arises, the presiding officers will make the final decision. The council will consist of 360 members, conveniently divided into four sections, with each class having 90 councillors. Initially, all citizens will select candidates from the first class, and they will be required to vote under penalty of a fine. This will occur on the first day. On the second day, a similar selection will be made from the second class under the same conditions. On the third day, Candidates will be chosen from the third class, but only voters from the first three classes will be compelled to vote. On the fourth day, council members will be selected from the fourth class. All citizens will participate in the selection, but only the second class will face a fine if they do not vote, with the amount being tripled from the initial fine. The first class will also face a quadruple fine. On the fifth day, the names of the candidates will be displayed and 180 individuals from each class will be chosen by all citizens. These individuals will then be reduced to 90 through a lottery, resulting in a council of 360 members for the year. This mode of election is a balance between monarchy and democracy, and it should always be observed in the state. Servants and masters cannot be friends, and although equality fosters friendship, it is important to remember that there are two types of equality. One is based on numbers and measurements, while the other is a higher form of equality, determined by the judgment of Zeus. Mortal men are granted only a small amount of this higher equality, but it is the source of great benefit for cities and individuals. It is proportionate to each person's nature, granting more to the superior and less to the inferior. This is true political justice, and our state aims to uphold it, 
as every legislator should, without favoring the interests of tyrants or mobs. However, strict enforcement of justice is not always possible, and in such cases, equity and mercy must be employed. Similarly, when true justice is not accepted, we must resort to the rougher justice of chance, and pray for God's guidance. These are the main methods of preserving the state, but constant vigilance is also necessary. Just as a ship sailing on the sea requires constant watchfulness day and night, the ship of state is tossed in a political sea, and therefore, one watch must succeed another, and rulers must work together. A small group will be best suited for this duty, so the majority of the 360 senators may attend to their own affairs. However, one twelfth of the senators must be set aside each month for the administration of the state. Their responsibilities will include receiving information, responding to embassies, and preventing or resolving internal disorders. To fulfill these tasks, they will have control over all citizen assemblies. In addition to the council, there must be wardens for the city and the agora. They will oversee houses, roads, harbors, markets, and fountains in the city and its suburbs, ensuring that no harm comes to them from humans or animals. Temples will also require priests and priestesses. Those who hold hereditary priestly positions will not be disturbed, but since there will likely be few or none in a new colony, priests and priestesses will be appointed for the gods who have no servants. Some of these officers will be elected, while others will be chosen by lot. All classes will participate in a friendly manner during the elections. The selection of priests should be left to God, that is, to chance. However, the elected individual must prove that they are physically sound, of legitimate birth, and that their family has been free from any stain of impurity, such as homicide. Priests and priestesses must be at least 60 years old and will serve for one year only. The laws governing religious matters will be obtained from Delphi, and interpreters will be appointed to ensure their execution. The selection of these interpreters will occur as follows. The twelve tribes will be divided into three groups of four, each of which will nominate four candidates. This process will be repeated three times. From each group of twelve candidates, the three individuals with the highest number of votes, totaling nine, will undergo a scrutiny and then travel to Delphi. There, the god will choose one individual from each triad. These interpreters will serve for life, and when one of them dies, another will be elected by the four tribes that made the initial appointment. There shall also be treasurers of the temples, three for the larger temples, two for the smaller ones, and one for the least important ones. The defense of the city should be entrusted to the generals and other officers of the army, as well as the guardians of the city and marketplace. The defense of the country shall be as follows, the twelve tribes shall annually divide the twelve regions of the country among themselves, and each tribe shall appoint five guardians and commanders of the watch. The five guardians in each region shall select twelve guards from their own tribe, who must be between the ages of twenty-five and thirty. Both the guardians and the guards will serve for two years, rotating through the regions, spending one month in each. During their service, their primary duty will be to ensure that the country is well protected with fortifications and defenses. They will utilize the local laborers and animals, but they must not disrupt the regular course of agriculture. While making the country as inaccessible as possible to enemies, they will also construct and maintain good roads to make it accessible to friends. They will manage and preserve the water that comes from the rain, making dry places fertile and wet places dry. They will beautify the fountains with gardens and buildings and provide water for irrigation throughout the year. They will direct the streams to the temples and groves of the gods, where the youth can create their own gymnasia and the elderly can enjoy warm baths. In these places, the weary laborer will receive a warm welcome and be treated better than by an unskilled doctor. These works will be both useful and ornamental, but the sixty guardians must also fulfill other duties. They must oversee their assigned districts and act as judges. For minor matters, the five commanders will make decisions, for larger matters up to three minor, the five commanders and the twelve guards will decide. Like all other judges, except those with final authority, they will be accountable for their decisions. If the guardians impose unfair tasks on the villagers, seize their crops or tools by force, or make biased decisions due to flattery or bribes, 
they shall be publicly disgraced. For any other wrongdoing involving Amina, the neighbors will decide, but if the accused refuses to submit, thinking that their monthly rotations will allow them to escape punishment, or in cases involving larger amounts, the injured party may seek recourse in the common court. If successful, they may exact double the penalty. While serving their two-year term, the guardians and guards shall live and eat together. Any guard who is absent from daily meals without permission or sleeps outside at night shall be considered a deserter and may be punished by anyone who encounters them. If any of the commanders commits such an offense, all sixty of them shall ensure that the offender is punished. Anyone who covers up for the offender shall face an even harsher penalty than the offender themselves. Through service, a person learns to govern. They should take pride in serving the laws and the gods throughout their life and in having served respected and honorable individuals in their youth. The twelve and the five should be their own servants and use the labor of the villagers only for the benefit of the public. They should thoroughly explore the country and acquire a complete knowledge of every area. To achieve this, hunting and field sports should be encouraged. Now we must discuss the election of the guardians of the marketplace and the city. There shall be three guardians of the city, responsible for the streets, roads, buildings, and water supply. They shall be chosen from the highest class. Once the number of candidates has been narrowed down to six with the most votes, three out of the six shall be selected by lot and, after a scrutiny, admitted to their office. They shall punish those who damage them with physical punishment and imprisonment if they are slaves or foreigners, and with fines if they are citizens. The guardians of the city shall have a similar power to inflict punishment and fines in their own area of responsibility. Next, there must be directors of music and physical education. One group will oversee the gymnasia and schools, as well as the attendance and lodging of boys and girls. The other group will be responsible for music and athletic competitions. In music competitions, there shall be judges for solo singing or playing, who will evaluate rhapsodists, flute players, harp players, and similar performers, as well as judges for choruses. There shall be choruses of men, boys, and girls. One director will be sufficient to oversee all of them, and they should be at least 40 years old. Additionally, there shall be one director for solo performances, who should be at least 30 years old. They will introduce the competitors and pass judgment on them. The director of the choruses is to be elected in an assembly where all those interested in music are required to attend, and no one else. Candidates must only be proposed based on their suitability and opposed on the grounds of unsuitability. Ten individuals will be elected through voting and the one chosen by law will serve as the director for a year. Next, three judges for gymnastic contests will be elected from the second and third classes. These judges will be selected by law from a pool of 20 individuals who have been elected by the three highest classes. These individuals are also required to attend the election. There will be one remaining official who will have the general oversight of education. This individual must be at least 50 years old and have legitimate children of their own. Their position should be regarded as the highest in the state, as the proper development of the first stages of growth in plants and animals is the primary cause of matured perfection. Man is considered a domesticated animal, but his behavior can range from gentle to fierce depending on his education. Therefore, the individual elected to oversee education should be the best person possible. They will hold office for five years and will be elected by the other magistrates, excluding the Senate and Praetanes. The election will be conducted by secret ballot in the Temple of Apollo. If a magistrate dies before their term is over, a replacement will be elected. If the guardian of an orphan dies, the relatives must appoint a new guardian within ten days, or else they will be fined a drachma per day for neglect. A city without courts of law will soon cease to be a city. A judge who remains silent and leaves the investigation to the litigants, as in arbitrations, is not a good judge. It is better to have a few good judges than many. The truth should be elicited through time and examination. Cases should first be tried before a corps of neighbors. If the decision is unsatisfactory, they can be referred to a higher court, and if necessary, to a higher court still, where the decision will be final. Every magistrate is a judge 
and every judge is a magistrate on the day they are deciding a case. The Supreme Court will be agreed upon by the litigants. There will also be two other courts, one for public causes and one for private causes. The High Court of Appeal will be composed of the best individuals from each magistracy, chosen by all the officers of state. After undergoing scrutiny, these individuals will serve as judges of appeal. They will give their decisions openly in the presence of the magistrates who elected them, and the public may attend. If someone accuses a judge of intentionally making a wrong decision, they must present their accusation to the guardians of the law. If the judge is found guilty, they will pay damages equal to half the harm caused, unless the guardians of the law determine that a harsher punishment is warranted, in which case the judges will assess the penalty. Since offenses against the state harm the entire population, the people should be involved in their trial. Such cases should originate from the people and be decided by them. The inquiry will take place before any three of the highest magistrates agreed upon by the defendant and plaintiff. In private suits, as many people as possible should serve as judges, so there should be a court of law in every ward. Those who have no role in the administration of justice believe that they have no role in the state. The judges in these courts will be elected by lot and will give their decision immediately. The final judgment in all cases will rest with the Court of Appeal. Now that we have finished discussing the appointment of courts and the election of officials, we can proceed to make our laws. Your way of proceeding, stranger, is admirable. Then so far, our old man's game of play has gone well. Say, rather, our serious and noble pursuit. Perhaps, but let me ask if you have ever observed how painters apply and remove color. Their endless labor will only last a short time unless they leave behind a successor who can restore the painting and correct its flaws. Certainly. And don't we have a similar goal at this moment? We are old ourselves, so we must leave our legislative work to be improved and perfected by the next generation. We must not only make laws for our guardians, but also make them into lawmakers. We must at least do our best. Let us address them as follows. Beloved saviors of the laws, we present you with an outline of legislation that you must fill in according to the guidelines we will provide. McGillis, Kleinias, and I agree and we hope that you will also agree with us in believing that a man's entire efforts should be devoted to the pursuit of virtuous adulthood, whether through study, habit, desire, or opinion. Rather than accepting institutions that degrade and enslave him, he should leave his country and endure any hardship. These are our principles, and we ask you to judge our laws and praise or criticize them based on their ability to improve our citizens. And first, let us discuss laws regarding religion. As we have previously mentioned, the number 5040 has many convenient divisions. We took a twelfth part of this number, 420, which is itself divisible by 12, to represent the number of tribes. Each divisor is a gift from God and corresponds to the months of the year and the revolution of the universe. Every city has a number, but none is more fortunate than our own, which can be divided by all numbers up to 12, except for 11. However, even eleven can be divided if we subtract two families. Now, let us divide the state and assign a god or demigod to each division. Altars will be raised to them, and sacrifices will be offered twice a month. Assemblies will be held in their honor, twelve for the tribes and twelve for the city, corresponding to their divisions. The purpose of these assemblies will be to promote religion and encourage friendship and interaction between families. It is important for families to know each other before marrying into one another, as this will prevent misunderstandings. During these festivals, young men and women will engage in innocent dances, providing them with the opportunity to see each other in modest attire. The experts in choruses and the guardians will oversee the details of these festivals, incorporating their experience into laws. After ten years, these laws will be made permanent with the consent of the legislator if they are still alive. If the legislator is deceased, the guardians of the law will perfect and finalize the laws. If any further changes are needed, the magistrates must consult the entire population and obtain the approval of all the oracles. When someone between the ages of 25 and 35 wishes to marry, they may do so. However, before they proceed, they must listen to the following advice, 
my son, you should marry not for the sake of wealth or to avoid poverty. Do not choose a spouse who is like you in terms of property and character, as is common among men. Instead, consider the interests of the state rather than your own pleasure. Equal marriages lead to an unequal society. However, enacting a law that prevents the rich and powerful from marrying one another, or that unites the quick with the slow and the slow with the quick, will anger some and amuse others. They fail to understand that opposing elements should be mixed in the state, just as wine should be mixed with water. Therefore, the outcome we desire should be left to the influence of public opinion. And do not forget our previous instruction that everyone should strive for immortality and raise a virtuous offspring to serve God. This will serve as the introduction to the law regarding the duty of marriage. If a man refuses to listen and remains unmarried at the age of 35, he will be required to pay an annual fine. The amount of the fine will depend on his social class, 100 drachmas for the first class, 70 for the second, 60 for the third, and 30 for the fourth. This fine will be dedicated to the goddess Hera. If the man refuses to pay, the treasurer of Hera will exact a tenfold penalty and be responsible for collecting the payment. Furthermore, the unmarried man will not receive any honor or obedience from the younger generation, and he will lose the right to punish others. There will be a limit on the dowry that can be given or received. In our state, if a woman is poor, she need not receive or give a dowry, as every citizen is provided with the necessities of life. Additionally, if the woman is not wealthy, her husband will not be her servant. Anyone who disobeys this law will be fined according to their social class, and the treasurers of Hera and Zeus will collect the fine. The betrothal of the couple will be arranged by their closest relatives, or if they have none, by their guardians. The rituals and ceremonies of marriage will be determined by the interpreters of sacred rites. The wedding party should be modest consisting of five male and five female friends, as well as an equal number of relatives. The expenses should not exceed a mina for the first class and half a mina for the second class. The expenses for the other classes should be proportionate. Extravagance will be seen as vulgar and ignorant of proper wedding customs. Excessive drinking should be reserved for the festivals of Dionysus and not for weddings. The bride and groom, who are embarking on a significant journey in life, should be fully present and alert. They should be especially cautious on the night when they may conceive a child, as no one can predict when this will happen. Their bodies and minds should be in a temperate state, abstaining from anything that resembles disease or vice, as these traits may become hereditary. There is an inherent divinity in humans that preserves all things when treated with proper respect. When a person marries, they should establish a home for their children in one of the two houses on their property. They should leave their parents, and their affection for them will only grow stronger with distance. They will venture forth like colonists and raise their offspring, passing on the torch of life to the next generation. Regarding property in general, there are few difficulties, except when it comes to owning slaves, which is a controversial institution. The slavery of the helots is approved by some and condemned by others. There is also uncertainty surrounding the slavery of the Mariandinians in Heraclea and the Thessalian Panesti. This raises the question, what should we do about slaves? To which everyone would agree in responding, let us have the best and most loyal slaves that we can find. We have all heard stories of slaves who have been better to their masters than their own sons or brothers. However, there is an opposing belief that slaves should never be trusted, as Homer says, slavery takes away half a man's understanding. Different people treat their slaves differently, some never trust them and beat them like dogs, making them even more submissive than before, while others take the opposite approach. Man is a troublesome creature, as has been shown many times, Megillus, especially in the uprisings of the Messenians. Great harm has occurred in countries where there are large groups of slaves from the same nationality. Two rules can be given for their management, first, if possible, they should not be from the same country or speak the same language, and second, they should be treated by their master with more fairness than even equals, out of respect for himself as much as for them. For the master who is just in the treatment of his slaves, or any inferiors, will sow the seeds of virtue in them. Masters should never joke with their slaves, this common but foolish practice only makes managing them more difficult and painful. 
Now, let us discuss dwellings. This should have been mentioned earlier, as no man can marry a wife and have slaves without a house for them to live in. Let us address this oversight. The temples should be placed around the marketplace, and the city should be built in a circular shape on the hills. Near the temples, which are sacred places and the abodes of the gods, there should be buildings for the magistrates and the courts of law, including those where capital offenses are to be tried. As for walls, Megillus, I agree with Sparta that they should be made of earth, cold steel is the best wall, as the poet beautifully says. Besides, it is absurd to send our youth to fortify and guard the borders of our country, only to build a city wall that is very unhealthy and may lead people to think they can go there and be idle, not realizing that true rest comes from labor and that idleness only brings more trouble. However, if a wall must be built, the private houses should be arranged in a way that forms a wall. This will have a pleasing appearance and make the city safer and more defensible. These matters should be attended to when the city is founded. The guardians of the city must ensure that they are carried out and enforce cleanliness and protect the public buildings from encroachment. They must also ensure that rain flows off easily and regulate other matters concerning the general administration of the city. If any further laws are needed, the guardians of the law must provide them. Now, having established buildings and married our citizens, let us proceed to discuss their way of life. In a well-organized state, individuals cannot be allowed to live as they please. Why do I say this? Because I am going to decree that the bridegroom must not be absent from the communal meals. These meals were originally instituted during times of war and, although they were considered unusual when first established, they have greatly contributed to the security of states. There was difficulty in introducing them, but there is no longer any difficulty. However, there is another institution that I would like to discuss if I may. I can preface my proposal by stating that disorder in a state is the source of all evil, while order is the source of all good. Now, in Sparta and Crete, there are communal meals for men, and this, as I mentioned before, is a divine and natural institution. But the women are left to themselves, they live in secluded places and, being weaker and therefore more wicked than men, they are responsible for more than half of the evil in states. This must be corrected, and the institution of communal meals should be extended to both sexes. However, in the current unfortunate state of opinion, who would dare to establish such meals? And even more, who can compel women to eat and drink in public? They will defy the legislator and refuse to leave their hiding places. In any other state, such a proposal would be met with opposition, but in our own state, I believe I can demonstrate that the attempt is just and reasonable. We would like to hear more. Listen, then, since we have plenty of time, let us go back to the beginning of things, a topic that is familiar to us. Very well. Either humans never had a beginning and will never have an end, or the time that has passed since humans first came into existence is almost infinite. No doubt. And in this infinite amount of time, there have been changes of all kinds, both in the seasons and in the governance of states and in the customs of eating and drinking. Vines and olives were eventually discovered, along with the blessings of Demeter and Persephone, which were said to have been brought by a man named Triptolemus, before his time, animals were eating each other. And there are still nations where humans sacrifice their fellow humans, while others lead a kind of orphic existence and refuse to sacrifice animals or even taste beef, they offer fruits or cakes soaked in honey instead. Perhaps you are wondering what the relevance of these remarks is. We are eager to hear. I will attempt to explain their significance. I understand that the well-being of human life depends on the proper control of three wants or desires. The first is the desire for food, the second for drink, these desires arise from birth and make us inclined to follow pleasure rather than any other voice. The third and strongest desire is felt later in life, this is love, which can consume a person entirely. These three disorders of humanity must be restrained by three powerful influences, fear, law, and reason. With the help of the muses and the gods of contests, these influences can help extinguish our lusts. Moving on, after marriage, we should focus on procreating and then raising and educating our children, gradually approaching the topic of communal meals. However, there are other points to consider that are suggested by the three desires mentioned earlier, food, 
drink, and love. The bride and groom should aim to have brave offspring. Success in this endeavor requires effort, so the groom should take special care of the bride, and vice versa, when their children are about to be born. A committee of married women should meet daily at the Temple of Ilithia at a time determined by the magistrates. They should report anyone who does not follow the laws of married life. The supervision of the parents and the time for procreation should last for ten years only. If, at the end of this period, they have no children, they may separate with the consent of their families and the official married women, considering the interests of both parties. If a dispute arises, ten guardians of the law shall be chosen as arbitrators. The married women also have the power to enter the homes of young couples, if necessary, to advise and warn them. If their efforts fail, they should go to the guardians of the law. If the guardians also fail, the offender, whether person, shall be forbidden from participating in any family ceremonies. If, after the time for procreation has ended, either the husband or wife engages in relations with others who can have children, they shall be subject to the same penalties as those who are still raising a family. However, once both parties have ceased to have children, there shall be no penalties. If people live virtuously, the laws can remain dormant, punishment is only necessary when there is great disorder in behavior. The first year of a child's life should be recorded in their ancestral temples. The name of the Archon of the Year should be inscribed on a white wall in every fray tree, along with the names of the living members of the fray tree, which should be erased upon their death. The appropriate age for a woman to marry is between 16 and 20, while for a man it is between 30 and 35. A woman can hold office at the age of 40, while a man can do so at 30. The age for military service for a man is between 20 and 60, and for a woman, it is from the time she stops having children until 50. Book 7 Now that we have married our citizens and brought their children into the world, we need to provide them with nurture and education. This is a matter of guidance rather than strict laws and cannot be precisely regulated by the legislator. Detailed regulations are often broken, and frequent transgressions undermine obedience to the laws. I speak vaguely, but I will also try to explain clearly. Am I not correct in saying that a good education improves both the body and the mind? Certainly. And the most beautiful body is one that grows straight and well-formed from birth. Very true. We observe that the initial growth of every living thing is the greatest, some even argue that a person is not twice as tall at 25 as they were at 5. True. Growth without exercise of the limbs leads to various bodily ailments. Yes. The body should have the most exercise during its most rapid growth. Are you referring to the bodies of young infants? No, I am referring to the bodies of unborn infants. Allow me to explain this unique form of exercise. The Athenians enjoy cockfighting, and those who raise roosters carry them in their hands or under their arms and take long walks, not for their own health, but for the health of the birds. This demonstrates the benefits of movement, whether it be rocking, swinging, riding, or being tossed on the waves. All these types of motion greatly increase strength and digestion. Therefore, when our women are pregnant, they should walk and shape the embryo. After birth, the children should be carried by strong nurses, preferably more than one, and should not be allowed to walk until they are three years old. Should we impose penalties for neglecting these rules? The greatest penalty, namely ridicule and the difficulty of getting the nurses to comply, will be faced by us. Then why discuss such matters? In the hope that heads of families will learn that proper regulation of these matters is the foundation of law and order in the state. Now, moving on from the body, let us focus on the soul. But first, we must reiterate that constant motion, both day and night, is beneficial for young children. This is proven by the Carabanchan cure of motion and the practice of nurses who rock children in their arms while singing sweet melodies to them. And the reason for this is obvious. The emotions, both Bacandis and of the children, arise from fear, and this fear is caused by something wrong happening within them. Now, a strong external disturbance tends to calm the strong internal one, it soothes the racing heart, allowing the children to sleep, and brings the Bacchantes back to their right minds through dances and acceptable offerings. 
But if fear has such power, won't a child who is always in a state of terror grow up timid and cowardly? On the other hand, if they learn from the beginning to resist fear, they will develop a habit of courage. That's very true. And we can say that physical activity will inspire children's souls with cheerfulness and therefore with courage. Of course. Softness weakens and irritates the temperament of the young, and violence makes them mean and misanthropic. But how can the state educate them when they are still unable to understand the meaning of words? Well, surely, they roar and cry, like the young of any other animal, and the nurse understands the meaning of these indications of the child's likes or dislikes, and the situations that provoke them. Children spend about three years in a state of imperfect speech, which is long enough to make them either good-tempered or ill-tempered. Therefore, during these first three years, the infant should be as free as possible from fear and pain. Yes, and they should have as much pleasure as possible. There, I think you are wrong, because the influence of pleasure in the beginning of education is harmful. A person should neither pursue pleasure nor completely avoid pain. They should embrace the middle ground and cultivate a state of calmness that mankind, taught by some inspiration, attribute to God, and someone who wants to be like God should neither be too fond of pleasure themselves, nor should they allow anyone else, especially not an infant, to be given excessive pleasure. It may sound ridiculous, but I affirm that a pregnant woman should be carefully tended and kept away from excessive pleasures and pains. I completely agree with you about the duty of avoiding extremes and following the middle ground. Let us consider another point. The matters that we are discussing are generally referred to as customs rather than laws, and we have already reflected that, although they are not technically laws, they cannot be ignored either. Because they fill in the gaps of the law and are the supports and connections on which the strength of the entire structure depends. Laws without customs never last, and we should not be surprised if habit and custom sometimes prolong our laws. That's very true. So, up until their third year, the lives of children can be regulated by customs as we have described. From three to six, their minds need to be entertained, but they must not be allowed to become stubborn and spoiled. If punishment is necessary, the same rule applies as in the case of slaves, they must neither be punished in anger nor ruined by indulgence. Children of that age will have their own ways of entertaining themselves, they should be brought to the village temples for their play and placed under the care of nurses, who will be accountable to twelve matrons chosen annually by the women who have authority over marriage. One matron shall be appointed from each tribe, and their duty shall be to maintain order at the gatherings, they shall punish slaves who break the rules they have established with the help of some of the public slaves, but citizens who challenge their authority shall be brought before the magistrates. After six years of age, there shall be a separation of the sexes, the boys will go to learn horseback riding and the use of weapons, and the girls may, if they wish, also learn. Here I note a practical error in early training. Mothers and nurses foolishly believe that the left hand is naturally different from the right, whereas the left leg and foot are acknowledged to be the same as the right. But the truth is that nature made all things to be balanced, and the ability to use the left hand, which is of little importance in playing the lyre, may make a great difference in the art of the warrior, who should be a skilled gymnast and able to fight and maintain balance in any position. If a person had a hundred hands like Briarius, they should use all of them at once, at the very least, let everyone use the two hands they have. The magistrates, both male and female, should attend to these matters, the women overseeing the nursing and entertainment of the children, and the men overseeing their education, so that all of them, boys, and girls alike, may be healthy, strong, and not ruin the gifts of nature with bad habits. Education has two branches, physical education, which concerns the body, and music, which improves the soul. And physical education has two parts, dancing and wrestling. One type of dancing imitates musical recitation and aims for gracefulness and freedom, another type is concerned with training the body and promotes health, agility, and beauty. The complex wrestling systems that go by the names of Antaeus and Circean have no military use, nor do the tricks of boxing attributed to Amicus and Epius, but good wrestling and the ability to free oneself from hold should be diligently learned and taught. In our dances, imitations of war should be practiced, 
as in the dances of the curettes in Crete and the Dioscuri in Sparta, or as in the dances in full armor that were taught to us Athenians by the goddess Athena. Young people who are not yet old enough to go to war should participate in religious processions while armed and on horseback. They should also engage in military games and contests. These activities will be beneficial in both times of peace and war, benefiting both the state and families. Next, let us discuss music, which I will reiterate my previous statement that entertainment has a significant influence on laws. Someone who has been taught to play the same games and use the same toys will be content with the same laws. There is no greater harm to a state than the spirit of innovation. Change is dangerous in matters such as seasons, winds, managing our bodies, and our mental habits. The same rule applies to everything except what is bad. We all respect and accept the laws we are accustomed to, and if they have been in place for a long time with no memory of them being different, people are afraid to change them. So, how can we create this sense of immobility in laws? I propose that we prevent innovations in children's games and play. Children who constantly have new games will grow up to constantly have new laws. Changes in fashion are not serious problems, but changes in our perception of people's characters are. Rhythms and music are representations of characters, so we must avoid novelties in dance and song. To ensure permanence, we can learn from the Egyptians. They create a calendar for the year, determining which days to celebrate the festivals of various gods and consecrating appropriate hymns and dances for each festival. In our state, a similar arrangement will be created by certain individuals and then officially approved by all citizens. Anyone who introduces different hymns or dances will be excluded by the priests, priestesses, and guardians of the law. If they refuse to comply, they may be prosecuted for impiety. However, we should not be too quick to discuss such significant matters. Even a young person, when they hear something unfamiliar, looks around uncertainly, like a traveler at a crossroads. At our age, we should be confident in our arguments about such unique topics. Leaving this subject for further examination in the future, let us continue with our laws about education, as this may shed light on our current difficulty. The ancients used the term nomoi to refer to harmonious strains, perhaps believing that there was a connection between a country's songs and laws. We say that anyone who violates the established strains is also violating the laws and will be punished by the guardians of the law, priests, and priestesses. How can we legislate about these sacred strains without being ridiculed? We must first establish molds or types, and one of these types will be abstaining from using profane language during sacrifices. When a son or brother blasphemes during a sacrifice, it brings bad omens to the family. Many choruses stand by the altar uttering inauspicious words, and the one who incites the most lamentations are crowned the victor. Such lamentations should be reserved for times of misfortune and should only be uttered by hired mourners. Singers should not wear gold circlets or ornaments. Our second law or type will be that prayers must always accompany sacrifices, and our third law will be that since all prayers are requests, they should only be for good things. The poets must understand this. Haven't we already decided that no gold or silver should be allowed in our city? Didn't this show our dissatisfaction with the poets? We may fear that if they are allowed to offer imprudent prayers, they will bring great misfortune to the state. Therefore, we must make a law that poets cannot contradict the laws or ideas of the state, and they cannot show their poems to anyone until they have received approval from the director of education. A fourth musical law will be that hymns and praises should be offered to gods, heroes, and demigods. Another law will allow eulogies of distinguished citizens, whether male or female but only after their death. Regarding songs and dances, we will enact the following, a selection of the best ancient musical compositions and dances will be made by judges who must be at least 50 years old. They will accept some and reject or modify others, and if necessary, they will consult with the poets. The severe and orderly music is the style in which to educate children. If they are accustomed to this style, they will consider the opposite to be uncultured but if they are accustomed to the opposite, they will find the severe style to be cold and unpleasing. Furthermore, a distinction should be made between the melodies for men and women. Nature itself teaches that the grand or masculine style should be assigned to men, 
in the moderate and temperate style should be assigned to women. That covers the subjects of education. Now, let us discuss who should be taught and when. Like a shipwright laying down the keel of a vessel, I must establish a secure foundation for the soul's journey through life. Human affairs are rarely serious, yet we are compelled by a sad necessity to take them seriously. Therefore, let us do our best to bring this matter to a conclusion. Very well. I say then that God is the object of a person's most serious endeavors. However, humans are created to be the playthings of the gods, and therefore everyone's aim should be to go through life not in grim seriousness, but playing the noblest of games, with a different spirit than what prevails now. The common opinion is that work is for the sake of play, and war is for the sake of peace. However, in war, there is neither amusement nor worthwhile instruction. The life of peace is what people should desire to prolong and improve. They should live by sacrificing, singing, and dancing, with the intention of appeasing gods and heroes. I have already told you the types of song and dance they should follow, and as the poet says, some things you will devise for yourself, others, God will suggest to you. These words can be applied to our students. They will partly teach themselves and partly be taught by God the art of appeasing Him, for they are His puppets and only have a small portion of truth. You have a low opinion of humans. It is no wonder when I compare them to God, but if you are offended, I will place them a little higher. Next, let us discuss the construction of gymnasiums and schools. These will be in the center of the city, with riding schools and archery grounds on the outskirts. In all these places, there should be instructors for the youth, brought from other lands and paid to teach them music and war. Education will be mandatory, children must attend school whether their parents approve or not, as they belong to the state more than to their parents. Furthermore, I confidently state that both men and women should receive the same education in writing and physical exercise. The ancient tradition of the Amazon supports my view, and even today there are countless women called Soromatides living near the Pontus, who practice writing, archery, and the use of weapons. Compared to our women, the Soromatides are like men. But our legislators, Megillus, only did half of their job, they took care of the men and left the women to fend for themselves. Shall we allow the stranger, Cleinias, to criticize Sparta in this way? Well, yes, because we cannot take back the freedom we have already granted him. What will be the way of life for people of moderate means, freed from the toils of agriculture and business, and having communal tables for themselves and their families, overseen by male and female magistrates? Are these people only meant to eat and grow fat like animals? If they do, how can they avoid the fate of a fatted beast, which is to be torn apart by a stronger beast? It is true that their way of life is not perfect, as they do not have everything in common, but the second best way of life also brings great blessings. Even those who live in this second state have a task twice as great as that of any Pythian or Olympic victor, for their labor is for the body alone, whereas ours is for both body and soul. This higher work should be pursued day and night, to the exclusion of all else. The magistrates who govern the city should be vigilant, and the head of the household should rise early, before all the servants. The mistress should also awaken her maidservants, rather than being awakened by them. We do not require much sleep for our souls or bodies. When a person is asleep, they are no better than if they were dead. Those who love life and wisdom should only get the sleep necessary for good health. Magistrates who stay awake at night are feared by the wicked, honored by the good, and beneficial to themselves and the state. When morning comes, the boys should go to school. Just as sheep need a shepherd, the boy needs a teacher, for he is both the most cunning and the most disobedient of creatures. He should be taken away from his mother and nurses, and tamed with discipline and punishment, being treated as a free person in that he learns and is taught but as a slave in that he may be chastised by any other free person. Any free person who neglects to discipline him should be disgraced. All these matters will be under the supervision of the Director of Education. We will address him as follows, We have spoken to you, O illustrious teacher of youth, about song, rhythm, dance, and martial strains. However, we have not spoken about the learning of letters, prose writings, music, and the use of calculation for military and domestic purposes. 
nor have we spoken about the higher use of numbers in calculating divine things, such as the movements of the stars or the arrangement of days, months, and years. The accurate calculation of these things is necessary for the orderly progression of seasons and festivals, which enliven the city and allow us to render proper worship to the gods, and to know them better. There are many things that we have not yet instructed you about, and first, let us talk about reading and music. Should the student become proficient in both or not even begin these studies? They should begin both. They should start learning letters from the age of 10 to 13, and at 13, they should start learning to play the lyre and continue learning music until they are 16. They should not spend less or more time on this, regardless of how much they or their parents enjoy it. In terms of reading, they should focus on simple reading and writing, but they do not need to worry about calligraphy and shorthand if they do not have the natural ability to learn them in three years. Now, let us discuss the learning of prose compositions without music. They can be dangerous. So, tell us, guardians of the law, what should we do about them? You seem to be in a difficult situation. Yes, it is difficult to go against the opinion of everyone. But haven't we done that before? Yes, that is true. And you suggest that the path we are taking, although disliked by many, is approved by those whose judgment is most valuable. Certainly. Well, I would like to point out that we have many poets, both comic and tragic, whose works, as people say, young people should be familiar with. Some suggest that they should memorize entire poets, while others prefer selected excerpts. Now, I believe, and it is generally agreed upon, that some of the things they learn are good, and some are bad. So how do we reject some and choose others? I have a good idea. This long discussion of ours is an example of what we want, and it is also an inspired work and a kind of poem. I am pleased to reflect on our words, which I think are perfect for a young person to hear and learn. So, I would like to offer this treatise of laws to the director of education as a model for their guidance. And if they come across any similar compositions, written, or spoken, they should carefully preserve them and give them to teachers who are willing to learn them, they should dismiss any teacher who refuses. These teachers can then pass on the lessons to the young students. That is enough for the teacher of letters. Now, let us move on to the teacher of the liar. The teacher of the liar should be reminded of the advice we gave to the 60-year-old minstrels. Like them, they should be able to recognize rhythms that express virtue and reject the opposite. To achieve this, the student and their instructor should use the lyre because its notes are pure. The voice and the string should match note for note, without complex harmonies, intervals, or variations in time or rhythm. Three years of study is not enough to fully understand these complexities, and our students will have more important things to learn. The tunes and hymns for each festival have already been determined by us. After giving these instructions to the director of music, let us move on to dancing and gymnastics, which should also be taught to children by male and female teachers. Our minister of education will have a lot of work to do, and as an old man, how will he manage all of it? There is no problem, the law will provide him with assistance, both male and female. He should understand the importance of his role and the responsibility of choosing his assistants. Because if education thrives, the state will prosper, but if education fails, the consequences are too dire to mention. We have already discussed dancing and gymnastics to some extent. Under gymnastics, we include military exercises, the use of weapons, horsemanship, military formations, and tactics. There should be public teachers for both arts, paid by the state and both men and women should be trained in them. Girls should learn the arm dance, and adult women should be trained in drill and the use of weapons, even if it's only in case of emergency when the men are away at war, and they are left to protect their families. Birds and animals defend their young, but women, instead of fighting, run to the altars, which degrades men below the level of animals. Such a lack of education, stranger, is both unseemly and dangerous. Wrestling should be practiced as a military exercise, but its meaning in nature can only be explained through action and words combined. Next is dancing, which can be divided into two types, imitative, serious, and beautiful, and ludicrous and grotesque. The first type can be further divided into the dance of war and the dance of peace. 
The dance of war, called the Pyrrhic dance, imitates the movements of attack and defense in a direct and masculine style that demonstrates strength and competence of body and mind. The dance of peace, on the other hand, is suitable for orderly and law-abiding individuals. These dances should be distinguished from backsheek dances that imitate drunken revelry and dances performed for purification and celebration of mysteries. Such dances cannot be categorized as warlike or peaceful and are not suitable for a civilized society. Now, the dances of peace can be divided into two classes, the more vigorous one expresses joy and triumph after hard work and danger, while the other is more tranquil, symbolizing the continuation and preservation of goodness. In speaking or singing, we naturally move our bodies, and as we have courage or self-control, we become less or more violent and excited. Thus, the art of dancing arises from the imitation of words and gestures. Some people imitate in an orderly manner, while others imitate in a disorderly manner. The peaceful kinds of dance have been appropriately called dances of order, while the warlike ones have been called pyrrhic dances. In the latter, a person imitates various blows, the hurling of weapons, and the avoiding of them. In the former, one learns to carry oneself gracefully and like a gentleman. The legislator should determine the types of these dances, and once they have been assigned to specific festivals and consecrated in the proper order, no further changes should be allowed. This covers the dances that are suitable for fair forms and noble souls. Now let us consider comedy, which is the opposite of these dances. The serious implies the ludicrous, and opposites cannot be understood without opposites. However, a person of reputation will want to avoid doing anything ludicrous. Such performances should be left to slaves, as they are not suitable for freemen. Additionally, there should be an element of novelty in them. Moving on to tragedy, our law should be as follows, when an inspired poet comes to us and requests admission into our state, we will reply in courteous words. We, too, are tragedians and your rivals. The drama we enact is the best and noblest, as it imitates the truest and noblest life, which our state is ordered towards. We cannot allow you to set up your stage in the Agora and have your voices heard above ours. Nor can we permit you to address our women, children, and common people with principles opposite to our own. Therefore, you must first present yourselves to the magistrates, and if they decide that your hymns are as good or better than ours, you will have your chorus. Otherwise, you will not. There are three types of knowledge that should be learned by freemen, arithmetic, geometry of surfaces and solids, and astronomy. Only a few people need to study these sciences in depth and we will discuss special students at another time. However, most people should be content with the necessary study of these subjects, which is a necessity that even God cannot contend against. What are these divine necessities of knowledge? These are the knowledge without which neither gods nor demigods can govern mankind. It is far from divine to be unable to distinguish between one, two, odd, and even, to be ignorant of the numbering of day and night and to be unaware of the revolutions of the sun and stars. For every higher knowledge, a knowledge of numbers is necessary. Even a fool can see this, although the extent of its importance requires further consideration. That is very true. However, the legislator cannot go into such details, so we must postpone the more careful consideration of these matters for another occasion. You seem to be concerned about our lack of training in these subjects. I am even more concerned about the danger of bad training, which is often worse than no training at all. That is very true. I believe that a gentleman and a freeman should know as much as an Egyptian child. In Egypt, arithmetic is taught to children through games, such as distributing apples or garlands among a greater or lesser number of people. They also calculate the various combinations possible among a group of boxers or wrestlers, or distribute cups among children, sometimes made of gold, brass, and silver mixed, and sometimes made of only one metal. The knowledge of arithmetic acquired in this way is a great help, whether one is a general or a household manager. When measurement is involved, people are more attentive in their dealings and rid themselves of their ridiculous ignorance. What do you mean? I have observed this ignorance among my fellow countrymen. They are like pigs, and I am deeply ashamed, both for myself and for all Greeks. In what way? Let me ask you a question. 
you know that there are such things as length, breadth, and depth, right? Yes. And the Greeks believe that these dimensions are commensurable with themselves and with each other, while they are only commensurable with themselves. If this is true, then we are in an unfortunate situation, and we can rightly say to our fellow countrymen that not possessing necessary knowledge is a disgrace, although possessing such knowledge is not particularly grand. Certainly. Discussing arithmetic problems is a much better pastime for old men than their favorite game of drafts. True. Therefore, mathematics should be included as one of the subjects in which youth should be trained. They can be regarded as both an amusement and a useful and innocent branch of knowledge. I think we can include them provisionally. Yes, that seems reasonable. The next question is whether astronomy should be included in education. There is a strange notion prevalent about the stars. People often suppose that it is impious to inquire into the nature of God and the world, whereas the opposite is true. What do you mean? What I am about to say may seem absurd and contrary to the usual beliefs of older people. However, if it is true, beneficial to the state, and pleasing to God, it should not be withheld. Let us hear. My dear friend, how falsely do we and all Greeks speak about the sun and moon? In what way? We always say that they, along with certain other stars, do not follow the same path, and we call them planets. Yes, and I have seen the morning and evening stars move in various ways, and the sun and moon doing what we know they always do. But I wish you would explain your meaning further. You will easily understand what I have had no difficulty in understanding myself, though we are both past the age of learning. True, but what is this marvelous knowledge that youth are supposed to acquire? and of which we are ignorant. People say that the sun, moon, and stars are planets or wanderers, but this is the opposite of the truth. Each of them moves in only one circular orbit, not many, and the fastest of them is not the slowest, as it appears to human eyes. It would be an insult to Olympic runners if we were to put the first last and the last first. And if that is a ridiculous mistake when speaking of men, how much more so when speaking of the gods? They cannot be pleased when we tell lies about them. They cannot. Then people should at least learn enough about them to avoid impiety. Enough about education. Hunting and similar pursuits now require our attention. These activities need a mixture of laws and admonitions to regulate them, as we have discussed before, such as in our conversation about the upbringing of young children. Therefore, the duty of a citizen does not only consist of obeying the laws, they must also consider the legislator's teachings and instructions. Let me illustrate my point with an example. There are many types of hunting, hunting fish and birds, hunting humans and animals, enemies, and friends. The legislator cannot omit speaking about these things, nor can they make laws about all of them. What should they do then? They should praise and criticize hunting, with the aim of disciplining and exercising the youth. The young man should listen obediently and consider the praises and criticisms, neither pleasure nor pain should hinder him. The legislator should express themselves in the form of a pious wish for the well-being of the youth, Oh my friends, they will say, may you never be tempted to hunt for fish in the waters, whether by day or night, or for men, whether by sea or land. Never let the desire to steal enter your minds, and do not become fowlers, as that is not a noble occupation. As for land animals, the legislator will discourage hunting at night and the use of nets and snares during the day, as these methods are lazy and unmanly. The only type of hunting that they can praise is with horses and dogs, running, shooting, and engaging in close combat. Enough of the introduction. The law shall be as follows, let no one hinder the sacred order of huntsmen but let the nighttime hunters who set snares and nets be prohibited everywhere. Let the fowler confine themselves to desolate places and mountains. The fisherman is also allowed to pursue their trade, except in harbors and sacred streams, marshes, and lakes. They may fish in all other places, as long as they do not use poisonous mixtures. Book 8. Next, with the help of the Delphian Oracle, we will establish festivals and sacrifices. There shall be 365 of them, one for every day of the year, and at least one magistrate shall offer a sacrifice daily according to the rituals prescribed by a gathering of priests and interpreters, 
who will work together with the guardians of the law and provide what the legislator has omitted. Additionally, there shall be twelve festivals for the twelve gods after whom the twelve tribes are named. These festivals shall be celebrated every month with appropriate musical and athletic competitions. There shall also be festivals for women, separate from the men's festivals. The gods of the underworld shall not be forgotten, but they must be distinguished from the gods of the heavens. Pluto shall have his own festival in the twelfth month. He is not an enemy, but a friend of humanity, as he releases the soul from the body, which is just as good a deed as uniting them. Furthermore, those responsible for regulating these matters should consider that our state has leisure and abundance, and aspires to be happy, just like an individual. Therefore, they should lead a good life, for those who lead such a life neither do not suffer harm, the former being very easy and the latter being very difficult to achieve and can only be attained through perfect virtue. A good city is peace, while an evil city is full of internal and external wars. To guard against the danger of external enemies, the citizens should practice war at least one day every month. They should go out en masse, including their wives and children, or in divisions as determined by the magistrates, and engage in mock battles, imitating real battles in a lively manner. They should also have prizes and commendations for valor, both for the winners of these contests and for the winners in the battle of life. The poet who celebrates the victors should be at least fifty years old and a man who has accomplished great deeds. Even if he is not the best poet, his poems may be sung. The judgment of whether a song, no matter how sweet, has not been licensed by the director of education and the guardians of the law, it shall not be recited. These regulations regarding poetry and military expeditions apply equally to men and women. The legislator may address themselves as follows. For what purpose am I training my citizens? Are they not striving for mastery in the greatest of battles? Certainly, will be the reply. And if they were boxers or wrestlers, would they think of entering the arena without many days of practice? Would they not try to imitate all the circumstances of the contest as much as possible? And if they had no one to spar with, would they not practice on a lifeless dummy, regardless of the laughter of the spectators? And shall our soldiers go out to fight for life, family, and property unprepared, just because mock battles are thought to be ridiculous? Would not the legislator require that their citizens practice war daily, engaging in smaller exercises without weapons, while the combatants on a larger scale carry weapon, take up positions, and lie in ambush? And let their battles not be without danger, so that there may be opportunities for distinction, and the brave and the cowardly may receive their deserved honor or disgrace. If occasionally a man is killed, there is no great harm done there are others just as good as he is who will replace him, and the state can better afford to lose a few of her citizens than to lose the only means of testing them. We agree, stranger, that such warlike exercises are necessary. But why are they so rarely practiced? Or rather, do we not all know the reasons? One of them, one, is the excessive love of wealth. This consumes the soul of a man and leaves him no time for any other pursuit. Knowledge is valued by him only as it tends to the attainment of wealth. All is lost in the desire of accumulating gold and silver, anybody is ready to do anything, right or wrong, for the sake of eating and drinking, and the indulgence of his animal passions. Most true. This is one of the causes which prevents a man from being a good soldier, or anything else which is good, it turns the temperate and orderly into shopkeepers or servants, and the brave into burglars or pirates. Many of these latter are men of ability, and are greatly to be pitied, because their souls are hungering and thirsting all their lives long. The bad forms of government, too, are another reason democracy, oligarchy, tyranny, which, as I was saying, are not states but states of discord, in which the rulers are afraid of their subjects, and therefore do not like them to become rich, or noble, or valiant. Now our state will escape both these causes of evil, the society is perfectly free, and has plenty of leisure, and is not allowed by the laws to be absorbed in the pursuit of wealth, hence we have an excellent field for a perfect education, and for the introduction of martial pastimes. Let us proceed to describe the character of these pastimes. All physical exercises in our state must have a military character, no other will be allowed. 
Activity and quickness are most useful in war, and yet these qualities do not attain their greatest efficiency unless the competitors are armed. The runner should enter the lists in armor, and in the races which our announcers proclaim, no prize is to be given except to armed warriors. Let there be six courses first, the stadium, secondly, the diallos or double course, thirdly, the horse course, fourthly, the long course, fifthly, races, one, between heavily armed soldiers who shall pass over sixty stadia and finish at a temple of Ares, and, two, between even more heavily armed competitors who run over smoother ground, sixthly, a race for archers, who shall run over hill and dale a distance of a hundred stadia, and their goal shall be a temple of Apollo and Artemis. There shall be three contests of each kind one for boys, another for youths, a third for men, the course for the boys we will fix at half, and that for the youths at two-thirds of the entire length. Women shall join in the races, young girls who are not grown up shall run naked, but after thirteen they shall be suitably dressed, from thirteen to eighteen they shall be obliged to share in these contests, and from eighteen to twenty they may if they please and if they are unmarried. As to trials of strength, single combats in armor, or battles between two and two, or of any number up to ten, shall take the place of wrestling and the heavy exercises. And there must be umpires, as there are now in wrestling, to determine what is a fair hit and who is the victor. Instead of the pancratium, let there be contests in which the combatants carry bows, wear light shields, hurl javelins, and throw stones. The next provision of the law will relate to horses, which, as we are in Crete, need be rarely used by us, and chariots never, our horse racing prizes will only be given to single horses, whether colts, half grown, or full grown. Their riders are to wear armor, and there shall be a competition between mounted archers. Women, if they have a mind, may join in the exercises of men. But enough of physical exercises, and nearly enough of music. All musical contests will take place at festivals, whether every third or every fifth year, which are to be fixed by the guardians of the law, the judges of the games, and the director of education, who for this purpose shall become legislators and arrange times and conditions. The principles on which such contests are to be ordered have been often repeated by the first legislator, no more need be said of them, nor are the details of them important. But there is another subject of the highest importance, which, if possible, should be determined by the laws, not of man, but of God, or, if a direct revelation is impossible, there is need of some bold man who, alone against the world, will speak plainly of the corruption of human nature, and go to war with the passions of mankind. We do not understand you. I will try to make my meaning clearer. In speaking of education, I seem to see young men and women in friendly interaction with one another, and there arose in my mind a natural fear about a state, in which the young of either sex is well nurtured, and have little to do, and occupy themselves chiefly with festivals and dances. How can they be saved from those passions which reason forbids them to indulge, and which are the ruin of so many? The prohibition of wealth, and the influence of education, and the all-seeing eye of the ruler, will all help to promote self-control, but they will not completely eradicate the unnatural loves which have been the destruction of states, and against this evil what remedy can be devised? Lacedaemon and Crete offer no assistance here, about love, as I may whisper in your ear, they are against us. Suppose someone were to argue that you should restore the natural practices that existed before the time of Laius, they would be correct, but they would not have the support of public opinion in either of your states. Let us test this by considering whether allowing such things promotes virtue. Will the person who is seduced learn the habit of courage? Will the seducer acquire temperance? And would any legislator make such actions legal? To judge this matter accurately, we must understand the nature of love and friendship, which can take various forms. First, we speak of friendship when there is some similarity or equality of virtue. Second, we speak of friendship when there is some need. Either of these, when excessive, is called love. The first kind is gentle and sociable. The second kind is intense and uncontrollable. There is also a third kind, which is a combination of both and is influenced by opposing principles. One kind is purely physical and disregards the character of the beloved. The other kind disregards the physical and is more of a companion than a lover, desiring only to connect their soul with the soul of their friend. 
the intermediate kind involves both the physical and the soul. So, there are three kinds of love. Should the legislator prohibit all of them equally, or should they allow virtuous love to remain? Clearly, the latter. I expected you to agree, but I will save the task of convincing our friend Kleinias for another time. Very well. Creating just laws on this subject is both easy and difficult. We know that in some cases, most people willingly abstain from relations with attractive individuals. The unwritten law that prohibits members of the same family from such relations is strictly followed, and most people never even consider anything else. A simple statement extinguishes their desires. What is it? The declaration that such things are detestable to the gods, abominable, and unholy. The reason is that this doctrine is repeated to everyone from a young age, both in jest and in earnest. They see on stage that an Oedipus or a Thyestus or a Macarius, when they realize the truth, are ready to kill themselves. There is undoubtedly power in public opinion when no one speaks against the law. The legislator who wants to control these enslaving passions must establish such public opinion throughout the city. Good, but how can you create it? That is a valid objection, but I promise to try and find a way to restrain loves to their natural objects. A law that would eradicate unnatural love as effectively as incest is currently eradicated would bring countless blessings. It would be in accordance with nature and would eliminate excessive eating, drinking, adultery, and madness. It would make men love their wives and have other positive effects. I can imagine that some young person overhears our conversation and angrily claims that we are legislating for impossibilities. The same could have been said about the common meals but that has been proven wrong by facts, although even now they are not extended to women. True. My proposed law is not impossible or beyond human capability, as I will try to prove. Please do. Wouldn't a person find abstinence easier when their body is healthy compared to when they are in poor condition? Yes. Haven't we heard of Icus of Tarentum and other wrestlers who abstain completely for a time? yet they were far less educated than our citizens and much more physically robust. And if they could abstain for the sake of an athletic contest, shouldn't our citizens be capable of a similar endurance for the sake of a much nobler victory, the victory over pleasure, which is true happiness? Won't the fear of impiety enable them to conquer what many inferior individuals have conquered? I suppose so. Therefore, the law must clearly state that our citizens should not fall below other animals, who live together in flocks and remain pure and chaste until the time of procreation, when they pair and remain faithful to their mate. But if the corruption of public opinion is too great to allow our first law to be implemented, then our guardians of the law must become legislators and attempt a second law. They must minimize desires, redirecting the energy of youth into other pursuits. They can allow love to be practiced in secret but make detection shameful. Three higher principles can be applied to these corrupt natures, religion, honor, and love for the higher qualities of the soul. Perhaps this is only a dream, but it is the best of dreams. By the grace of God, at least a part of what we desire may be realized. Men may learn to abstain completely from any loves, natural or unnatural, except for their spouses. Or at the very least, they may give up unnatural loves. If detected, they should be punished by losing their citizenship, as they are morally alien to the state. I completely agree with you, said Megillus, but Clinias must speak for himself. I will give my opinion later. We were discussing the common meals, which will be a natural institution in a Cretan colony. Whether they should be established following the model of Crete or Lacedaemon, or if they should be different from both, is an unimportant question that can be easily determined. Therefore, we can now discuss the way of life among our citizens, which will be much simpler than in other cities. A landlocked state requires only half the number of laws compared to a maritime one. There is no need to worry about trade, commerce, and many other things. The legislator only needs to regulate the affairs of farmers and shepherds, which will be easily arranged now that the main questions of marriage, education, and government have been settled. Let us start with agriculture. First, there should be a law against removing a neighbor's boundary marker, whether they are a citizen or a stranger. This act is moving the unmovable. 
The god Zeus, who is the god of kinship, bears witness to the wrongs done to citizens, and the god Zeus, who is the god of strangers, bears witness to the wrongs done to strangers. The punishment for removing a boundary marker shall be twofold the first punishment will be inflicted by the god himself, and the second punishment will be decided by the judges. Next, we must prevent disputes between neighbors regarding encroachments. The person who encroaches shall pay double the amount of the damage caused. The wardens of the country shall be the judges in such cases, with the officers handling smaller cases and the entire group of officers from a particular division handling larger cases. Any harm caused by livestock, the stealing of bees, careless fires in woods, or planting too close to a neighbor's land shall be subject to appropriate compensation. These details have already been determined by previous legislators and do not need to be mixed with more important matters. Farmers have long had excellent rules regarding streams and water, and we do not need to change them. Anyone can take water from a common stream as long as they do not cut off a private spring. They can lead the water in any direction except through a house or temple, but they must not cause any harm beyond the designated channel. If a piece of land does not have water, the occupier can dig down to the clay. If they still do not find water at that depth, they have the right to get water from their neighbors for household use. If the neighbor's water supply is limited, the wardens of the country will determine the amount of water the occupier can receive. If there are heavy rains, the person living on higher ground must not allow the water to flow recklessly onto a neighbor below them. Similarly, the person living on lower ground or in an adjoining house must not refuse an outlet for the water. If the two parties cannot agree, they shall bring the matter before the wardens of the city or country. If a person refuses to abide by their decision, they shall pay double the amount of damage they have caused. In autumn, we receive two blessings from God one is the joy of Dionysus that cannot be stored, and the other is the harvest that can be stored. Regarding the fruits of autumn, the law shall be as follows, if someone gathers the fruits of autumn for storing, such as grapes or figs, before the time of the vintage, which is the rising of Arcturus, they shall pay a fine of fifty drachmas to Dionysus if they gather from their own land. If they gather from their neighbor's land, the fine shall be one mina, and if they gather from anyone else's land, the fine shall be two-thirds of a mina. They can gather grapes or figs that are not intended for storing whenever they please on their own land, but if they do so on someone else's land, they must pay a penalty for removing what they have not laid down. If a slave is caught gathering, they shall receive a stroke for every grape or figure a medic must purchase the choice fruit, but a stranger may pick for themselves and their attendant. However, this right of hospitality does not extend to storing grapes. A slave who eats the storing grapes or figs shall be beaten and a freeman shall be dismissed with a warning. Pears, apples, and pomegranates may be taken secretly, but if someone is caught in the act, they shall be lightly beaten off if they are under thirty years of age. A stranger or an elder may partake of these fruits but not take any away. If the elder disobeys the law, it shall be considered a failure in virtue if someone brings up their offense against them. Water also needs protection as it is the most important element for nourishment. Unlike soil, air, and sun, which all contribute to the growth of plants, water is easily polluted. Therefore, anyone who spoils another person's water, whether it be in springs or reservoirs, through trenching, theft, or the use of poisonous substances, shall pay for the damage caused and purify the stream. During the harvest, everyone shall have the right of way over their neighbor's land, if they are careful not to cause any damage beyond the trespass. If they themselves will gain three times as much as their neighbor loses, they are allowed to pass through. The magistrates shall oversee all of this, and they shall assess the damage in cases where it does not exceed three minae. Cases involving greater damage can only be tried in the public courts. If there is a complaint against a magistrate, it shall be referred to the public courts, and anyone found guilty of making corrupt decisions shall pay double the amount to the aggrieved person. Matters relating to punishments, procedures, summonses, and witnesses to summonses do not require the wisdom of an aged legislator. The younger generation can determine these matters based on their experience. Once determined, they shall remain unchanged. The following are the regulations regarding handicrafts, no citizen or servant of a citizen is allowed to practice them. 
the citizen already has a craft and skill that is the responsibility of the state. No one can practice two crafts or practice one and oversee another. A blacksmith should not be a carpenter, and a carpenter who has many slaves who are blacksmiths should not personally oversee them. Each person should practice one craft that will be their means of livelihood. The city's authorities should address this issue by punishing citizens who offend with temporary deprivation of their rights. Foreigners should be imprisoned, fined, or exiled. Disputes regarding contracts should be resolved by the city's authorities for amounts up to 50 drachmi, and by the public courts for amounts exceeding that. No customs duties should be imposed on imports or exports. Unnecessary items should not be imported from abroad, whether for religious purposes or for human use, such as purple dye or frankincense. Likewise, nothing essential to the country should be exported. These matters should be decided by the twelve guardians of the law, who are next in seniority to the five elders. The import and export of weapons and war materials should only be allowed with the consent of the generals, and only by the state. There should be no retail trade in these or any other goods. As for the distribution of the country's produce, the Cretan laws provide a useful guideline. All individuals should be required to divide corn, grain, animals, and other valuable goods into twelve portions. Each portion should then be subdivided into three parts, one for freemen, one for servants, and one to be sold for the needs of artisans, strangers, and non-citizens. These portions should be equal, regardless of the quantity of produce. The head of a household may distribute the two portions among their family and slaves as they see fit, while the remaining portion should be allocated to the animals. Moving on to the houses in the countryside, there should be twelve villages, one in the center of each of the twelve portions. Each village should have temples and a marketplace, as well as shrines for heroes or any old Magnesian deities associated with the area. In each division, there should be temples dedicated to Hestia, Zeus, and Athena, along with the local deity. These temples should be surrounded by buildings on elevated ground, which will serve as guardhouses for the rural police. The dwellings of the artisans should be organized as follows, the artisans should be divided into thirteen guilds, with one guild divided into twelve parts and settled in the city. The remaining guilds should be in each division of the country. The magistrates will determine the most convenient and beneficial locations for these guilds, considering the needs of the farmers. The wardens of the marketplace will be responsible for the care of the agora. Their first duty will be to regulate the temples surrounding the marketplace, and their second duty will be to ensure orderly markets and fair trade. They will also oversee the proper execution of sales between citizens and foreigners. According to the law, on the first day of each month, the auctioneers entrusted with the sale should offer grain. During this sale, one-twelfth of the total amount should be available, allowing foreigners to purchase enough grain for a month. On the tenth day, there should be a sale of liquids, and on the twenty-third day, there should be a sale of animals, skins, woven or woolen fabrics, and other items that farmers have to sell, and foreigners want to buy. None of these goods, including barley, flour, or any other food, may be sold by a citizen to another citizen. However, foreigners may sell these goods to each other in the foreigner's market. There should also be butchers who sell portions of animals to foreigners, craftsmen, and their servants. Foreigners may buy firewood in bulk from the wood commissioners and sell it retail to other foreigners. All other goods must be sold in the market at a location designated by the magistrates, and payment should be made on the spot. If someone extends credit and is cheated, they will have no recourse. Any excess or shortfall in the quantity of goods sold or bought, as allowed by the law, should be recorded. The same rule applies to the property of non-citizens. Anyone who practices a trade may come and stay for 20 years from the day they are registered. At the end of this period, they should take their belongings and leave. The only condition for their stay is good conduct, and they should not have to pay any tax for the right to buy or sell. However, if they wish to extend their stay and have rendered service to the state, they may request an extension from the council and assembly. The children of non-citizens may also be considered non-citizens, and their 20-year period of stay will begin from their 15th year. The laws do not mention the doctrine of ideas. Instead, 
Plato emphasizes the will of God, the authority of the legislator, and the dignity of the soul. If we were to identify the truth or principle that seems to have occupied Plato's mind towards the end of his life, like the idea of the good in the Republic or the idea of beauty in the Symposium, it would be the priority of the soul over the body. His later system is largely based on this concept. In the Laws, as well as in the Sophist and Statesman, Plato moves away from metaphysical or transcendental ideas and focuses on psychology. Although the opening of the fifth book may seem abrupt and disconnected in style, it contains some of the most elevated passages in Plato's works. The religious sentiment he seeks to instill in everyday actions, the happiness derived from living in truth, the mistake of living solely for oneself, and the compassion and anger that should be felt towards evil all reflect the spirit of Christian philosophy. The statement that older men, if they wish to educate others, should start by educating themselves, the importance of instilling a spirit of obedience in citizens, the desirability of limiting property, and the significance of dividing the city into parochial districts, each under the protection of a deity or demigod, have a similar tone to that of a modern writer. In many of his political views, Plato appears to be a mix of socialist and conservative, much like some politicians today. In his work laws, we can observe a change in his perspective on pleasure and pain. There are two ways in which even ideal moral systems can view them, either like the Stoics and other ascetics, we may argue that pleasure must be eradicated, or if this seems unrealistic to us, we may affirm that virtue is the true pleasure. As Aristotle says, being brought up to take pleasure in what we ought, exercises a great and paramount influence on human life. Similarly, Plato states in laws that a person will recognize the noblest life as having the greatest pleasure and the least pain if they have a true taste. If we acknowledge that pleasures differ in kind, the opposition between these two perspectives is more a matter of words than reality, and in most of Plato's writings, they alternate with each other. In Republic, Socrates reacts with abhorrence to the mere suggestion that pleasure may be the chief good. However, in Philebus, innocent pleasures assert their right to be included in the hierarchy of goods. In Protagoras, speaking through the character of Socrates rather than in his own voice, Plato acknowledges that the calculation of pleasure is the true foundation of ethics. Yet, in Phaedo, he vehemently denies that exchanging one pleasure for another is the same as exchanging virtue. Those who attribute complete consistency in thoughts or words to Plato are mistaken. He acknowledges that the second state is inferior to the first, and in this, at least, he is consistent. He still yearns for the ideal. Several features of the first state are retained in the second. The education of people is to be as similar as possible. They are to have communal meals, though separate, with men dining alone and women with their children, and both genders are to serve in the army. The citizens, while not explicitly communist, possess a communistic spirit. They are to be advocates of equality, with only a certain amount of wealth permitted, and their responsibilities and privileges are to be proportionate to their wealth. The constitution and laws is a timocracy of wealth, tempered by an aristocracy of merit. However, the political philosopher will note that the first principle is fixed and permanent, while the latter is uncertain and subject to the opinion of the majority. Wealth plays a significant role in Plato's Second Republic. Like other politicians, he believes that a property qualification will contribute to the stability of the state. The four classes are derived from the Athenian constitution, just as the city's form, clustered around a citadel on a hill, is inspired by the Acropolis in Athens. Under the influence of Pythagoreanism, Plato seems to believe that the well-being of the city depends almost as much on the number 5040 as it does on justice and moderation. However, this does not prevent him from recognizing the effects of climate and soil on the character of nations. In Republic, Plato was uncertain whether the ideal or communistic state could be realized, but he was prepared to argue that its existence or non-existence made no difference to the philosopher, who would live according to its principles regardless. In Laws, he has lost faith in the practicality of his scheme, acknowledging that he is speaking to men, and not to gods or sons of gods. Nevertheless, he still maintains that it is the true model of the state, which we should strive to approach as closely as possible. As Aristotle says, after having created a more general form of state, he gradually brings it round to the other. 
However, Plato fails to observe, both here and in Republic, that such a commonwealth would leave little room for the development of individual character. In several respects, the second state is an improvement on the first, particularly in its stronger emphasis on the dignity of the soul. The standards of truth, justice, and temperance are just as high, if not higher, than in Republic. Temperance is now seen not merely as a virtue but as the condition for all virtue. It is finally recognized that the virtues are interconnected, and if they are separated, courage is the lowest among them. The treatment of moral questions is less speculative but more human. The concept of the good has disappeared, and the excellences of individuals, such as faithfulness in times of civil unrest and uncorruptibility in examining matters, serve as the models for the lives of citizens. Plato frequently emphasizes the honor of the soul, which can only be truly honored by improvement. The purpose of life is to make the soul as good as possible and to prepare it for communion with the gods in the afterlife through communion with divine virtue in this life. While Republic may surpass laws in terms of form, style, and perhaps depth of thought, laws leaves a stronger impression of a struggle against evil and an enthusiasm for human improvement. When Plato states that he must carry out the practical part of his ideal, he does not seem to have considered that a part of an ideal cannot be separated from the whole. The main flaw in both of his systems is the rigidity that he tries to impose on them. He witnessed the rise and fall of the Athenian Empire during his lifetime, but he never considered what would happen if, a century after his time, the Greek character had changed as much as it had in the previous century. He fails to recognize that most of a nation's political life is not determined by its legislators, but by the people themselves. He never reflected on the fact that without progress, there can be no order, and that mere order can only be maintained through unnatural and despotic repression. He never considered the possibility of a great nation or a universal empire emerging. Instead, he sees the weakened and divided state of the Hellenic world in his later years and believes that the solution is to make the laws unchangeable. This lack of insight is also evident in his views on art. He would prefer for the forms of sculpture and music to be fixed, like in Egypt. He fails to consider that this would be detrimental to the true principles of art, which, as Socrates himself taught, is meant to give life. It is puzzling how he could tolerate the lifeless and grotesque works of Egyptian sculpture, despite being familiar with the statues of Phidias. The chants of Isis would likely have been considered barbaric to an Athenian ear. Although he acknowledges that there are some things that are not as good among the children of the Nile, he is greatly impressed by the stability of Egyptian institutions. In both politics and art, Plato seems to believe that the only way to bring order out of disorder is to take a step backwards. He holds a reverence for antiquity and believes that the men of the past possessed a sense of reverence that was lacking in his own time. He can imagine the early stages of civilization, but he never considers what the future might hold. His experience is limited to a few centuries, a few Greek states, and uncertain reports of Egypt and the East. The Greeks' limited knowledge had various effects on their intellectual pursuits. In terms of criticism, they were like children, able to see things that were close to them but blind to possibilities that were further away. In Plato's ideal state, the colony would adopt the original constitution of the mother country and receive some of its initial lawmakers. The lawmakers would also serve as ministers of justice, and the head of education would hold the highest position. They would be responsible for maintaining property records, establishing trade regulations, and would retire at the age of 70. Plato anticipates several questions that are relevant to modern politics, such as property limitations, the enforcement of education, and the relationships between social classes. He hopes that his state will have neither poverty nor wealth, with every person having their basic needs met so that they do not have to seek fortune through marriage. In a manner like the Gospel, he would say that it is difficult for a rich person to live in a perfect state, as someone who is constantly accumulating wealth and spending little cannot be considered a good person. Although Plato acknowledges wealth as a political factor, he denies that material prosperity can be the foundation of a genuinely great community. He often emphasizes that a person's soul is more valuable than their body, and their body is more valuable than external possessions. He echoes the complaint that has been made throughout history, that the love of money corrupts states. 
he sympathizes with thieves and burglars, recognizing that many of them are intelligent individuals who are to be pitted because they spend their lives in constant hunger and thirst. However, he has little sympathy for shopkeepers or retailers, even though he acknowledges that if these occupations were carried out honestly by the best men and women, they would be honorable and enjoyable. Plato believes that a moderate gain is best for traders and artisans. Unlike modern writers, he does not idealize the wealth of nations, nor does he delve into the study of political economy, which was not yet a developed science in ancient times. The isolation of Greek city-states, their frequent wars, the lack of a free industrial population, and the absence of modern methods and instruments of credit prevented extensive commerce and hindered the formation of a theory on the accumulation and distribution of wealth. The military structure of Plato's state combines aristocratic and democratic elements. The guardians of the law nominate generals, from whom three are chosen by those who are or have been of military age. The elected generals have the authority to nominate certain lower-ranking officers. However, if anyone believes that there is a better candidate than those nominated for either the position of general or lower-ranking officer, they can put forward their candidate for a vote by the entire army or the division of the service that they would command if elected. There is a general assembly, but its functions are barely mentioned, except during elections. In the election of the bull, Plato once again attempts to blend aristocracy and democracy. This is achieved by balancing wealth and numbers, like the Servian constitution. It is unlikely that those with higher qualifications were equal in number to those with lower qualifications, yet they have an equal number of representatives. In addition, all social classes are required to vote in the election of senators from the first and second class. However, the fourth class is not required to elect from the third class, nor are the third and fourth classes required to elect from the fourth class. Furthermore, out of the 180 individuals chosen from each of the four classes, totaling 720, 360 are to be selected by lot to form the council for the year. These political arrangements proposed by Plato will be criticized by practical statesmen as mostly fanciful and ineffective. They will observe that the only real check on democracy is the division into classes. The second proposal, though clever, and considering the apathy towards politics often displayed by the higher classes in a democracy, would have little power during times of excitement and danger when caution is most necessary. During such political crises, all lower classes would have equal voting power as the higher classes. Reducing the number of individuals chosen in the first election by half using lot would not improve the quality of the senators, and it is also subject to the objection of uncertainty, which is inherent in this and similar schemes of double representative government. Additionally, it cannot be expected that voters would maintain the continuous political interest required to implement Plato's proposal. Who could select 180 individuals from each class who were qualified to be senators? and whoever was chosen by the voter initially, their wishes could be nullified by the action of the lot. Yet Plato's scheme is not as extravagant as the actual constitution of Athens, in which all senators appear to have been elected by lot, apoquamu balutai, at least after the revolution led by Cleisthenes. The constitution of the Senate established by Solon probably had some aristocratic features, although the exact nature of these features is unknown to us. The ancients understood that election by lot was the most democratic method of appointment, seemingly suggesting, in a negative sense, that one man is as good as another. Plato, who desires to blend different elements, partially employs the use of lot, which he applies to candidates already elected by vote. He also attempts to devise a system of checks and balances that he supposes were intended by the ancient lawmakers. We are inclined to say to him, as he himself says in a remarkable passage, that no man ever legislates, but accidents of all sorts, which legislate for us in all sorts of ways. The violence of war and the harsh necessity of poverty are constantly overturning governments and changing laws. And yet, as he adds, a true legislator is still necessary, they must cooperate with circumstances. Many things that are attributed to human foresight are the result of chance. Ancient political constitutions, and to a lesser extent modern ones, are never internally consistent because they are never based on a single design but are continually added to as new elements arise and gain dominance in the state. 
we often attribute great political effects to the wisdom of our ancestors when they have arisen unexpectedly from the circumstances of the situation. Power, not wisdom, is most often the cause of political revolutions. And the result, as in the Roman Republic, of the coexistence of opposing elements in the same state is not a balance of power or a steady progression of liberal principles, but a conflict of forces, in which one or the other may happen to be dominant. In Greek history, as well as in Plato's conception of it, this progression by antagonism involves a cycle, the aristocracy expands into democracy and then returns to tyranny. The constitution of the laws primarily consists of three elements, in addition to the magistrates, an administrative council, the judiciary, and the nocturnal council, which is an intellectual aristocracy composed of priests and the ten oldest guardians of the law, along with some younger co-opted members. The nocturnal council is primarily responsible for legislation, but this power is to be exercised sparingly. The ordinary council's powers are mainly administrative rather than legislative. The total number of 360, as in the Athenian constitution, is distributed among the months of the year according to the number of tribes. At any given time, no more than one twelfth of the council is to be in office, so the government would consist of twelve administrations that succeed each other throughout the year. They are to exercise general supervision and, like the Athenian councillors, preside over all assemblies monthly. Little is said about the ecclesia over which they preside and what is mentioned relates to relatively minor duties. Plato's mind is far from the idea of a house of commons, engaged year after year in the work of legislation. He assumes that the laws have already been provided. Nor would he approve of a body like the Roman Senate. Both the people and the aristocracy are to be represented, not by assemblies, but by officers elected for one or two years, except for the guardians of the law, who are elected for twenty years. The flaws of this system are evident. If, as Plato states in The Statesman, it is easier to find fifty skilled draft players than fifty skilled rulers in any state, then the majority of the 360 individuals who make up the council would be unfit to govern. Their unfitness would be exacerbated by the short duration of their terms in office. They would lack any traditions of government, as seen in Greek or Italian oligarchies, and no individual would be held accountable for their actions. Everything seems to have been sacrificed for a false notion of equality, in which everyone has a turn at ruling and being ruled. In the constitution of the Magnesian state, Plato has not freed himself from the limitations of ancient politics. His government can be described as a democracy where magistrates are elected by the people. He does not concern himself with the political consistency of his system. He does mention that the majority of the good in this world comes from proportion rather than equality, which he refers to as the judgment of Zeus, like Aristotle's distributive justice. However, he does not make much effort to implement this principle in practice. There is no attempt to proportionally represent merit, and there is no body in his society that represents the life of a specific class or the entire state. The method of appointing magistrates is mostly taken from the old democratic constitution of Athens, which retains some of its worst aspects, such as the use of the lottery. However, by removing the political nature of the popular assembly, the main driving force of the system is removed. The guardians of the law, 37 in number, with the ten eldest reappearing as part of the nocturnal council, are to be elected by the entire military class. However, they hold office for twenty years which gives them more of an oligarchical rather than a democratic character. There is no mention of how the nocturnal council's functions are to be harmonized with those of the guardians of the law, or how the ordinary council is related to it. Similar principles are applied to lower offices, with some being appointed by vote and others by lottery. In the elections for the priesthood, Plato attempts to balance the interests of the people and the state. The commonwealth of the laws, like the Republic, requires a spiritual leader, which is the oracle of Delphi in both cases. All laws regarding divine matters are derived from the oracle. The selection of interpreters, the choice of an heir for an empty lot, and the punishment for removing a deposit are also determined by the oracle. Plato does not encourage amateur attempts to revive religion in states, as he believes that to institute religious rites is the work of a great intelligence. 
Although the council is modeled after the Athenian bull, Plato's law courts do not follow the pattern of the Athenian dicasteries. Plato believes that judges should be able to speak and ask questions, which is not possible if they are numerous. Therefore, he suggests having only a few judges, but ensuring that they are good ones. However, he recognizes that there must be a popular element in both public and private cases. He insists that the entire population must participate in the administration of justice. In public cases, they take the first step, and the final decision remains with them. In private cases, they also retain a share, as the citizen who has no part in the administration of justice is apt to think that he has no share in the state. For this reason, there is a court of law in every tribe, with judges chosen by lottery. Plato provides a brief overview of the courts of law, although his various accounts of them are not easily reconciled. It is clear, however, that while some officials have the power to impose minor penalties, the administration of justice is primarily in the hands of the people. Plato does not consider the ingenious solution of dividing questions of law and fact between a judge and a jury, which would have allowed for a combination of the popular element with the judicial. He desires to limit the number of judges and restrict the office to those who are specially qualified for it. However, he does not seem to understand that a body of law must be formed through both decisions and legal enactments. He suggests that individuals first seek justice from their friends and neighbors, as they are most familiar with the issues at hand. These individuals are referred to as arbiters rather than judges. If they are unable to resolve the matter, it is then brought to the courts of the tribes, with the unsuccessful party paying a higher penalty. There is also the option of further appeal to the select judges, with an additional increase in penalty. The select judges are appointed by the magistrates, with one chosen from each magistracy. They are elected annually, likely for a one-year term, and are accountable to the guardians of the law. In cases where death is the penalty, a special court composed of the guardians of the law and the judge of appeal presides over the trial. In Book 9, Plato suggests leaving the methods of procedure mostly to a younger generation of legislators, although he determines the procedure in capital cases himself. He insists that judges vote openly and hear speeches from both the plaintiff and defendant before voting. They are then to consider the evidence presented and examine witnesses. The eldest judge asks questions first, followed by the second and third. The questioning continues for three days, and the evidence is recorded. It appears that Plato does not expect the judges to be professional lawyers, just as he does not expect the council members to be trained statesmen. When it comes to forming marriage connections, Plato assumes that the public interest will outweigh personal inclination. There was nothing in this that would shock the Greeks, among whom the feeling of love towards a different sex was almost devoid of sentiment or romance. Marriage was to be regulated solely for the benefit of the state. The newly married couple were not allowed to be absent from their respective gatherings, even during their honeymoon, they were expected to focus entirely on procreating children. The state was not equally concerned about their duties to each other later in life. Divorce was readily allowed for incompatibility of temperament. Physical considerations seemed to outweigh moral and social ones, like the Republic. Plato's treatment of the subject may seem coarse to modern sensibilities. However, he also makes some astute remarks about marriage, such as the idea that a man who does not marry for money will not be subservient to his wife. He also demonstrates a true understanding of the nature of the family when he requires that the newly married couple should leave their father and mother and establish their own separate home. He also addresses the issue of excessive spending on marriage celebrations, which has been a significant social problem in some societies, such as the Hindus. When discussing property, Plato takes the opportunity to mention property in slaves. He argues that they should be treated with fairness but kept at a distance for their own sake. The motive is not so much compassion for the slaves, although Plato acknowledges that some have found slaves to be more loyal than their own family members in times of danger. Rather, it is about the self-respect that freemen and citizens owe to themselves, like the Republic. If slaves commit crimes, they are punished doubly, if they report illegal practices by their masters, they are promised protection, although it would likely be ineffective, from the guardians of the law. In rare cases, they are to be set free. 
Plato still adheres to the spirit of the ancient Hellenic world, where slavery was seen as a necessity to provide leisure for citizens. The education proposed in the laws differs in several aspects from that of the Republic. Plato seems to have contemplated the importance of infancy as deeply and seriously as Rousseau or Jean Paul, comparing the saying of the latter not the moment of death, but the moment of birth, is probably the more important. He suggests that children's amusements should be regulated in the hope of shaping their characters in later life. In the spirit of the statesman who said, let me make the ballads of a country, and I care not who make their laws, Plato believes that if the amusements of children remain unchanged, they will not desire to change the laws. The goddess Harmonia plays a significant role in Plato's ideas of education. The natural restless energy of children, who do nothing but roar until they are three years old, is to be gradually channeled into law and order. As in the Republic, Plato establishes certain forms in which songs should be composed, 1. They should be cheerful and auspicious, 2. They should be hymns or prayers addressed to the gods, 3. They should only sing about what is lawful and good. Poets are once again expelled, or rather ironically invited to leave and those who remain are required to submit their poems to the scrutiny of the magistrates. Youth are no longer compelled to memorize thousands of lyric and tragic Greek verses, but perhaps a worse fate awaits them. Plato does not believe in the freedom to prophesy, and after guarding against the dangers of lyric poetry, he recognizes that there is an equal danger in other writings. He cannot leave his old adversaries, the sophists, unchallenged, so he proposes that youth should memorize his own inspired work on laws instead of the compositions of poets or prose writers. This, along with music and mathematics, forms the core of his education. Mathematics are to be studied not for the sake of the science of the idea of good, although the higher purpose is not entirely excluded, but rather with a religious and political aim. They are a sacred study that teaches people how to distribute the resources of a state and prevents them from blaspheming about astronomy. Plato is deeply concerned about three mathematical errors. First, the error of assuming that the three dimensions of length, breadth, and height are truly commensurable with each other. He struggles with this difficulty, which is similar to his previous struggle with the connection of ideas and is characteristic of ancient philosophy. He focuses on the point of difference and cannot simultaneously grasp the similarity. Second, he is puzzled by the nature of fractions and in the Republic, he is inclined to deny their existence. Third, his optimism leads him to insist on the perfect or circular movement of the heavenly bodies, unlike the Spanish king who believed he could improve the mechanics of the heavens. Plato likely means that instead of viewing the stars as overtaking or being overtaken by each other, or as planets wandering in various paths, a comprehensive understanding of the heavens would reveal that they all move in a circle around the center, like Timaeus in the Republic. He probably suspected, although he was unfamiliar with the true cause, that the appearance of the heavens did not align with reality. In any case, his notions of what was right or appropriate easily overshadowed the results of actual observation. To the early astronomers, who lived during the revival of science, as well as to Plato, there was nothing absurd about a priori astronomy, and they would likely have made fewer real discoveries if they had pursued a different path. Compare Introduction to the Republic The study of dialectic is not explicitly mentioned in the laws, nor is there any discussion of education in the afterlife. According to the laws, children are to begin their education at the age of 10. They will be taught reading and writing for three years, from 10 to 13, and for the next three years, from 13 to 16, they will receive instruction in music. Plato criticizes the contemporary education system for its lack of emphasis on arithmetic and astronomy, areas in which he believes the Greeks could learn from the Egyptians. Dancing and wrestling are to have a military focus, and both men and women are to be taught how to use weapons. Plato's military spirit which he tried to eliminate in the first two books, reappears in the seventh and eighth books. He clearly sympathizes with soldiers and poets, and he demonstrates a considerable understanding of the theory, if not the practice, of war. However, he leans more towards the Spartan approach to warfare rather than the Athenian one. The laws do not mention a supreme or master science that would serve as the pinnacle of all other sciences. It seems that Plato may have lost faith in such a science or realized that the time for it had not yet come, 
and he was unable to fully develop the outline he had sketched. The laws do not require the guardians of the law to be philosophers, although they are expected to understand the unity of virtue and the interconnection of the sciences. There is also no mention of how the citizens' leisure time, once they have grown up, should be devoted to intellectual pursuits. This represents a departure from the Republic, but it aligns with what Aristotle refers to as a return to the Republic in his politics. The citizens' focus in the laws is on their public and family duties, which would likely consume much more time than we would typically allocate to them in the modern world. Plato no longer entertains the idea of a formal training program supervised by the state for individuals between the ages of 18 and 30, or between 30 and 35. He has taken the first step down Constitution Hill from the Republic. However, he still maintains that the education of the soul is the greatest task for those living under this second form of government, and no other pursuits should interfere with it. Plato believes that night and day are not sufficient for the completion of this task. Very few of us are capable or willing to pursue education later in life. Our education, even for those who are considered educated, typically consists of five or six years in school, three or four years in university or professional training, and occasional attendance at lectures when we have spare time. After that, the flame of learning is extinguished more truly than Heraclitus' son, never to be lighted again, Republic. Plato's description in the Republic of the State of Adult Education among his contemporaries can be applied almost word for word to our own age. However, Plato does not accept this widespread lack of higher education. He would prefer to make every person somewhat of a philosopher before they embark on their active lives. In the laws, however, he no longer prescribes a specific course of study for mature individuals. He does not acknowledge that education in later life is of a different nature and should focus more on character development rather than the acquisition of knowledge. This type of education comes from self-reflection, moderation, experience, reflection on circumstances, the pursuit of lofty goals, and the proper use of life's opportunities. It involves preserving what we have already learned and adding to it. The ability to engage in abstract study or sustain thought is quite rare but everyone can engage in this type of self-training. The passage in Book 7 of the Laws, in which Plato describes life as a pastime, is poorly expressed, much like many other passages in the Laws. Two thoughts seem to be struggling in his mind, first, the realization that humans are mere playthings or puppets, and that only God is the true purpose of human endeavors. This leads him to the subsequent thought that, although humans are playthings, they are the playthings of the gods, and this is the best fate for them. The cynical and ironic fancy of the moment gradually transforms into a religious sentiment. In another passage, Plato states that life is a game in which God, the player, moves the pieces to ensure the victory of good overall. He also compares life to a tragedy performed on stage, with the noblest life being the best and noblest imitation. Furthermore, life is likened to a chorus and a kind of mystery in which the gods are our playmates. People may believe that war is their main pursuit, and they engage in war to return to their amusements. However, neither war nor amusements provide true satisfaction to humans, which can only be found in the company of the gods through sacrifice and propitiation. Like a Christian ascetic, Plato seems to suggest that life should be entirely devoted to the enjoyment of divine things. After contemplating the sadness and unreality of the world, he adds, almost as an aside, be cheerful, sirs, Shakespeare, Tempest. In one of Plato's most profound passages, he discusses the relationship between the sexes. In the past, natural relationships within families were established, and incestuous connections were put to an end by a little word. However, unnatural unions of a different kind continued to exist in Crete and Lacedaemon and were even justified by the example of the gods. These unions could be banished if people recognized that they were unholy and abominable. The legislator must proclaim loudly, let not men fall below the level of the beasts. Plato, unlike some modern philosophers, does not shy away from waging war against the strongest desires of mankind. He does not expect to eradicate these desires completely, but rather aims to confine them to their natural use and purpose through laws and public opinion. He does not want to indulge these desires with excessive indulgence or allow them to corrupt the healthier instincts of the soul through music and poetry. 
the prohibition of excessive wealth is seen as a significant gain in promoting temperance. Plato also does not approve of enthusiastic friendships between older and younger individuals, which he previously mentioned in his earlier writings without reproach. Sappho and Anacreon are celebrated by him in the Charmides and the Phaedrus, but they would have been expelled from the Magnesian state. However, Plato understands that absolute purity cannot be enforced on all people. He therefore adopts a second standard of honorable and dishonorable behavior, acknowledging that compromises must be made due to the weakness of human nature. He would completely abolish relationships between men. Regarding women, any man who engages with a woman who is not duly married by sacred rights and publicly offends will be deprived of civic honors and privileges. However, Plato also recognizes that it is impossible to fully control the strongest passions of mankind. Like other legislators, he makes a compromise. The offender must not be discovered, and decency, if not morality, must be respected. This aligns with the practice of civilized societies throughout history. The moralist can argue about the comparative harm of open and concealed vice. It is acknowledged that some moral evils are better exposed to the light because they are more easily cured, like diseases. Secrecy creates mystery, which greatly amplifies their power, turning a mere animal desire into a sentimental ideal. Speaking openly about things that are commonly concealed may have an excellent effect. However, considering the education of youth, the innocence of children, the sensitivities of women, and the standards of society, Plato and the world in general are not wrong in insisting that some of the worst vices, if they must exist, should be kept out of sight. This is a second best rule that supports the weakness of human nature. Some things may be whispered in private but should not be shouted from the rooftops. It can be said that it is a significant part of education to know to whom, when, and where certain things should be spoken about. Book 9, Punishments for Offenses and Modes of Procedure are the next topics to be discussed. It is disgraceful to make regulations for all the details of crime in a virtuous and well-ordered state. However, since we are legislating for humans and not gods, it is not uncharitable to consider that one of our citizens may have a heart as hard as the seed that has touched an ox's horn, impenetrable to the law. Our first law should be directed against the robbing of temples. No well-educated citizen would commit such a crime, but one of their servants or a stranger might. With them in mind, and considering the general weakness of human nature, I will lay down the law, starting with a prelude. To the intending robber, we will say, Sir, the complaint that troubles you is not human, it is a curse inherited from the crimes of your ancestors, from which you must cleanse yourself. Go and sacrifice to the gods, associate with the good, avoid the wicked. If you are cured of this fatal impulse, well and good. But if not, acknowledge that death is better than life and depart. These are the gentle words we use to address potential criminals. If they do not listen, then we must cry out loudly, like the sound of a trumpet, whoever robs a temple, whether they are a slave or a foreigner, shall be branded on the face and hands, scourged, and cast naked beyond the border. Perhaps this punishment may improve them, as the law aims to either reform the criminal or repress the crime. No punishment is intended to cause useless harm. However, if the offender is a citizen, they must be considered incurable, and death is the only fitting penalty. Their iniquity, however, should not be visited upon their children, nor should their property be confiscated. Regarding the imposition of fines, a person who is fined for an offense should not be required to pay the fine if they do not have excess property. The lots must never go uncultivated due to a lack of means, and the guardians of the law must ensure this. If a fine is imposed on a person that they cannot pay, and their friends are unwilling to provide security, they shall be imprisoned and subjected to other forms of dishonor. But no criminal shall go unpunished, whether it be death, imprisonment, corporal punishment, fines, public humiliation, or banishment to a remote location. Serious offenses shall be handled by the guardians of the law and a group of the most qualified magistrates from the previous year. The specific procedures and other details will be left to future lawmakers, but we will determine the method of voting. The judges will sit in order of seniority, and the proceedings will begin with speeches from the plaintiff and defendant. Then, 
the judges, starting with the oldest, will ask questions and gather evidence over the course of three days. At the end of each day, the evidence will be written down and sealed on the altar of Hestia. Once they have enough evidence, the judges will make a solemn declaration to decide justly, and then vote to conclude the case. The votes will be given openly in the presence of the citizens. After religion, the preservation of the constitution is the primary goal of the law. The greatest enemy of the state is someone who tries to establish a tyrant or plots and conspires against the government. A magistrate who knowingly or unknowingly fails to bring the offender to justice is not far behind in guilt. Anyone who is of value will report traitors. The proceedings for such trials will be the same as those for sacrilege, with the penalty being death. However, the son will not be held accountable for the father's crimes, unless the father, grandfather, and great-grandfather have all been convicted of capital offenses. In that case, the criminal's family will be sent to the country of their ancestors, keeping their property except for the lot and its fixtures. Ten younger sons of other citizens will be chosen, and one of them will be selected by the Oracle of Delphi to inherit the lot. Our third law will be a general one, concerning the procedure and judges in cases of treason. The same law will apply to the remaining or departure of the families of traitors, sacrilegious individuals, and conspirators. A thief, regardless of the amount stolen, must repay twice the value, if it does not harm their lot. If they cannot repay, they must go to prison until they either pay the victim or, in the case of a public theft, the city, or until an agreement is reached for forgiveness. But should all types of theft carry the same punishment? You remind me that legislation is never perfect. The people for whom laws are currently being made can be compared to a slave being treated by an unskilled doctor, according to our old analogy. If the unskilled doctor were to encounter an educated physician talking to the patient and discussing the philosophy of the disease, the unskilled doctor would laugh and say, as doctors often do, foolish fellow, instead of curing the patient, you are educating him. And would he not be right? Perhaps. He might also add that someone who speaks in our manner is preaching to the citizens rather than legislating for them. True. However, we have one advantage as amateurs, we can take either the most ideal or the most necessary and practical view. But why present such an alternative? As if all our legislation must be completed today and nothing can be postponed until tomorrow. We can surely rough out our materials first and shape and place them afterwards. That will be the natural way to proceed. There is another point. Of all writings, whether in prose or verse, the writings of the legislator are the most important. It is the legislator who determines the nature of good and evil and how they should be studied for our instruction. It would be as disgraceful for Solon and Lycurgus to provide false instructions about the institutions of life as it would be for Homer and Tertius. The laws of states should serve as models for writing and anything that contradicts them should be considered ridiculous. We can also imagine the laws expressing the affection and good sense of a father or mother, rather than being the decrees of a tyrant. Very true. Let us inquire more specifically about sacrilege, theft, and other crimes for which we have already legislated to some extent. This leads us to ask, first, whether we agree or disagree about the nature of what is honorable and just. What are you referring to? I will try to explain. We all agree that justice is honorable, whether in people or things, and no one would think it extravagant to say that a very ugly person who is just as fair in their mind. Very true. But if honor is attributed to justice, are just punishments honorable, or only just actions? What do you mean? Our laws provide an example, we have enacted that temple robbers and traitors should be put to death, which is just but not honorable. In this way, the language of the majority separates the just from the honorable. That is true. But is our own language consistent? I have already said that evil actions are involuntarily evil, and evil actions are unjust. Now, the voluntary cannot be the involuntary. If you two come to me and say, shall we legislate for our city? Of course, I will reply, shall we distinguish between crimes that are voluntary and those that are involuntary? Shall we impose lighter penalties on the latter and harsher penalties on the former? 
or shall we refuse to determine the meaning of voluntary and involuntary and maintain that our words have come from heaven and should be immediately embodied in a law? All states legislate under the assumption that there are two types of actions, voluntary and involuntary. However, there is great confusion about them in people's minds, and the law cannot function unless they are distinguished. We must either refrain from asserting that unjust actions are involuntary or explain the meaning of this statement. Since I believe that acts of injustice cannot be categorized as voluntary or involuntary, I must find another way to classify them. Hurts can be voluntary or involuntary, but not all hurts are injuries. Conversely, a benefit that is wrongly given can be considered an injury. An act that gives or takes something is not simply just. However, a legislator who must determine whether a case involves hurt or injury must consider the intention of the person committing the act. When there is hurt, the legislator should provide a remedy and compensation as much as possible. But if there is injustice, the legislator should strive to reconcile the two parties after compensation has been made. That's excellent. In cases where injustice, like a curable disease, can be remedied, the remedy must be applied through words or actions, with the help of pleasures, pains, rewards, penalties, or any other influence that can inspire people to love justice and hate injustice. This is the noblest task of the law. However, when the legislator realizes that the evil is incurable, they should consider that the death of the offender would be beneficial to them and to society in two ways, first, as an example to others, and second, because the city would be rid of a rogue. In such cases, and only in such cases, the legislator should punish with death. There is some truth in what you say. However, I wish you would clearly distinguish between injury and hurt, as well as the complexities of voluntary and involuntary actions. You will agree that anger is violent and destructive, right? Certainly. And pleasure is different from anger, having an opposite power, working through persuasion and deceit, correct? Yes. Ignorance is the third source of crimes, which can be divided into two types, simple ignorance and ignorance combined with a conceit of knowledge. The latter, when accompanied by power, leads to terrible mistakes, but is excusable when it is weak and childish. True. We often say that one person masters another through pleasure and anger. Exactly. However, no one says that one person masters another through ignorance. You're right. All these motives drive and sometimes compel people in different directions. That's true. Now. I can define the nature of justice and injustice. By injustice, I mean the dominance of anger, fear, pleasure, pain, envy, and desire in the soul, whether causing harm or not. By justice, I mean the rule of the opinion of the best, whether in states or individuals, extending to all aspects of life. Although actions done in error are often considered involuntary injustice, we do not need to argue about names now. We simply want to remember the main sources of error. The first source is the pain called fear and anger. The second is the category of pleasures and desires. And the third is the hopes that aim for true opinions about what is best. This third source can be divided into three subcategories, one, when accompanied by simple ignorance, two, when accompanied by a conceit of wisdom combined with power, or three, when accompanied by weakness. So, there are a total of five sources. The laws related to these sources can be summarized under two categories, laws that deal with acts of open violence and laws that deal with acts of deceit. Acts that are both violent and deceitful should be punished with the utmost severity of the law. Very appropriately. Now, let us return to the enactment of laws. We have discussed sacrilege, conspiracy, and treason. Any of these crimes can be committed by a person who is not in their right mind or in the second childhood of old age. If this is proven before the judges, the person in question will only have to pay for the harm caused and not be further punished, unless they have the stain of blood on their hands. In that case, they will be exiled for a year, and if they return before the year is up, they will be held in the public prison for two years. Homicides can be divided into voluntary and involuntary. Let us first discuss involuntary homicide. If someone unintentionally kills another person during authorized games or military exercises, 
whether death occurs immediately or after some time, they will be acquitted, but they must undergo the purification required by the Delphian Oracle. Similarly, any physician whose patient dies against their will shall be acquitted. If someone unintentionally kills another person's slave, believing that the slave is their own, with or without weapons, they must compensate the slave's master or pay a penalty equal to twice the value of the slave. They must also undergo a purification greater than in the case of homicide during games. If a person kills their own slave unintentionally, they only need to undergo purification. If they unintentionally kill a freeman, they must also undergo purification. They should remember the ancient tradition that says the murdered person is indignant when they see the murderer walking around in their familiar places and that the memory of the crime terrifies the murderer. Therefore, the person who committed the homicide should stay away from their homeland for a year. If they killed a stranger, they should avoid the stranger's land for the same period. If they comply with this condition, the closest relative of the deceased should have pity on them and be reconciled. But if the person refuses to go into exile or visits temples without undergoing purification, then the relative should take legal action against them and demand double the penalty. The relative who neglects this duty shall themselves incur the curse, and anyone who wishes may proceed against them and compel them to leave their country for five years. If a stranger unintentionally kills another stranger, anyone may proceed against them in the same manner. The killer, if they are a foreigner living in the city, shall be banished for a year. But if they are a stranger, whether they have murdered a foreigner, citizen, or stranger, they shall be banished forever. If they return, they shall be punished with death, and their property shall go to the closest relative of the murdered person. If they are brought back by sea against their will, they shall remain on the seashore, wetting their feet in the water while they wait for a ship to sail. If they are brought back by land, the magistrates shall send them unharmed beyond the border. Next, let us discuss murder committed out of anger, which comes in two forms, either arising from an impulse and accompanied by remorse, or committed with premeditation and without remorse. The cause of both is anger, and both fall between voluntary and involuntary actions. The murder committed from an impulse, although not entirely involuntary, resembles involuntary actions and is therefore more excusable of the two, deserving a milder punishment. The act of someone who nurtures their anger is more voluntary and therefore more culpable. The degree of culpability depends on the presence or absence of intention, and the punishment should correspond to that degree. For the first kind of murder, the one done on a momentary impulse, the penalty shall be two years of exile. For the second kind, the one accompanied by premeditation, the penalty shall be three years of exile. When someone's exile has ended, the guardians shall send twelve judges to the borders of the land, who shall have the authority to decide whether they may return or not. If the offender repeats the offense after returning, they shall be exiled permanently and never allowed to return. If they do return, they shall be put to death, just like a stranger in a similar case. If someone in a fit of anger kills their own slave, they shall purify themselves. If they kill another person's slave, they shall pay double the value to the slave's master. Anyone may proceed against the offender if they appear in public places without having been purified. They may bring both the closest relative of the deceased and the killer to trial and compel the former to exact, and the latter to pay, a double penalty. If a slave kills their master or a freeman who is not their master in anger, the relatives of the murdered person may do whatever they please with the murderer, but they must not spare their life. If a father or mother kills their child in anger, the slayer shall remain in exile for three years. Upon the return of the exile, the parents shall separate and no longer live together or participate in the same sacred rituals as those whom they have deprived of a sibling. The same penalty is decreed for a husband who murders his wife and for a wife who murders her husband. They shall be absent for three years, and upon their return, they shall never again participate in the same sacred rituals as their children or sit at the same table with them. A sibling who has raised their hands against a sibling shall never again live under the same roof or participate in the same rituals as those whom they have deprived of a child. If a son feels such hatred towards their father or mother that they take the life of either of them, then if the parent forgives them before death, they shall only suffer the penalty for involuntary manslaughter. But if they are unforgiven, they have violated many laws. 
they are guilty of outrage, impiety, and sacrilege all at once, and deserve to be put to death multiple times over. For if the law does not allow a person to kill their parents even in self-defense, what other penalty than death can be inflicted upon someone who, in a fit of passion, intentionally kills their father or mother? If a brother kills a brother in self-defense during a civil conflict, or a citizen kills another citizen, or a slave kills another slave, or a stranger kills another stranger, they shall be free from blame, just as someone who kills an enemy in battle. But if a slave kills a freeman, they shall be treated as a parricide. In all cases, however, the forgiveness of the injured party shall absolve the perpetrators. They shall only be purified and remain in exile for a year. Enough about involuntary actions or actions done in anger. Let us now turn to voluntary and premeditated actions. The main source of voluntary crime is the desire for money, which is born out of a corrupt education. This arises from the false praise of wealth, which is common among both Greeks and foreigners. They believe that wealth is the greatest good when it is only the third. The body does not exist for the sake of wealth, but wealth exists for the sake of the body, just as the body exists for the sake of the soul. If this were better understood, the crime of murder, which is primarily caused by greed, would soon cease among people. Next to greed, ambition is a source of crime, causing trouble not only for the ambitious person themselves but also for the leaders of the state. And following ambition, Base fear is a motive that has led many to commit murder to eliminate witnesses to their crimes. Let this be said as an introduction to all laws concerning violent crimes. And let us not forget the tradition that tells us that murderers are punished in the underworld and that when they return to this world, they meet the fate they have dealt to others. If a person is deterred by the introduction and the fear of future punishment, they will have no need for the law. However, if they disobey, the law should be declared against them as follows, if someone intentionally kills a relative, they shall first be declared an outlaw. They shall not be allowed in any temple, harbor, or marketplace, as their presence would defile these places. If a relative of the deceased refuses to act against the killer, they shall bear the curse of defilement and can be prosecuted by anyone seeking justice for the dead. The prosecutor must follow the customary rituals before proceeding against the offender. The specific details of these rituals will be determined by a group of prophets, interpreters, guardians of the law, and the judges of the case, who will be the same as those in cases of sacrilege. If the accused is convicted, they shall be punished with death and shall not be buried in the same country as the murdered person. If the offender flees from the law, they shall face perpetual banishment. If they return, any relative of the murdered person or any other citizen may kill them without consequence, or they may be captured and handed over to the authorities. If someone accuses another of murder, they may demand satisfactory bail from the accused. If bail is not provided, the magistrate shall keep the accused in prison until the day of trial. If a person commits murder through the actions of another, they shall be tried in the same manner as previously described. However, if the offender is a citizen, their body shall be buried within the country after execution. If a slave kills a free person, either directly or through a plan, they shall be taken to a place where they can see the grave of the murdered person. There, the public executioner shall administer as many lashes as desired by the person who captured the slave. If the slave survives, they shall be put to death. If a slave is killed to prevent them from revealing a crime, their death shall be punished in the same manner as that of a citizen. In cases of heinous murders within families, which sometimes occur even in well-regulated societies in which the legislator must address, the legislator shall recount the ancient myth of divine vengeance against those who commit such atrocities. The myth shall state that the murderer must suffer the same fate as their victim. For example, if they killed their father, they must be killed by their own children. If they killed their mother, they must become a woman and perish at the hands of their offspring in a future age. This preamble may frighten potential murderers. However, if someone still commits the act of murdering their father, mother, siblings, or children, the following procedure shall be followed. The officers of the judges shall lead the convicted person to a place outside the city where three roads meet. There, they shall be killed, and their naked body shall be exposed. Each magistrate shall throw a stone at their head to justify the city. 
the body shall be left unburied beyond the border. What should be done in the case of someone taking their own life, not due to disgrace or calamity, but out of cowardice and laziness? The manner of their burial and the purification of their crime shall be decided by God and the interpreters and executed by their relatives. At the very least, they shall be buried alone in an uncultivated and unnamed place, without a name or monument. If an animal kills a person, not in a public contest, it shall be prosecuted for murder. After being condemned, it shall be killed and cast beyond the border. Inanimate objects that cause death, except in cases of natural disasters like lightning, shall also be taken beyond the border. If the body of a deceased person is found and the murderer remains unknown, a trial shall still take place. The unknown murderer shall be warned not to enter temples or the borders of the land. If they are discovered, they shall be put to death and their body shall be cast out. A person is justified in taking the life of a burglar, a robber on the road, or someone who violates women or young people. They may also take the life of another person without consequence in defense of their father, mother, siblings, spouse, or other relatives. We have considered the necessary care and education for the existence of humans, as well as the punishment for acts of violence that result in death. There remain cases of maiming, injuring, and similar actions, which can be divided into voluntary and involuntary. The preamble for this category of actions shall be as follows, since humans would be like wild animals if they did not obey the laws, the primary duty of citizens is to care for the public interest, which unites and preserves states while private interests divide them. A person may know what is for the public good, but if they have absolute power, human nature will drive them to seek pleasure instead of virtue, and darkness will cloud their soul and the state. If they possessed wisdom, they would not need laws, as wisdom is the embodiment of law. However, such an absolutely free person, whom the truth makes free, is rarely found. Therefore, law and order are necessary, as they are the second best option. They can only regulate things partially, as they cannot encompass everything. Actions have countless characteristics, some of which must be determined by the law, while others are left to the judge. The judge must establish the facts and sometimes determine the punishment. What should the law prescribe, and what should be left to the judge? A city is unfortunate if its courts are either secret and silent or, worse, noisy, and public, with the people applauding and jeering at the various speakers as if they were in a theater. A legislator would prefer not to have such courts, but if he is forced to have them, he will speak clearly and leave as little as possible to their discretion. However, when the courts are good and presided over by well-trained judges, the penalties to be imposed can be largely left to their judgment. Since there will be good courts among our colonists, we do not need to determine and advance the exact proportion of the penalty to the crime. Now, let us turn back to our legislator and draft a law regarding wounding, which shall read as follows, if someone wounds another with the intention to kill, but fails in their attempt, they shall be tried as if they had succeeded. However, since both the perpetrator and the victim have been spared by God, instead of being put to death, the perpetrator shall be allowed to go into exile and take their property with them. The court, which would have tried the case if death had occurred, shall first estimate the damage owed to the victim. If a child intentionally wounds a parent, or a servant wounds their master, or a sibling wounds another sibling with premeditated malice, the penalty shall be death. If a spouse wounds each other with the intent to kill, the penalty imposed on them shall be perpetual exile. If they have young children, the guardian shall take care of them and manage their property as if they were orphans. If they have no children, their male and female relatives shall gather and, after consulting with the priests and guardians of the law, appoint an heir for the household. The household and family belong to the state, constituting a 5,040th portion of the whole. The state is obligated to ensure the happiness and sanctity of its families. Therefore, when the heir of a household commits a capital offense or is exiled for life, the household must be purified. Then, the relatives and guardians of the law shall find a family with a good reputation and many sons and introduce one of them as the heir and priest of the household. He shall assume the role of the father and ancestors of the family, while the first son dies in dishonor and his name is erased. Some actions fall between voluntary and involuntary. 
those done out of anger belong to this category. If a person wounds another in anger, they shall pay double the damage if the injury is curable, or four times the damage if it is curable and dishonorable, or four times the damage if it is incurable. The amount shall be determined by the judges. If the wounded person becomes incapable of military service, the perpetrator, in addition to other penalties, shall serve in their place or be subject to a lawsuit for refusing to serve. If a brother wounds another brother, their parents and relatives of all genders shall gather and judge the crime. The parents shall assess the damages, and if the amount is disputed, it shall be appealed to the male relatives, or ultimately to the guardians of the law. Parents who wound their children shall be tried by judges who are at least 60 years old and have children of their own. They shall determine whether death or a lesser punishment shall be inflicted upon them, and no relatives shall participate in the trial. If a slave strikes a freeman in anger, the slave shall be handed over by their master to the injured person. If the master suspects collusion between the slave and the injured person, they may bring the matter to trial. If they fail, they shall pay three times the injury. If they succeed in obtaining a conviction, the mastermind behind the conspiracy shall be liable to a lawsuit for kidnapping. If someone unintentionally wounds another, they shall only pay for the actual harm caused. In all acts of violence, the elder shall be given more consideration than the younger. It is abominable and hateful for a younger person to injure an elder, but if a younger person is struck by an elder, they shall bear it patiently, considering that someone who is twenty years older is like a parent and deserving of reverence, just as the gods who preside over birth. The younger person shall also refrain from striking a stranger. Instead of taking it upon themselves to punish the stranger when they are insolent, they shall bring them before the city wardens, who shall investigate the case. If the stranger is found guilty, they shall be whipped with as many blows as they have given. If they are innocent, the wardens shall warn and threaten the accuser. When equals strike each other, whether it be an old man striking another old man or a young man striking another young man, they shall only use their fists and not weapons. If someone above the age of forty starts a fight or retaliates, they shall be considered mean and base. To this preamble, the following law shall be added, if a person strikes someone who is twenty years or more their elder, a bystander who is older than the combatants shall intervene and separate them. If the bystander is younger than the person struck or of the same age, they shall defend the person struck as they would a father or brother. The striker shall be brought to trial, and if convicted, shall be imprisoned for a year or more at the discretion of the judges. If a stranger strikes someone who is twenty years or more their elder, they shall be imprisoned for two years. If a medic or resident foreigner does the same, they shall suffer three years of imprisonment. Anyone who stands by and does not help shall be punished according to their social class, with a fine of one mind, fifty, thirty, or twenty drachmas. The generals and other high-ranking officers of the army shall form the court that tries this category of offenses. Laws are created to educate the good and in the hope that there will be no need for them, they also serve to control the bad, whose lack of compassion will not prevent them from committing crimes. The most severe punishment will befall those who harm their parents without fear of the gods above or the punishments that will pursue them in the afterlife. They are too arrogant to believe in such things, so the tortures that await them in the next life must be anticipated in this one. The law shall be as follows, if a man, in his right mind, dares to strike his father and mother, or his grandparents, let a passerby come to their rescue. If the rescuer is a medic or a stranger, they shall have the first place at the games. If they do not come to the rescue, they shall be banished forever. If the citizen is in the same situation, they shall be praised or blamed, and if the offender is a slave, they shall either be freed or receive one hundred lashes. The wardens of the marketplace, the city, or the countryside, depending on the case, shall ensure that the law is carried out. And anyone who is present, and a resident of the same place shall come to the rescue, or they shall be cursed. If a person is convicted of assaulting their parents, they shall be banished from the city to the countryside forever and must abstain from all sacred rituals. If they do not abstain, they shall be punished by the wardens of the countryside. If they return to the city, they shall be put to death. If any freeman associates with them, they shall be purified before returning to the city. If a slave strikes a freeman, 
whether a citizen or a stranger, the bystander shall be obliged to seize and deliver the slave to the injured person, who may then inflict as many blows as they please before returning the slave to their master. The law shall be as follows, the slave who strikes a freeman shall be bound by their master and not set free without the consent of the injured person. All these laws apply to women as well as men. Book 10. The greatest wrongs arise from youthful insolence, and the greatest of all are committed against public temples. They are of the second degree of severity when private rituals and burial sites are insulted, of the third degree when committed against parents, of the fourth degree when done against the authority or property of the rulers, and of the fifth degree when the rights of individuals are violated. Most of these offenses have already been discussed but the question of admonition and punishment for offenses against the gods remains. Let the admonition be as follows, no one who intentionally does or says anything impious honestly believes in the existence of the gods. They either think that there are no gods, or that the gods do not care about humans, or that the gods can be easily appeased by sacrifices and prayers. What shall we say or do to such people? Well, let us first hear the jokes they will make at our expense. What will they say? Probably something like this, Strangers, you are right to think that some of us do not believe in the existence of the gods. Others assert that the gods do not care for us, and still others believe that the gods can be appeased by prayers and offerings. But we want you to argue with us before you threaten us. You should prove to us with reasonable evidence that there are gods and that they are too good to be bribed. Poets, priests, Prophets, rhetoricians, even the best of them, speak to us about atoning for evil, not about avoiding it. From legislators who claim to be gentle, we ask for instruction that may have the persuasive power of truth, if nothing else. What do you have to say? Well, there is no difficulty in proving the existence of the gods. The sun, earth, and stars moving in their courses, the changing seasons, provide evidence of their existence and there is the general opinion of mankind. I fear that the unbelievers, not that I care for their opinion, will despise us. You are not aware that their impiety stems not from sensuality, but from ignorance disguised as wisdom. What do you mean? In Athens, there are tales circulating in both prose and verse that would not be tolerated in a well-regulated state like yours. The oldest of these tales recount the origin of the world and the birth and life of the gods. These narratives have a negative influence on family relationships, but since they are old, we will let them pass and consider another type of tales invented by the wisdom of a younger generation. They insist that if someone argues for the existence of the gods and claims that the stars have a divine nature, these stars are nothing more than earth and stones that have no concern for human affairs. They believe that all theology is a fabrication of words. Now, what should we do? Should we suppose that some impious person accuses us of assuming the existence of the gods and make a defense? Or should we skip the preamble and move on to the laws? There is no rush, and we have often said that the shorter and worse method should not be preferred to the longer and better one. The best preamble for all our laws is to prove that there are gods who are good and friends of justice. Come, let us speak with the impious who have been raised from infancy in the belief of religion and have heard their own fathers and mothers praying for them and conversing with the gods as if they were completely convinced of their existence. They have witnessed people prostrating themselves in prayer at the rising and setting of the sun and moon and at every turn of fortune, and yet they have dared to despise and disbelieve all of this. Can we maintain our composure when they force us to argue about such a topic? We must, or else we will go mad, although with more reason than them. Let us choose one of them and address him in the following manner, Oh, my son, you are young, time and experience will cause you to change many of your opinions. Do not be hasty in forming conclusions about the divine nature. Let me share with you a fact that I know. You and your friends are not the first or only individuals to have these beliefs about the gods. There are always a significant number of people who are influenced by them. I have personally known many such individuals and can assure you that no one who was a non-believer in their youth persisted in denying the existence of the gods as they grew older. The other two opinions, first, that the gods exist but do not care for humans, and second, that they care for humans but can be appeased through sacrifices and prayers, may endure throughout a few individuals' lives, 
but even this is uncommon. I would ask you to be patient and seek the truth from the legislator and others. In the meantime, refrain from impiety. So far, our conversation has gone well. Now, I will discuss a strange doctrine that many consider the pinnacle of philosophy. They assert that all things come into existence either through art, nature, or chance. They believe that greater things are accomplished by nature and chance, while lesser things are achieved through art, which takes the greater creations from nature and shapes the lesser works known as art. What they mean is that fire, water, earth, and air exist naturally and by chance, not through art. According to certain chance affinities of opposites, the sun, moon, stars, and earth were formed from these elements, not by any deliberate action of the mind, but solely by nature and chance. Thus, in their view, the heavens, earth, animals, and plants were all created. Art came later and is a product of moral beings. Through art, certain images and partial imitations of the truth were invented, such as those created by musicians and painters. However, they claim that there are other arts that collaborate with nature and possess a deeper truth, such as medicine, agriculture, and physical education. They also believe that a significant portion of politics works in harmony with nature, but to a lesser extent, relying more on art. They declare that legislation is entirely a work of art. What do you mean? Firstly, they argue that the gods exist neither through nature nor art, but through the laws of different states, which vary from country to country. They claim that virtue is one thing by nature and another by convention, and that justice is entirely a convention, created by law and possessing authority only in the present moment. Sages and poets repeat these ideas to young men, leading to impiety and a supposed life lived according to nature, in disobedience to the law. After all, nobody believes that the gods are as the law describes them. How true! And oh, how harmful to states and families. But then, what should the legislator do? Should he stand up in the state and threaten mankind with severe penalties if they persist in their disbelief, without attempting to persuade them? No, stranger, the legislator should never tire of trying to persuade the world that there are gods. He should declare that law and art exist by nature. Yes, Kleinias, but these are difficult and lengthy discussions. And should our patience, which did not waver during our discussion about music or drink, fail us now that we are talking about the gods? There may be difficulty in creating laws, but once they are written down, they remain, and time and effort will make them clear. If they are useful, it would be unreasonable and irreligious to reject them because of their length. Absolutely true. The widespread disbelief shows that the legislator should take action to defend the laws when they are being undermined by wicked individuals. He should. You agree with me, Kleinias, that the heresy lies in considering earth, air, fire, and water as the primary elements. These heretics call them nature, believing them to be superior to the soul. I agree. You would also agree that this impiety stems from natural philosophy, which seems to be pursued in the wrong manner. In what way do you mean? The error lies in reversing the order of first and second causes. They fail to see that the soul comes before the body and before all other things, and that it is the creator and ruler of them all. And if the soul precedes the body, then the things of the soul come before the things of the body. In other words, opinions, attention, mind, art, and law come before sensory qualities, and the first and greater creations are the result of art and mind while the so-called works of nature are secondary and subsequent. Why do you say so-called? Because when they speak of nature, they seem to refer to the primary creative power. But if the soul comes first, not fire and air, then the soul can be said to exist by nature above all else. And this can only be true if the soul precedes the body. Shall we attempt to prove this? By all means. I fear that the immaturity of our argument will starkly contrast with the wisdom of our years. But as we must enter the water and the current is strong, I will first attempt to cross alone, and if I reach the other side, you shall follow. Remembering that you are not accustomed to such discussions, I will ask and answer the questions myself, while you listen in safety. But first, I must pray to the gods to assist in demonstrating their own existence if we are ever to call upon them, now is the time.
Let me hold on to the rope and delve into the depths, should I pose the question to myself in this way? Are all things at rest, and is nothing in motion? Or are some things in motion and some things at rest? The latter. And do they move in rest, some in one place and some in more? Yes. There may be, one, motion in the same place, such as revolution on an axis, which is quickly imparted to the larger circle and slowly to the smaller circle. And there may be motion in different places, sometimes, two, with one center of motion and sometimes, three, with more. Four, when bodies in motion meet other bodies at rest, they are divided by them, and, five, when they are caught between other bodies coming from opposite directions, they unite with them. And, six, they grow by union and, seven, diminish by dissolution while their structure remains the same but are, eight, destroyed when their structure fails. There is growth from one dimension to two, and from a second to a third, which then becomes perceptible to the senses, this process is called generation, and the opposite is called destruction. We have now listed all possible motions except for two. What are they? Just the two that our inquiry is concerned with, for our inquiry relates to the soul. There is one kind of motion that can only move other things, and there is another kind that can move itself as well, working in composition and decomposition, through increase and decrease, through generation and destruction. Agreed. 9. The ninth kind of motion is that which is moved by another and moves others. 10. The tenth kind is that which is self-moved and moves others. And this tenth kind of motion is the most powerful and is truly the first, followed by what was mistakenly called the ninth. What do you mean? Doesn't that which is moved by others ultimately depend on that which is moved by itself? Nothing can be affected by any transition prior to self-motion. Therefore, the first and oldest principle of motion, whether in things at rest or not at rest, will be the principle of self-motion, and that which is moved by others and can move others will be the second. True. Let me ask another question, what is the name given to self-motion when it is manifested in any material substance? Life. And soul is also life? Particularly good. And aren't there three kinds of knowledge, knowledge of the essence, knowledge of the definition, and knowledge of the name? And sometimes the name leads us to ask for the definition, and sometimes the definition leads us to ask for the name. For example, number can be divided into equal parts, and when it is divided in this way, it is called even, and the definition of even and the word even refer to the same thing. Absolutely true. And what is the definition of the thing that is named soul? Must we not reply, the self moved? And haven't we proven that the self moved is the source of motion and other things? Yes. And the motion that is not self moved will be inferior to this? True. And if so, we would be correct in saying that the soul is prior and superior to the body, and the body is naturally subject and inferior to the soul? Absolutely right. And we agreed that if the soul is prior to the body, the things of the soul are prior to the things of the body? Certainly. And therefore, desires, manners, thoughts, true opinions, and recollections are prior to the length, breadth, and force of bodies. Definitely. Next, we acknowledge that the soul is the cause of good and evil, just and unjust, if we suppose her to be the cause of all things? Certainly. And the soul that orders all things must also order the heavens? Of course. One soul or more? More, for less than two are inconceivable, one good, the other evil. Most true. The soul directs all things through her movements, which we call will, consideration, attention, deliberation, true and false opinions, joy, sorrow, courage, fear, hatred, love, and similar emotions. These are the primary movements, and they influence the secondary movements of bodies, guiding all things towards increase and decrease, separation and union, and all the qualities that accompany them cold, hot, heavy, light, hard, soft, white, black, sweet, bitter. The soul, herself a goddess, uses these qualities and others when she truly receives the divine mind, leading all things rightly to their happiness. But under the influence of folly, she brings about the opposite result. For the controller of heaven and earth and the circle of the world is either the wise and good soul or the foolish and wicked soul, working within them. 
What do you mean? If we say that the entire course and motion of heaven and earth is in accordance with the workings and reasonings of the mind, then clearly the best soul must have the care of the heavens and guide them along a better path. True. But if the heavens move chaotically and disorderly, then they must be under the guidance of the evil soul. Also, true. What is the nature of the movement of the soul? We must not assume that we can see and know the soul with our physical eyes, any more than we can fix our gaze on the midday sun, it would be safer to only look at an image. What do you mean? Let us find among the ten kinds of motion an image of the motion of the mind. You remember, as we said, that all things are divided into two classes, some are moved, and some are at rest. Yes. And of those that were moved, some were moved in the same place, others in more than one place. Exactly. The motion that occurred in one place was circular, like the motion of a spherical body. And such a motion, in the same place and in the same relationships, is an excellent representation of the motion of the mind. Very true. The motion of the other kind, which has no fixed place, manner, relationship, order, or proportion, is like folly and nonsense. Very true. Based on what has been said, since the soul carries everything around, some soul, which is either particularly good or the opposite, carries the circumference of the heavens. But that soul can be no other than the best. Furthermore, the soul carries the sun, moon, and stars. And if the sun has a soul, then either the soul of the sun is within and moves the sun as the human soul moves the body, or secondly, the sun is contained in some external air or fire, which the soul provides and through which it operates, or thirdly, the course of the sun is guided by the soul acting in a remarkable manner without a body. Yes, the soul must guide all things in one of those ways. And this soul of the sun, which is better than the sun, whether driving him in a chariot or using any other means, is called a god by every person. Yes, by every person who has any sense. And in the same way, it can be affirmed that the soul or souls from which the seasons, stars, moon, and year derive their excellence are divine. And without insisting on the manner of their functioning, no one can deny that all things are full of gods. No one. And now let us propose an alternative to the person who denies the existence of gods. Either they must demonstrate that the soul is not the origin of all things, or they must live in the future believing that there are gods. Next, as for the person who believes in the gods but refuses to acknowledge that they take care of human affairs, let us offer them some advice. Best of men, we will say to them, your affinity to the gods leads you to honor and believe in them. But you have heard poets sing about the happiness of wicked people, which has been admired by the world, and this has led you away from your natural piety. Or perhaps you have seen wicked individuals growing old in prosperity and passing on great positions to their children. Or maybe you have observed a tyrant succeeding in their criminal career. Considering all these things, you have been irrationally led to believe that the gods do not care about human affairs. So that your error does not increase, I will try to purify your soul. Megillus and Clinias, please answer on behalf of the youth, and when we encounter a difficulty, I will guide you through it as I did before. Very good. It will be easy to convince them that the gods care for both the small and the great, as they have heard about the goodness of the gods and how they take care of everything. They certainly heard. Now let us investigate what is meant by the virtue of the gods. Possessing a mind is a characteristic of virtue, and the opposite is a characteristic of vice. That is what we say. And isn't courage a part of virtue, and cowardice a part of vice? Certainly. We ascribe virtues to the gods, but idleness and laziness are not virtues. Of course not. And can God be conceived as a careless, lazy individual, like a stingless drone as the poet would compare? Impossible. Can we truly praise someone who takes care of important matters but neglects the small ones? Whether it is God or a human, if they do so, they must either consider the neglect of such matters to be inconsequential, or they are lazy and careless. Because surely neither of them can be accused of neglect if they fail to attend to something beyond their power. Certainly not. And now let us examine the two groups of people who admit the existence of gods but say either that the gods can be appeased or that they do not care about small matters. 
don't they acknowledge that the gods are all-powerful and all-knowing, as well as good and perfect? Certainly. Then they cannot be lazy, for laziness is born out of idleness, and idleness is born out of cowardice. And there is no cowardice in God. True. If the gods neglect small matters, they must either know or not know that such things should not be regarded. But of course, they know that they should be regarded, and knowing this, they cannot be assumed to neglect their duty, overcome by the allure of pleasure or pain. Impossible. And don't all human things possess a soul, and isn't man the most religious of animals in the possession of the gods? And the gods, who are the best owners, will surely take care of their property, whether it is small or great. Consider further that the greater the power of perception, the lesser the power of action. For it is more difficult to see and hear the small things than the great ones, but it is easier to control them. Imagine a physician who had to cure a patient. Would they ever succeed if they attended to the great matters and neglected the small ones? Impossible. Isn't life made up of small things? The pilot, general, householder, and statesman all attend to small matters. And the builder will tell you that large stones do not fit well without small ones. And God is not inferior to moral craftsmen, who, in proportion to their skill, pay attention to the details of their work. We must not imagine that the best and wisest is a lazy good-for-nothing who grows tired of their work and rushes through small and easy matters. Never, never. He who accuses the gods of neglect has been forced to admit his mistake, but I would like to further convince him that the Creator of all has made each part for the sake of the whole, and that even the smallest part has a designated purpose or state of action or emotion, and that the smallest action or emotion of any part has a governing authority. We say to him, you are a tiny fraction of this universe, created with the intention of serving the whole, the world is not made for you, but you for the world, for a skilled artist considers the whole first, and then the individual parts. And you are frustrated because you cannot see how you and the universe are working together for the best, within the limits of the laws of creation. The soul undergoes many changes through its interaction with bodies, and all that the player does is to put the pieces in their proper places. What do you mean? I mean that God acts in the simplest and easiest way. If each thing had been created without any consideration for the rest, the rearrangement of the cosmos would be endless, but now there is not much difficulty in governing the world. For when the king observed the actions of the living souls and bodies, and the virtue and vice within them, and the impermanence of the soul and body, although they are not eternal, he arranged them in such a way that virtue might triumph and vice be overcome as much as possible giving them a suitable place in space, but leaving the direction of their individual actions to the wills of men, which shape our characters. That is very likely. All things that have a soul possess within themselves the principle of change, and in changing, move according to fate and law, natures that have undergone minor changes move on the surface, but those that have changed completely for the worse, sink into Hades and the underworld. And in all significant changes for good or evil that are brought about either by the will of the soul or the influence of others, there is a change of place. The good soul, which has communion with the divine nature, moves to a holier and better place, and the evil soul, as it becomes worse, changes its place for the worse. This as we explain to the young person who believes that he is neglected by the gods is the law of divine justice the worse to the worse, the better to the better, like to like, in life and in death and no one will ever boast that he has escaped this law. Even if you say I am insignificant, and will disappear into the earth, or I am exalted, and will ascend to heaven you are not so insignificant or so exalted that you will not pay the appropriate penalty, either here or in the underworld. This is also the explanation for the apparent prosperity of the wicked, in whose actions you imagine that you saw the neglect of the gods, without considering that they make all things contribute to the whole. And how then could you form any concept of true happiness, if Clinias and Megillus and I have succeeded in convincing you that you do not know what you are saying about the gods, God will help you, but if there is still any lack of evidence, listen to our response to the third opponent. Enough has been said to prove that the gods exist and care for us, but the idea that they can be appeased or that they accept gifts is not to be entertained for a moment. Let us continue with the argument. Tell me, by the gods, I say. How can we appease the gods? Are they not rulers, who can be compared to charioteers, pilots, perhaps generals, 
or physicians guarding against the attacks of disease, farmers watching for the dangers of the seasons, shepherds tending their flocks. To whom shall we compare them? We acknowledge that the world is filled with both good and evil, but with more evil than good. There is an eternal conflict taking place, in which gods and demigods are our allies, and we are their possessions, for injustice and foolishness and wickedness wage war in our souls against justice and self-control and wisdom. There is little virtue to be found on earth, and evil natures flatter the gods, like wild animals flattering their keepers, and believe that they can win them over with flattery and prayers. And this sin, which is called dishonesty, is to the soul what disease is to the body, what pestilence is to the seasons, what injustice is to states. Exactly. And those who maintain that the gods can be appeased must believe that they forgive the sins of men, if they are allowed to share in their spoils as you might imagine wolves appeasing the dogs by throwing them a portion of the prey. That is the argument. But let us apply our comparisons to the gods are they the pilots who are won over by gifts to wreck their own ships or the charioteers who are bribed to lose the race or the generals, or doctors, or farmers, who are diverted from their duty or the dogs who are silenced by wolves. God forbid. Are they not rather our best guardians? and shall we suppose that they fall short even of a moderate degree of human or even canine virtue, which would not betray justice for a reward? Impossible. Therefore, anyone who maintains such a belief is the most blasphemous of mankind. And now our three points have been proven, and we agree, 1, that there are gods, 2, that they care for men, 3, that they cannot be bribed to act unjustly. I have spoken passionately, out of fear that their impiety might lead to a corruption of life. And our efforts will not have been in vain if we have succeeded in convincing these men to detest themselves and change their behavior. So let us hope. Now that the introduction is complete, we will issue a proclamation commanding the wicked to abandon their evil ways. If they refuse, a law will be enacted, if a person is guilty of impious words or actions, let a bystander inform the authorities. Who will then bring the offender before the court. If any magistrate refuses to act, they too shall be tried for impiety. Anyone found guilty of such an offense shall be fined at the discretion of the court and shall also be punished with a term of imprisonment. There shall be three prisons, one for common offenses against life and property, another near the location where the nocturnal council will gather, to be called the House of Reformation, and a third to be situated in a desolate region in the center of the country to be named after retribution. There are three causes of impiety, and from each of them arise two types of impiety, totaling six. First, there is the impiety of those who deny the existence of the gods. Some of these may be honest individuals who hate evil but are dangerous because they speak carelessly about the gods and influence others to do the same. However, there is also a more malicious group who are cunning and immoral. This latter group includes diviners, tricksters, despots, demagogues, generals, hierophants of private mysteries, and sophists. The first group shall only be imprisoned and admonished. The second group should be put to death multiple times if possible. The other two types of impiety, those who deny the care of the gods and those who believe they can be appeased, have similar subdivisions that vary in the degree of guilt. Those who blaspheme out of ignorance shall be imprisoned in the House of Reformation for at least five years and shall only be allowed to interact with members of the Nocturnal Council, who will discuss matters concerning their spiritual well-being. If any of the prisoners regain their sanity after five years, they shall be reintegrated into society. However, if they offend again, they shall be put to death. As for those individuals who not only believe that the gods are negligent or can be appeased but also claim to have power over the souls of the living and the dead, and promise to manipulate the gods and bring ruin to homes and states, those who are guilty of such acts shall be confined in the central prison and shall have no contact with any free person. They shall only receive their daily rations from public slaves. When they die, their bodies shall be cast beyond the borders. If any free person assists in burying them, they shall be liable to a charge of impiety. However, the sins of the father shall not be visited upon his children, who, like other orphans, shall be educated by the state. Furthermore, there shall be a general law aimed at suppressing impiety. No individual shall hold religious ceremonies in their homes, instead, 
they shall go with their friends to pray and make sacrifices in the temples. The reason for this is that religious institutions can only be established by great intelligence. However, women and weak men are always consecrating every event, influenced by dreams and apparitions, and they build altars and temples in every village and wherever they have had a vision. This law is intended to prevent such practices and to discourage people from attempting to appease the gods through secret sacrifices, which only increase their sins. Therefore, let the law state, no one shall hold private religious rites. If a person who has not previously been noted for any impiety offends in this manner, they shall be admonished to move their rites to a public temple. However, if the offender is obstinate, they shall be brought to trial before the guardians. If found guilty, they shall be put to death. Book 11. Regarding interactions between individuals, the guiding principle is simple, do not take what is not yours and treat others as you would like to be treated. First, regarding treasure trove, may I never desire to find or, if I find, be tempted by the advice of diviners to take a treasure that was not left by one of my ancestors. For I will not gain as much in money as I will lose in virtue. The saying do not disturb the undisturbed can be applied in a new sense, and there is a common belief that such actions prevent a person from having a family. For someone who disregards such consequences, and, ignoring the wisdom of the wise, takes a treasure that does not belong to them, only the gods know what will be done to them. However, I propose that the first person who witnesses such an offense should inform the city or county authorities. They shall then consult the oracle at Delphi for a decision and whatever the oracle commands shall be carried out. If the informant is a free person, they shall be honored, and if a slave, they shall be set free. But anyone who fails to inform, if they are a free person, shall be dishonored, and if a slave, they shall be put to death. If a person intentionally or unintentionally leaves something behind, whether large or small, let the person who finds the item consider it a sacred deposit to the goddess of Rhodes. And if someone appropriates the item, if they are a slave, they shall be severely beaten. If they are a free person, they shall pay ten times the value of the item and be regarded as having committed a dishonorable act. If someone claims that another person has something that belongs to them, and the other person admits to having the disputed property but insists that it is their own, the ownership should be proven through property records. If the property is registered under the name of someone who is absent, possession should be given to the person who provides sufficient security on behalf of the absentee. If the property is not registered, it should be held by the three oldest magistrates. If the disputed property is an animal, the party who loses the dispute must pay for its upkeep. A person is allowed to apprehend their own slave and can also detain the runaway slave of a friend for safekeeping. Anyone who interferes with this must provide three sureties. If they fail to do so, they can be sued for violence and, if found guilty, must pay double the number of damages to the person from whom they took the slave. A formerly enslaved person who does not show proper respect to their patron can also be seized. Showing respect involves visiting the patron's house three times a month and offering to perform any lawful service for them. The formerly enslaved person must also marry as their patron wishes and if their property exceeds that of their patron, they must hand over the excess to them. A formerly enslaved person cannot remain in the state for more than 20 years without the consent of the magistrates and their master. If their census exceeds that of the third class, they must leave the country within 30 days, taking their property with them. Breaking this regulation will result in the penalty of death and the confiscation of their property. Disputes regarding these matters should be resolved in the courts of the tribes unless the parties have already settled the matter in a court of neighbors or before arbitrators. If someone claims ownership of an animal or any other item, the possessor should contact the seller or giver of the property within 30 days if they reside in the city. If the goods were received from a stranger, the possessor has five months to contact the seller or giver, with the middle month including the summer solstice. All purchases and exchanges should be made in the Agora, marketplace, and paid for immediately. Credit is not allowed by law. The law does not protect money subscribed to clubs. If someone sells something of greater value than 50 drachmas, they must remain in the city for 10 days and inform the buyer of their whereabouts in case of any claims. If a slave is sold and has a known condition such as epilepsy, 
kidney stones, or any other invisible disorder, the buyer, if they are a physician or trainer or if they were warned about the condition, has no recourse. However, in other cases, within 6 months or within 12 months for epileptic disorders, the buyer can bring the matter before a jury of physicians agreed upon by both parties. If the seller loses the case and is an expert, they must pay twice the price. If the seller is a private individual, the sale will be cancelled, and they must simply refund the buyer. If someone knowingly sells a murderer to another person who is aware of their character, there is no recourse. However, if the judges, who are the five youngest guardians of the law, determine that the purchaser was not aware, then the seller must pay three times the price and purify the buyer's house. When exchanging money or animals, both parties must guarantee that they are in good condition. As with other laws, a preamble should be included to cover all crimes of this nature. Adulteration is a form of falsehood that many people believe may be acceptable at certain times, but they do not specify when. The legislator will inform them that no one should invoke the gods when practicing deceit or fraud in word or deed. Swearing falsely without thinking of the gods being sworn upon or lying to superiors, such as elders, parents, spouses, or rulers, is considered an act against heaven. A traitor who cheats in the agora is considered a liar and perjurer, showing no respect for the name of God or the regulations of the magistrates. If, after hearing this, someone continues to be dishonest, they should be aware of the law. A seller cannot have two prices for the same item on the same day, nor can they exaggerate the qualities of their goods or offer to swear about them. If they break the law, any citizen over 30 years old can strike them. If a seller is found to be selling adulterated goods, the slave or medic who reports them will receive the goods. If a citizen brings such a charge and proves it, they must offer the goods in question to the gods of the Agora. If they fail to prove it, they will be dishonored. A seller caught selling adulterated goods will be deprived of the goods and receive a stripe for every drachma of their value. The wardens of the Agora and the guardians of the law should consult experienced individuals and establish regulations for the Agora. These regulations should be inscribed on a column in front of the court of the wardens of the Agora. As for the wardens of the city, enough has already been said. If any omissions in the law are discovered later, the wardens and guardians can make additions and have them inscribed on a column in front of the court of the wardens of the city. The next topic to be addressed is retail trades, which, when used properly, are beneficial as they bring equality and proportion to what is unequal. Money is the tool through which this is accomplished, and the shopkeeper, merchant, and hotelkeeper simply fulfill the needs and distribute the possessions of humanity. So why is there any dishonor associated with a beneficial occupation? Let us first consider the nature of the accusation and then determine if it can be refuted. What do you mean? Dear Clinias, there are few individuals who possess the natural talent and have been educated to the point where they can control their desire for wealth or who have modest wishes and prioritize moderation over accumulation. Most people believe that they can never have enough, and as a result, retail trade has become a source of shame. However, if noble men and women were to open shops and conduct business with integrity, then the perception would change, and retail traders would be seen as nurturing figures. In our time, traders go and settle in distant places, initially welcoming weary travelers, but eventually treating them as enemies and captives, only releasing them for a hefty ransom. This is what has tarnished the reputation of retail trade, and the legislator should address this issue. It has been said in the past that fighting against two opponents is difficult, and the two opponents I am referring to are wealth and poverty one corrupting individuals through luxury, the other depriving them of their sense of shame through misery. What solutions can a city find for this problem? First, minimize the number of retail traders as much as possible. Secondly, assign retail trade to a class of individuals whose corruption will not harm the state. Thirdly, restrain the arrogance and pettiness of retailers. Let us establish the following laws. 1. In the city of the magnets, none of the 5,040 citizens shall be a retailer or merchant, or provide services to private individuals who do not reciprocate, except for their fathers, mothers, grandparents, and generally their elders who are free citizens and whom they serve as free citizens. 
those who engage in ignoble pursuits may be accused of dishonoring their family and be placed in bondage for a year. If they offend again, they shall be bound for two years, and for each subsequent offense, their punishment shall be doubled. 2. Every retailer shall be a foreigner or medic. 3. The guardians of the law shall pay special attention to this segment of the community, as their occupation exposes them to unique temptations. They shall consult with experienced individuals to determine fair prices that will yield retailers a moderate profit and establish them. Where a person fails to fulfill their contract without any legal or other impediment, the case shall be brought before the court of the tribes if it is not resolved through arbitration. The class of artisans is dedicated to Hephaestus and Athena, and the makers of weapons to Ares and Athena. All of them, remembering that the gods are their ancestors, should be ashamed to deceive in their craft. If a person is lazy in completing their work and foolishly believes that their patron god will not punish them, they will be disciplined by the god, and the law will follow suit. Those who fail to fulfill their obligations shall pay the value of the work and complete it for free within a specified time frame. Like sellers, contractors are required by law to charge the fair value of their work. In a free city, art should be genuine, and artists must not take advantage of the ignorance of others. On the other hand, those who commission work and fail to pay the agreed amount dishonor Zeus and Athena and disrupt the bonds of society. If they do not pay on time, they shall pay double. Although interest is prohibited in other cases, the worker shall receive interest at the rate of one obel per month for every drachma, equivalent to 200% per year, after one year has passed. By the way, when speaking of craftsmen, we should note that if our military craftsmen perform their duties well, the state will commend those who honor them and criticize those who do not. However, the highest honor is reserved for those who obey the laws. Most transactions between individuals are now regulated, except for those involving orphans and guardianships. This leads us to discuss the intentions of the deceased, for which we must establish regulations. I say must because individuals cannot be allowed to dispose of their property as they please, in ways that contradict one another, as well as law and custom. But a dying person is a peculiar being and not easily managed, they want to have complete control over everything they possess and are prone to using angry words. They may say, can I not do as I please with my own property, giving much to my friends and little to my enemies? There is some reason in that. O Clinias, in my opinion, the ancient lawmakers were too compassionate and lacked insight into human affairs. They were too quick to heed the pleas of a dying person, which led them to grant absolute power of bequest. But I would say to them, O mortal, you do not know what truly belongs to you or even yourself. You and your property are not solely yours, but belong to your entire family, past and future, and both property and family belong to the state. Therefore, I must take away from you the responsibility of what you leave behind, for the benefit of all. And I hope that you will not argue with us, now that you are going the way of all mankind, we will do our best for you and your family when you are no longer here. Let this be our address to the living and dying, and let the law be as follows, the father who has sons shall appoint one of them to be the heir of the lot, and if he has given any other son to be adopted by another, the adoption shall also be recorded and if he still has a son who has no lot, and has a chance of going to a colony, he may give him what he has more than the lot, or if he has more than one son unprovided for, he may divide the money between them. A son who has a house of his own, and a daughter who is engaged, are not to share in the bequest of money, and the child who, having inherited one lot, acquires another, is to bequeath the new inheritance to the next of kin. If a man only has daughters, he may adopt the husband of any one of them, or if he has lost a son, let him make mention of the circumstance in his will and adopt another. If he has no children, he may give away a tenth of his acquired property to whomever he likes, but he must adopt an heir to inherit the lot and may leave the remainder to him. Also, he may appoint guardians for his children, or if he dies without appointing them or without making a will, the closest relatives, two on the father's side and two on the mother's side and one friend of the departed, shall be appointed guardians. The fifteen eldest guardians of the law are to have special charge of all orphans, the whole number of fifteen being divided into groups of three, who will succeed one another according to seniority every year for five years. If a man dies without a will and leaves behind daughters, 
he must pardon the law which marries them for looking, first to kinship, and secondly to the preservation of the lot. The legislator cannot consider the character of the heir, which to the father is the first consideration. The law will therefore run as follows, if the deceased leaves behind daughters, husbands are to be found for them among their relatives according to the following table of affinity, first, their father's brothers, secondly, the sons of their father's brothers, thirdly, the sons of their father's sisters, fourthly, their great uncles, fifthly, the sons of a great uncle, sixthly, the sons of a great aunt. The relatives in such cases shall always be reckoned in this way, the relationship shall proceed upwards through siblings and brothers and sisters' children, and first the male line must be taken and then the female. If there is a dispute regarding the suitability of age for marriage, the judge shall decide, after having inspected the young man naked, and of the young woman naked down to the waist. If the young woman has no relatives within the degree of third cousin, she may choose whom she likes, with the consent of her guardians, or she may even select someone who has gone to a colony, and he, if he is a relative, will take the lot by law, if not, he must have her guardian's consent, as well as hers. When a man dies without children and without a will, let a young man and a young woman go forth from the family and take up their abode in the desolate house. The woman shall be selected from the relatives in the following order of succession, first, a sister of the deceased, second, a brother's daughter, third, a sister's daughter, fourth, a father's sister, fifth, a daughter of a father's brother, sixth, a daughter of a father's sister. For the man, the same order shall be observed as in the preceding case. The legislator foresees that laws of this kind will sometimes be burdensome, and that his intention cannot always be fulfilled, for example, when there are mental and physical defects in the individuals who are required to marry. But he must be excused for not always being able to reconcile the general principles of public interest with the circumstances of individuals, and he is willing to allow, in the same way, that the individual cannot always do what the lawgiver wishes. And then arbitrators must be chosen, who will fairly decide the cases that may arise under the law, for example, a wealthy cousin may sometimes desire a more prestigious match, or the requirements of the law can only be fulfilled by marrying a mentally unstable woman. To address such cases, let the following law be enacted, if anyone comes forward and says that the lawgiver, had he been alive, would not have required the enforcement of the law in a particular case, let him go to the fifteen eldest guardians of the law who have the care of orphans, but if he thinks that too much power is given to them, he may bring the case before the court of select judges. Thus, orphans will have a second chance. In order to make their unfortunate condition as bearable as possible, the guardians of the law shall act as their parents and shall be instructed to take care of them. And what instruction can be more appropriate than the assurance which we previously gave, that the souls of the dead watch over mortal affairs? There are many ancient traditions about this, which may be accepted as true from the legislator. Let men fear, first and foremost, the gods above, secondly, the souls of the departed, who naturally care for their own descendants, thirdly, the elderly living, who are quick to hear of any neglect of family duties, especially in the case of orphans. For they are the most sacred and cherished of all responsibilities, and the special concern of guardians and magistrates, and those who strive to raise them well will contribute to their own well-being and to that of their families. Whoever pays attention to the introduction of the law will never understand the seriousness of the lawmaker. However, those who disobey and harm an orphan will face double the punishment they would have received if the parents were alive. We could have made more laws about orphans but we assume that the guardians have their own children and property that are protected by the laws. In our state, the duty of the guardian is the same as that of a father, although their honor or disgrace is greater. However, a legal warning and threat can be useful. The guardian of the orphan and the guardian of the law who oversees them should love the orphan as if they were their own children and take better care of their property than their own. If the guardian neglects their duty, the guardian of the law can find them. The guardian can also have the magistrate tried for neglect in the court of select judges, and if convicted, the magistrate will have to pay double the penalty. Furthermore, if the guardian of the orphan is careless or dishonest, they can be fined four times the penalty on the information of any citizen, with half of the fine going to the orphan and half to the prosecutor of the case. When the orphan comes of age, if they feel they have been mistreated, they can bring their guardian to trial within five years 
and the court will determine the penalty. If the magistrate has neglected the orphan, they will have to pay damages. If they have defrauded the orphan, they will have to make compensation and be removed from their position as guardian of the law. In cases where irreconcilable differences arise between fathers and sons, the father may want to disown his son, or the son may accuse his father of being mentally unfit. Such drastic separations only occur when the family is a bad lot. If only one of the parties is at fault, the differences do not escalate to such a degree. However, a difficulty arises here. In any other state, a disinherited son does not cease to be a citizen, but in our state, he does. This is because the number of citizens cannot exceed 5040. Therefore, someone who is to suffer such a penalty should be renounced not only by their father but by the entire family. The law should state the following, if a man's unfortunate circumstances or temperament incline him to disinherit his son, he should not do so lightly or impulsively. Instead, he should gather a council of his own relatives and the maternal relatives of his son and present to them the reasons for disinheriting him, allowing his son to respond. If more than half of the male and female relatives, who are of legal age, condemn the son, he will be disinherited. If any other citizen wishes to adopt him, they may do so, as young people's characters often change over time. But if, after ten years, he remains unadopted, he will be sent to a colony. If a man becomes mentally unstable due to illness, old age, or a bad disposition, and he is causing harm to his household and property, and his son is unsure about accusing him of insanity, he should present the case to the eldest guardians of the law and consult with them. If they advise him to proceed, and it is determined that the father is mentally unfit, he will no longer have control over his property and will live in the household as if he were a child. In cases where a man and his wife have incompatible temperaments, ten guardians of the law and ten matrons who regulate marriage will intervene and attempt to reconcile them. If, however, their strong-willed natures cannot be pacified, the wife may seek a new husband, and the husband may seek a new wife. Presumably, they are not very gentle individuals and should therefore be matched with milder personalities. The younger individuals who are separated should choose their partners with the intention of having children, while the older individuals should seek companions for their later years. If a woman dies, leaving behind male or female children, the law will advise, but not require, the widower to refrain from remarrying. However, if she leaves no children, he will be compelled to marry. Similarly, if a widow is not old enough to live honestly without marriage, she should remarry. And if she has no children, she should marry for the sake of potential children. There is sometimes uncertainty about which parent the offspring should follow. In unions between a female slave and a male slave, or between a female slave and a formerly enslaved person or free man, or between a free woman and a male slave, the offspring belongs to the master. However, if the master or mistress is the parent of the child, both the slave and the child are to be sent away to another land. Regarding the duty to parents, the introduction should state the following, we honor the gods through their lifeless statues and believe that by doing so, we appease them. But someone who has an elderly father or mother has a living representation of the gods, which, if cherished, will bring them far more benefits than any statue. What do you mean by cherishing them? I will tell you. Oedipus, Amenter, and Theseus cursed their children, and their curses came true. This proves that the gods hear the curses of wronged parents. And should we doubt that they also hear and fulfill their blessings? Certainly not. As we were saying, no statue is more honored by the gods than an elderly father and mother. When honor is shown to them, the god who hears their prayers is pleased, and their influence is greater than that of a lifeless statue. They pray for good or evil to come to us in proportion to the honor or dishonor we show them, but a statue remains silent. Excellent. Good people are happy when their parents live to an incredibly old age, or if they pass away early, they mourn their loss. However, to bad people, their parents are always dreadful. Therefore, let everyone honor their parents. And if this introduction fails to influence someone, let them hear the law. If anyone does not take proper care of their parents, the aggrieved person should inform the three oldest guardians of the law and three women involved in marriages. Women up to the age of 40 and men up to the age of 30 who commit this offense shall be beaten and imprisoned. 
After that age, they will be brought before a court composed of the oldest citizens, who may impose any punishment they see fit. If the injured party cannot inform the authorities, any free person who hears of the case should inform them. If a slave does so, they shall be set free. If the slave belongs to one of the parties involved, they shall be set free by the magistrate. If the slave belongs to someone else, the state shall bear the cost of their freedom. The magistrates must ensure that the slave is not wronged by anyone out of revenge. The harm caused using poisons can be divided into two types, one affects the body using drugs and potions, while the other affects the mind through sorcery and magic. Fatal cases of both types have already been mentioned, and now we need a law regarding cases that are not fatal. There is no point in arguing with someone whose mind is disturbed by wax and images placed at their own door, or on the grave of their father or mother, or at a crossroads. However, we must address the wizards themselves with a serious introduction, asking them not to treat the world as if they were children. They should not force the legislator to expose them and show people that poisoners who are not physicians and wizards who are not prophets or diviners are equally ignorant of what they are doing. The law shall be as follows. If someone causes harm to another person or their servants using poison, whether fatal or not, and if they are a physician, they shall be punished with death. If they are not a physician, they shall receive the punishment determined by the court. If someone harms another person through sorcery, and if they are a diviner or prophet, they shall be put to death. If they are not a diviner, the court shall decide what they should pay or suffer. Anyone who harms another person through theft or violence shall pay damages at least equal to the harm caused. In addition to compensation, a suitable punishment shall be imposed. A foolish young person who is the victim of others shall receive a lighter punishment, while someone whose foolishness is caused by their own jealousy, desire, or anger shall be punished more severely. Punishment is not for the sake of revenge, as what is done cannot be undone, but for the purpose of prevention and reformation. There should be a proportion between the punishment and the crime, in which the judge, with some discretion, must estimate the severity of the crime and support the legislator, who provides the framework for the judge to follow. A person who is mentally ill should not roam freely in the city but should be taken care of by their relatives. Neglect on the part of the relatives shall be punished with a fine of 100 drachmas for the highest class, and proportionally for the other classes. Madness can take various forms. In addition to madness caused by illness, there is madness that arises from a passionate temperament, causing people to use foul and abusive language when quarreling with each other. This is unacceptable in a well-organized state. Therefore, our law shall be as follows, no one is allowed to speak ill of another person. When people have differing opinions, they should educate each other without speaking ill. No one should try to provoke the passions that education has calmed. Those who nurture their anger are likely to make vulgar jokes about their opponent, which results in a loss of character or dignity for themselves. For this reason, no one may use abusive language in a temple, during sacrifices, at games, or in any public gathering. Anyone who offends shall be reprimanded by the appropriate magistrate. If the magistrate fails to reprimand them, they shall not be considered virtuous. In any other place, an angry person who indulges in insults, whether they started the quarrel or not, may be disciplined by an elder. The person who insults is always trying to make their opponent look ridiculous, and we cannot allow the use of ridicule and anger. We forbid comic poets from ridiculing our citizens, under the penalty of being expelled from the country or fined three minae. Jokes that do not cause offense may be allowed, but the question of offense shall be determined by the director of education, who will be responsible for approving theatrical performances. In a well-organized city, a righteous person who is experiencing adversity shall not be allowed to starve. They should never be reduced to begging. Therefore, the law shall be as follows, there shall be no beggars in our state, and anyone who begs shall be expelled from both the town and the countryside by the magistrates. If a male or female slave causes harm to the property of another person who is not involved in the harm, the master shall compensate for the damage or surrender the offending slave. However, if the master argues that the accusation was made in collusion with the intention of obtaining the slave, they may put the plaintiff on trial for misconduct. If the master wins the case, they may recover twice the value of the slave from the plaintiff. 
If the master loses, they must compensate for the damage and surrender the slave. The harm caused by a horse or any other animal shall be compensated in the same way. A witness who refuses to come voluntarily may be summoned, and if they fail to appear, they shall be held responsible for any harm that may result. If they swear that they do not know, they may leave the court. A judge who is called upon as a witness must not vote. A woman who is free, and over the age of forty, may bear witness and argue her case. If she does not have a husband, she may also bring a legal action. A slave, whether male or female, and a child may only witness and argue in cases of murder, but they must provide sureties that they will appear at the trial if they are accused of giving false testimony. Such accusations must be made before the trial, and the accusation shall be sealed by both parties and kept by the magistrates until the trial for perjury takes place. If a person is convicted of perjury twice, they are not to be required to bear witness, and if they are convicted three times, they are not to be allowed to bear witness. If they persist in bearing witness, they shall be punished with death. When more than half of the evidence is proven to be false, there must be a new trial. The best and noblest things in human life are susceptible to being defiled and perverted. Is not justice the civilizer of mankind? And yet, the noble profession of the advocate has acquired a bad reputation. They are said to make the worst cause appear better, and only require money in return for their services. Such an art will be prohibited by the legislator, and if it exists among us, it will be requested to leave for another city. To those who disobey, let the voice of the law be heard saying, anyone who tries to pervert justice in the minds of the judges, or to increase litigation, shall be brought before the Supreme Court. If they do so out of contentiousness, they shall be silenced for a time, and if they offend again, they shall be put to death. If they have acted out of a love of gain, they shall be expelled from the country if they are foreigners, or if they are citizens, they shall be put to death. Book 12. If a false message is taken to or brought from other states, whether friendly or hostile, by ambassadors or heralds, they shall be charged with dishonoring their sacred office, and if convicted, they shall suffer a penalty. Stealing is mean, robbery is shameless. Let no one deceive themselves by the supposed example of the gods, for no god or son of a god ever truly practiced either force or fraud. On this point, the legislator is better informed than all the poets combined. Those who listen to him shall be forever happy, but those who refuse to listen shall be subject to the following law. Anyone who steals much or steals little of public property deserves the same penalty, for they are both driven by the same evil motive. When the law punishes one person more leniently than another, it is not because they are less guilty, but because they are more curable. Now, a thief who is a foreigner or a slave may be curable, but a thief who is a citizen and has had the advantages of education should be put to death, for they are incurable. Much consideration and many regulations are necessary regarding military expeditions. The most important principle of all is that no one, whether male or female, in war or peace, in important matters or small, shall be without a commander. Whether men are standing or walking, drilling, or pursuing, retreating, or washing, or eating, they should all act together and obey orders. We should practice the habits of command and obedience from our youth. All dances, relaxations, endurance of food and drink, cold and heat, and hard beds should have a view towards war, and care should be taken not to destroy the natural covering and use of the head and feet by wearing shoes and caps, for the head is the ruler of the body, and the feet are the best servants. The soldier should have thoughts like these and let them hear the law, anyone who is enlisted shall serve, and if they absent themselves without leave, they shall be charged with failure of service before their own branch of the army when the expedition returns. If they are found guilty, they shall suffer the penalty determined by the courts and never be allowed to compete for any valorous prize or accuse another of misconduct in military matters. Desertion shall also be tried and punished in the same manner. After the courts for trying failure of service and desertion have been held, the general shall hold another court, in which the different branches of the service will award prizes for the just concluded expedition. The prize shall be a crown of olive, which the victor shall offer at the temple of their favorite war god. In any lawsuit that a person brings, let the indictment be strictly true, for justice is an honorable maiden, to whom falsehood is naturally detestable. 
For example, when men are prosecuted for having lost their weapons, great care should be taken by the witnesses to distinguish between cases in which they have been lost out of necessity and out of cowardice. If the hero Patroclus had not been killed but had been brought back alive from the battlefield, he might have been reproached for having lost the divine armor. And a person may lose their weapons in a storm at sea, or from a fall, and under many other circumstances. There is a distinction in language to be observed in the use of the two terms, thrower away of a shield, ripsaspis, and loser of weapons, apobolius oplon, one being the voluntary, the other the involuntary relinquishment of them. Let the law then be as follows, if anyone is captured by the enemy while armed and willingly abandons their weapons, choosing a dishonorable life over an honorable death, let justice be served. The ancient tale of Cenius, who was transformed by Poseidon from a woman into a man, can teach us the appropriate punishment in this case. Let the person who throws away their shield be transformed from a man into a woman, meaning they will be kept out of harm's way for the rest of their life and never be allowed to serve in any army again. Additionally, they should be fined heavily based on their social class. Any commander who allows them to serve should also be punished with a fine. All magistrates, regardless of their term in office, must be held accountable for their actions. However, it is difficult to find a magistrate who is worthy of overseeing them and investigating their shortcomings and corrupt practices. The examiner must be more than human. Who can fulfill this role? The truth is that there are many reasons why states fall apart. Like ships or animals, they have easily weakened cords, beams, and sinews. Nothing contributes more to their well-being and preservation than the supervision of examiners who are superior to the magistrates. Without this, states crumble and disintegrate into many separate entities instead of remaining unified. Therefore, let the people gather after the summer solstice in the precincts of Apollo and the sun, and appoint three individuals who are at least fifty years old. The process shall proceed as follows, each citizen shall choose someone other than themselves whom they believe to be the best. The selected individuals shall be reduced by half if they are an even number, keeping those with the most votes. If the number is odd, the person with the fewest votes shall be eliminated first. The voting shall continue in the same manner until only three individuals remain. If the number of votes for these three is equal, a lottery shall determine their ranking as first, second, and third. These three individuals shall be crowned with an olive wreath and it shall be proclaimed that the city of the magnets, saved once again by the gods, presents her three finest individuals to Apollo and the sun, dedicating them if their lives align with the judgment made of them. In the first year of their office, they shall choose twelve examiners who will serve until they reach the age of seventy-five. Afterward, three new examiners shall be added each year. While in office, they shall reside within the precinct of the god. They shall divide all the magistracies into twelve classes and have the authority to conduct any investigations and impose any punishments they deem necessary. They may act individually in some cases and collectively in others, announcing the acquittal or punishment of a magistrate on a tablet placed in the agora. A magistrate who has been condemned by the examiners may appeal to the select judges. If they win their case, they may then prosecute the examiners. However, if the appellant loses, their punishment shall be doubled unless they were previously sentenced to death. What honors shall be bestowed upon these examiners, whom the entire state deems worthy of the rewards of virtue? They shall have the highest position at all sacrifices, ceremonies, assemblies, and public places. They shall go on sacred missions and have the exclusive privilege of wearing a laurel crown. They are the priests of Apollo and the sun, and the one among them who is judged first shall be the high priest and give their name to the year. Their burial shall also differ from that of other citizens. They shall be dressed in white for their funeral, and instead of mournful cries, a chorus of fifteen boys and fifteen girls shall stand around the bier, singing hymns in honor of the deceased and alternating verses throughout the entire day. At dawn, a group of one hundred young men shall carry the bier to the grave, dressed as warriors, with the boys singing their national hymn in front of the bier, followed by the girls and women who can no longer bear children. Priests and priestesses may also join the procession unless the Pythian oracle prohibits it. The tomb shall be an underground vault that will last forever, with stone couches placed side by side. 
the departed individual shall be placed on one of these couches, and then the tomb shall be covered with a mound and trees planted on every side except one, where an opening shall be left for future burials. Every year, there shall be games, whether musical, athletic, or equestrian, in honor of those who have successfully passed all the trials. However, if any of them, after being acquitted on any occasion, begin to display the wickedness of human nature, anyone who wishes may bring them to trial before a court composed of the guardians of the law, the select judges, and any of the examiners who are still alive. If they are convicted, they shall be stripped of their honors. If the accuser does not receive at least one-fifth of the votes, they shall pay a fine based on their social class. The judgment of Radamanthus, which relied on the belief in gods, is suitable for ages of faith but not for our time. Radamanthus knew that his contemporaries believed in the gods, as many of them were the offspring of gods. He believed that the easiest and most reliable way to resolve disputes was to leave the decision to the divine. In our era, people either deny the existence of gods or their concern for humanity, or they believe that gods can be influenced by flattery and gifts. Therefore, Radamanthus' approach would be outdated. When the religious beliefs of humanity change, their laws should also change. Thus, oaths should no longer be required from the plaintiff and defendant, instead, simple statements of affirmation and denial should be used. It is dreadful to think that nearly half of the citizens of a state are perjurers. There is no objection to an oath when a person has no interest in lying, such as when a judge is about to give a decision, or when voting in an election, or in the judgment of games and contests. However, when there is a risk of perjury, oaths and curses should be prohibited as irrelevant, like appeals to emotion. Let the principles of justice be learned and taught without using words of ill omen. The oaths of a stranger against another stranger may be allowed because strangers are not allowed to become permanent residents in our state. Private disputes should be decided in the same way as minor offenses against the state. Non-attendance at a chorus or sacrifice, or failure to pay a war tax, may be considered as initially fixable, and the defaulter may provide security. But if the security is forfeited, the pledged goods shall be sold, and the money given to the state. For persistent disobedience, the magistrate shall have the power to impose greater penalties. A city that lacks trade or commerce must consider what to do about its own people traveling abroad and the admission of strangers. Interacting with strangers can lead to a great confusion of customs, which may not be significant in most states because the confusion already exists. However, in a well-organized state, it can be a great evil. Yet, it is impossible to completely prohibit foreign travel or exclude strangers, as it would appear barbaric to the rest of the world. Public opinion should never be taken lightly, as the majority is not as wrong in their judgments as they are in their actions. Even the worst of people often have a divine instinct that allows them to distinguish between good and bad. States are wise when they desire to be praised by people, and the greatest and truest praise is that of virtue. Our Cretan colony should, and probably will, have a reputation for virtue that few cities possess. Therefore, let this be our law regarding foreign travel and the reception of strangers. No one under the age of 40 shall be allowed to leave the country, except for military service abroad. Only those in a public capacity may travel at all. The fairest, best, and bravest shall be sent to the Olympic, Pythian, Nemean, and Isthmian games to uphold the dignity of the city during times of peace. When they return, they shall teach the youth the inferiority of all other forms of government. In addition to those who go on sacred missions, other individuals shall be sent out with the permission of the guardians to study the institutions of foreign countries. A people who lacks experience and knowledge of human character and reason, and who lives solely by habit, can never be fully civilized. Furthermore, in all states, both good and bad, there are holy and inspired individuals. The citizen of a well-ordered city should actively seek out these individuals, traveling over land and sea, to strengthen the good institutions of their own state and improve the bad ones. How can this be accomplished? Firstly, the visitor of foreign countries should be between 50 and 60 years old and should be a respected citizen, especially in military matters. Upon their return, they shall appear before the Nocturnal Council, a body that meets from dawn to sunrise. 
This council includes the priests who have demonstrated virtue, the ten oldest guardians of the law, the director, and former directors of education, and each of them may bring a younger friend between the ages of thirty and forty. This assembly shall discuss the laws of their own and other states and gather information about them. Anything approved by the elder members of the council shall be diligently studied by the younger members, who will be closely observed by the rest of the citizens. They shall receive honor if they deserve it or dishonor if they prove inferior. This assembly is where the visitor of foreign countries shall come and share anything they have heard from others during their travels or observe themselves. If they are not made better or worse by their experiences, they should at least be praised for their enthusiasm. If they are improved, they should receive even more praise and special honor after death. However, if they are negatively influenced by their travels and attempt to introduce changes to education and the laws, they should be put to death. Next, regarding the reception of strangers, there are four categories. First, there are merchants who, like migratory birds, come to the city at a certain time of year to display their goods. These merchants should be received in markets and public buildings outside the city by appropriate officials who will ensure justice is served and guard against any political motives they may have. Only necessary interactions should take place with them. Secondly, there are visitors who come for festivals. They should be hosted by hospitable individuals at the temples for a reasonable amount of time, and the priests and ministers of the temples should take care of them. In small cases brought by or against them, the priests shall serve as judges. However, in more important cases, the wardens of the marketplace shall be the judges. Additionally, there are ambassadors from foreign countries who should be received with honor by the generals and commanders. They should be placed under the care of the praetanes and the individuals with whom they are staying. There is also the philosophical traveler, who, like our own tourists, occasionally visits foreign countries to see what is unique and valuable. Like them, the traveler must be fifty years old. They should go to the homes of the wise and wealthy without invitation, to learn from them and share their own knowledge. These are the rules for missions to foreign countries and the reception of strangers. Let Zeus, the god of hospitality, be honored and let strangers not be excluded from meals and sacrifices, as they are in Egypt, or driven away by harsh proclamations, as they are in Sparta. Clear guarantees should be given in writing and witnessed by others. When the amount of money lent is less than a thousand drachmas, there should be three witnesses, when it is more, there should be five. Both the agent and the principal in a fraudulent sale should be equally responsible. If someone wants to search another person's house for something, they must swear that they expect to find it there. They should enter the house naked or wearing only one garment and no belt. The owner of the house should make all their possessions, both sealed and unsealed, available to the searcher. If the owner refuses, they should be liable for double the value of the property if it is found to be in their possession. If the owner is absent, the searcher may place seals on the sealed property and appoint guards. If the owner remains absent for more than five days, the searcher should involve the magistrates. They should open the sealed property in the presence of the magistrates and seal it again. Disputes over the recovery of goods, except for land and houses, which cannot be disputed in our state, should be barred by a certain amount of time. The public and unchallenged use of something for a year in the city, or five years in the country, or the private possession and domestic use for three years in the city, or ten years in the country, should establish ownership rights. However, if the possessor has the property in a foreign country, there should be no time limit. Any trial in which the parties or witnesses, whether they are slaves or free individuals, have been prevented from attending by violence should be considered invalid. If a slave is prevented, the lawsuit should be invalid. If a free person is prevented, the person guilty of the violence should be imprisoned for a year and be liable for a kidnapping charge. If one competitor forcibly prevents another from attending a competition, the prevented competitor may be declared the victor in the temples, and the first competitor, whether they are the victor or not, should be liable for damages. The receiver of stolen goods should face the same punishment as the thief. The receiver of an exile should be punished with death. A person should have the same friends and enemies as their country. Anyone who makes war or peace for themselves should be put to death. 
if a faction within the state makes war or peace, their leaders should be indicted by the generals and, if convicted, put to death. The ministers and officers of a country should not accept gifts, even as a reward for good deeds. Anyone who disobeys this rule should die. To taxation, a person's property and income should be assessed. The government may choose to levy the tax based on the annual income or take a portion of the total value. A good person should offer moderate gifts to the gods. They cannot offer their land or hearth since they are already consecrated to all gods. Gold and silver, which can arouse envy, and ivory, which comes from the dead body of an animal, are not suitable offerings. Iron and brass are materials used for war. A single piece of wood or stone may be offered, as well as woven work that took one woman no more than a month to make. The color white is acceptable to the gods. Figures of birds and similar offerings are the best gifts, but they should be something that a painter can complete in a day. Moving on to lawsuits, judges, or rather arbitrators, may be agreed upon by the plaintiff and defendant. If no decision is reached, their fellow tribesmen should serve as judges. At this stage, the penalty should increase. If the defendant loses, they should pay a fifth more than the damages claimed. If they persist and appeal a second time, the case should be heard before select judges. If the defendant is defeated, they should pay the penalty plus half as much again. If the plaintiff is defeated on the first appeal, they should pay one-fifth of the damages claimed. If they are defeated on the second appeal, they should pay half. Other matters related to trials, such as assigning judges to courts, determining sitting times, the number of judges, and the procedures for pleading and conducting the trial, can be determined by younger legislators. These are the rules for private courts. As for public courts, many states have excellent procedures that can serve as models. These procedures should be tested through experience and then ratified and made permanent by us. The judge should be knowledgeable in the laws. They should possess writings about the laws and study them. Laws are the highest means of intellectual improvement and derive their name from the mind. They provide a standard for all criticism and praise, whether in verse or prose, in conversation or in books. They serve as an antidote to the fuel disputes and blind acceptance of opinions among people. The fair judge, who embodies their spirit, upholds the city and himself. He establishes justice for the good and reforms the behavior of the bad, if they can be reformed. However, he pronounces death, the only remedy, for those who are incurable, whose lives cannot be turned around. After the legal proceedings of the year are completed, execution is to follow. The court is to award the plaintiff the defendant's property, if the defendant is found guilty, except for their plot of land. If the plaintiff is not satisfied within a month, the court shall give the defendant's property to the plaintiff. If the defendant fails to pay even a drachma, they shall lose the benefits and protection of the court. If they rebel against the authority of the court, they shall be brought before the guardians of the law, and if found guilty, they shall be put to death. When a person is born, educated, begets, and raises children, and goes to court, they fulfill their natural duty. The rituals to be performed after death in honor of the gods above and below shall be determined by the interpreters. The deceased shall be buried in uncultivated places, where they will be out of the way and cause the least harm to the living. No one, whether in life or after death, has the right to deprive others of the sustenance provided by Mother Earth. No burial mound shall be piled higher than what five men can raise in five days, and the gravestone shall not be larger than necessary to contain an inscription of four heroic verses. The deceased shall only be exposed for three days, which is sufficient time to confirm their death. The legislator will teach the people that the body is a mere shadow or image, and that the soul, which is our true essence, has gone to give an account of itself before the gods below. When they hear this, the good are filled with hope, and the evil are terrified. It is also said that not much can be done for anyone after death. Therefore, while alive, everyone should be helped by their relatives to live justly and holily, so that they may depart in peace. When a person loses a son or a brother, they should consider that the loved one has gone away to fulfill their destiny in another place and should not waste money on their lifeless remains. The law shall prescribe a moderate funeral cost of five minae for the first class, three for the second, 
two for the third, and one for the fourth. One of the guardians of the law, chosen by the relatives, shall assist them in settling the affairs of the deceased. It would be impolite to dictate whether there should or should not be mourning for the dead. However, if mourning is observed, it shall be confined to the house, there shall be no processions in the streets, and the dead body shall be taken out of the city before daybreak. Regulations regarding other forms of burial and the non-burial of parasites and other sacrilegious individuals have already been established. The work of legislation is nearly complete, its goal will be achieved when we have ensured the continuation of the state. Do you remember the names of the fates? Lachesis, the distributor of lots, is the first, Clotho, the spinner, is the second, Atropus, the unchanging one, is the third and last, who makes the threads of the web irreversible. And we too want to make our laws irreversible, for their unchangeable quality will be the salvation of the state and the source of health and order in the bodies and souls of our citizens. But can such a quality be instilled? I believe that it can, and in any case, we must try, for it would be too ridiculous to have been constructing a structure without a foundation after all our labor. What foundation would you lay? We have already established an assembly composed of the ten oldest guardians of the law, as well as those who have received awards for virtue, and travelers who have gone abroad to study the laws of other countries. Additionally, each member shall choose a young man, at least thirty years old, to be approved by the rest. They shall meet at dawn when everyone is available. This assembly shall be an anchor for the state and provide the means for its permanence. Just as the head and soul are to a living being, constitutions of states also have their proper saviors. What do you mean? The mind and the soul, and sight and hearing in the head, or rather, the perfect union of mind and sense, can rightly be called the salvation of every individual. Certainly. Yes, but what is the nature of this union? In the case of a ship, for example, the senses of the sailors are combined with the intelligence of the pilot, and together they save the ship and the people on board. Similarly, the physician and the general have their respective goals, with the former aiming for health and the latter for victory. States also have their goals, and the ruler must understand both their nature and the means of achieving them, whether through laws or people. A state lacking this knowledge cannot be expected to act wisely when the time for action comes. Now, what class or institution in our state possesses such a saving power? I suspect you are referring to the Nocturnal Council. Yes, that council which is to embody all virtue and aim directly at the target. Absolutely true. It is not surprising that legislation in most states is inconsistent when considering the variety of their objectives. One state governs justice based on class, another aims for wealth, another for freedom or a combination of freedom and power, and some philosophers argue that one should seek all these objectives simultaneously. However, our objective is clearly virtue, which can be categorized into four types. Yes, and we stated that the mind is the primary and governing force behind the other three types of virtue and everything else. Indeed, Kleinias. Now that we have already identified the objective that is present in the mind of a pilot, a general, and a physician, let us now inquire about the objective of a statesman. Tell me, I ask. Just as the physician and general have told us their objective, what is the objective of a statesman? Can you tell me? We cannot. Did we not say that there are four virtues, courage, wisdom, and two others, all of which are referred to as virtue, and are, in a sense, one? Certainly, we did. The difficulty lies not in understanding the differences between the virtues, but in comprehending their unity. Why do we use two names? wisdom, and courage, to refer to virtue, which is a singular entity. The reason is that courage deals with fear and can be found in both children and animals, for a soul can possess courage without reason, but no soul has been or ever will be wise without reason. That is true. I have explained to you the distinction, and now you must explain to me the unity. But first, let us consider whether someone who knows the name of a thing without its definition truly possesses knowledge of it. Isn't such knowledge a disgrace for a sensible person, especially when it concerns great and noble truths? And can any subject be more deserving of the attention of our legislators than the four virtues we are discussing courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom? 
shouldn't the magistrates and officers of the state educate the citizens about the nature of virtue and vice, instead of leaving them to be taught by some random poet or sophist? A city that lacks education suffers the same fate as cities in our time. So, what should we do? How can we perfect the understanding of virtue in our guardians? How can we give our state direction and insight? Yes, but how do you apply the metaphor? The city will be the body or trunk, the best of our young men will ascend to the head or acropolis and be our eyes, they will observe and inform the elders, who represent the mind and utilize the younger men as their instruments. Together, they will save the state. Should this be our constitution, or should we abandon the idea of specialized training and educate everyone equally? That is impossible. Then let us strive to attain a more precise understanding of education. Didn't we say that the true artist or guardian should have an eye not only for the many, but also for the one, and should order all things with the one in mind? Perhaps so. Say rather, certainly so. And the rulers of our divine state should possess a thorough knowledge of the common principle and courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom, which is collectively referred to as virtue. Without knowing whether virtue is singular or multiple, we will hardly know what virtue truly is. Should we devise a method to instill this knowledge in our state, or should we give up on the matter? Anything but that. Let us begin by reaching an agreement. If we can. Well, don't we agree that our guardians should know not only the multiplicity of the good and the honorable, but also their unity? Yes, certainly. The true guardian of the laws should know their truth and should also be able to interpret and enforce them. He should. And is there any higher knowledge than the knowledge of the existence and power of the gods? The common people may be excused for following tradition, but the guardian must be able to provide a rationale for his faith. And there are two great proofs of religion, the priority of the soul and the order of the heavens. For no sensible person, when contemplating the universe, would be inclined to substitute necessity for reason and will. Those who argue that the sun and stars are lifeless entities are completely mistaken in their beliefs. The people of a previous generation had a suspicion, which has been confirmed by later thinkers, that inanimate objects could never achieve such scientific precision without the presence of a mind. Some, Anaxagoras, even dared to assert in those days that mind had arranged all things in the heavens, but they had no concept of the priority of mind. They turned the world, or rather themselves, upside down and filled the universe with stones, earth, and other lifeless bodies. This led to great impiety, and the poets made many foolish remarks against the philosophers, comparing them to yelping she-dogs and making other derogatory comments. No one can truly worship the gods today without believing that the soul is eternal and superior to the body, and that it governs all bodies. No one can truly worship the gods without recognizing the presence of mind in the stars. No one can truly worship the gods without understanding the connection between these things and music, and without harmonizing them with manners and laws, providing a rationale for things that are matters of reason. Anyone who is unable to acquire this knowledge, in addition to the ordinary virtues of a citizen, can only be a servant and not a ruler in the state. Let us then add another law stating that the nocturnal council shall be established as a guard for the protection of the state. Very good. Our aim will be to establish this, and I hope that others will assist us. Let us proceed in the direction that God seems to guide us. We cannot anticipate all the details that will be needed in the future, they must be determined through experience. What do you mean? First, we must create a register of all those who have the age, character, or education that would qualify them to be guardians. The subjects they need to learn, and the order in which they should learn them, are mysteries that cannot be explained in advance, but not mysteries in any other sense. If that is the case, what should be done? We must take a risk and share our views on education. Kleinias, as the founder of the Magnesian state, you should pay special attention to this matter. If we can establish the nocturnal council, we will entrust the city to its care, none of us here will hesitate about that. Our dream will then become a reality, and our citizens, if carefully chosen and well-educated, will be saviors and guardians unlike any the world has seen before. The lack of completeness in the laws becomes more apparent in the later books. 
there is less organization in them, and the transitions are more abrupt from one subject to another. However, they contain several noble passages, such as the prelude to the discourse concerning the honor and dishonor of parents, or the depiction of the dangers of friendly interaction between young men and women, or the comforting admonition addressed to the dying person regarding their right to do as they please with their possessions, or the excellent description of the burial of the dead. The topic of religion in Book X is introduced as a prelude to offenses against the gods, and this part of the work seems to be executed in Plato's best manner. In the last four books, several questions are raised for consideration, i. the detection and punishment of offenses, 2. the nature of voluntary and involuntary actions, 3. arguments against atheism and the belief that the gods have no concern for human affairs, 4. remarks on retail trade, v. the establishment of the nocturnal council. 1. A weak point in Plato's laws is the amount of intrusion into private life that will be carried out by the rulers. The magistrate will always be watching and intercepting the citizens. They will constantly receive information about improper conduct. Plato does not seem to realize that espionage can only have a negative effect. He has not yet discovered the boundary that separates the domain of law from that of morality or social life. People will not inform on each other, and the most honored citizen will not be the one who provides the most frequent information about offenders to the magistrates. As in some works of fiction, so too in philosophers, we can observe the influence of age. Plato becomes more conservative as he grows older, and he would govern the world entirely with men like himself, who are over fifty years old, for in them, he hopes to find a principle of stability. He does not realize that, in destroying freedom, he is also destroying the life of the state. By reducing all citizens to rules and measures, he would be depriving the Magnesian colony of those great men whose acquaintance is beyond all price, and he would find that even in the worst governed Hellenic state, there was more room for extraordinary genius and virtue than in his own. Plato clearly dislikes the Athenian courts, he prefers a few judges who play a leading role in trials rather than a large number who only listen in silence. He allows for two appeals, in each case with an increased penalty. Modern jurists would disapprove of justice being obtained only at an increasing risk, although indirectly, the burden of legal expenses, which seems to have been of little concern among the Athenians, has a similar effect. The love of litigation, which is as much a remnant of barbarism as a corruption of civilization and was inherent in the Athenian people, is reduced in the new state through the imposition of severe penalties. If persisted in, it is to be punished with death. In the laws, murder and homicide are not only crimes but also pollutions. From this perspective, the severity of such offenses tends to depend on accidental circumstances, such as the shedding of blood, rather than the actual guilt of the offender or the harm done to society. They are measured by the horror they evoke in a primitive age. For there is a superstition in law as well as in religion, and the sentiments of an early age have a traditional hold on most people. On the other hand, Plato does not endorse the cruelty of punishing the children for the sins of their fathers, and he understands punishment looks to the future, not the past. Compared to the penal codes of most European nations in the last century, his code, though sometimes arbitrary, is reasonable and humane. One flaw in Plato's criminal jurisprudence is his remission of punishment when the murderer has obtained the forgiveness of the victim as if crime were a personal matter between individuals and not an offense against the state there is an absurd imbalance in his punishments. Because a slave may rightfully receive a blow for stealing one fig or one bunch of grapes, or a tradesman for selling adulterated goods worth one drachma, it is quite unfair for the slave to receive as many blows as the number of grapes or figs he has taken, or for the tradesman who has sold adulterated goods worth a thousand drachmas to receive a thousand blows. Before punishment can be administered, the legislator must determine the nature of voluntary and involuntary actions. The question of free will, which has been extensively debated in modern times, was approached by both Plato and Aristotle from a judicial and sophistical perspective. They were perplexed by the different degrees and types of crimes, and they observed that the law only punishes harm inflicted by a voluntary agent on an involuntary recipient. In attempting to distinguish between harm and injury, Plato states that mere harm is not injury, but a benefit done with the wrong intentions can sometimes cause injury. 
he means to say that the disposition of the agent, whether good or evil, is what characterizes actions, and this cannot be adequately described by the terms voluntary and involuntary. It is possible to harm someone involuntarily without causing injury, and it is also possible to harm someone voluntarily, such as when inflicting punishment, without causing injury. However, if you harm someone out of greed, ambition, or cowardly fear, which is considered injury. Injustice is also described as the triumph of desire, passion, or self-conceit over reason, while justice is the subordination of these to reason. Plato is inclined to affirm that all injustice is involuntary in a paradoxical sense because no one would commit injustice if they knew it never paid off and could calculate the consequences of their actions. However, he also acknowledges that the distinction between voluntary and involuntary, understood in a different and more obvious sense, forms the basis of legislation. His conception of justice and injustice is complicated by the lack of a distinction between justice and virtue, the confusion between performing and experiencing justice, and the reluctance to abandon the old Socratic paradox that evil is involuntary. The laws are founded on religion and bear the mark of primitive legislation in this regard. They do not escape the almost inevitable consequence of penalizing irreligion. If laws are based on religion, the greatest offense against them must be irreligion. Hence, there is a need for what could be called persecution in modern language, although Plato would have had a different understanding of this term. However, Plato's spirit of persecution, unlike that of modern religious groups, arises from the desire to enforce a true and simple form of religion and is directed against superstitions that degrade humanity. Sir Thomas More, in his Utopia, advocates for tolerating everyone except the intolerant, although he would not promote those who do not believe in the immortality of the soul to high positions. Plato has not progressed as far as this in terms of tolerance. However, when assessing his enlightenment, we must remember that the evils of necromancy and divination were far greater than the evils of intolerance in the ancient world. Human nature always resorts to the former, but only falls into the latter when organized into some form of priesthood, although in primitive times as well as later ages, the institution of a priesthood may claim to be an advancement from some previous form of religion. The laws would have had a stronger foundation if Plato had clearly understood the difference between crime and sin or vice. This, like many other controversies, requires a clear definition, but such a definition belongs to a later age of philosophy. The arguments Plato uses for the existence of a god have a very modern character, the consensus of humanity and the argument of the self-moved, which has already been presented in the Phaedrus. The response to those who claim that God does not care is that he governs through general laws, and that he who takes care of the great will surely take care of the small. Plato did not feel, and did not attempt to consider, the difficulty of reconciling God's special and general providence. However, he is on the path to a solution when he regards the world, with all its parts working together towards the goal. It is surprising to find that the skepticism we attribute to young people in our own time already existed then, as seen in the Republic. The Epicureanism expressed in the line from Horace, Nam K. Deus Didici Securum Majera Evum, was already prevalent in Plato's time, and the fears of the afterlife were freely used to gain advantages over others in this life. The same objection that struck the psalmist, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, is believed to be at the root of the better kind of unbelief. The answer is essentially the same as what a modern theologian would offer, the ways of God in this world cannot be justified unless there is a future state of rewards and punishments. However, in Plato's view, this future state of rewards and punishments is not an addition of happiness or suffering imposed from outside, but the permanence of good and evil in the soul. In this aspect, he is ahead of many modern theologians. The Greeks also struggled with the existence of evil, which Plato briefly explains in one passage by attributing it to a good and evil spirit, deviating from his usual beliefs, compare Theot, statesman. This passage is also notable for contradicting the overall optimism of the tenth book, which states that all things are ordered by God for the best, instead suggesting that some things are influenced by a good spirit and others by an evil spirit. The Tenth Book of the Laws provides a depiction of Greek beliefs that closely resembles our own world. Plato attributes the disbelief in his time to several factors. Firstly, he blames the negative influence of mythological tales, 
which he disapproves of but is hesitant to completely banish, as seen in the Republic. Secondly, he criticizes the arrogance of a new generation of philosophers who claim that the sun, moon, and stars are merely earth and stones, and that the gods are created by the laws of the state. Thirdly, he observes the confusion in people's minds caused by misinterpreting the events of the world around them, as they do not always witness the righteous being rewarded and the wicked being punished. Similarly, in modern times, some people's disbelief stems from doubts about the inspiration of ancient writings, while others are led astray by scientific discoveries or the seemingly political nature of religion. There is also a third group who struggle with the difficulty of understanding why God allows certain things to happen. Plato is greatly disturbed by the impiety of some of his contemporaries, but before punishing them, he is determined to reason with them, viewing them as victims of these illusions. He offers a twofold response to the unbelievers, first, he argues that the soul predates the body, and second, he asserts that the ruler of the universe, being perfect, has created everything with the intention of achieving perfection. The challenges posed by ancient sacred writings were less significant in Plato's time compared to our own. We also have our own version of popular Epicureanism, which allows the world to continue as if there were no God. When belief in God, whether in ancient or modern times, begins to fade, people tend to relegate him to a distant heaven, either in theory or in practice. They prefer to forget him rather than explicitly deny him. Thus, the theory of the Epicureans becomes the general practice of mankind. We cannot claim to be free from the worst form of unbelief, which Plato rightly identifies as replacing true religion with superstition. A significant portion of Christians continue to believe that the justice of God can be swayed by offerings, whether it be the odor of fat and the sacrifice steaming to heaven or other forms of sacrifice placed on the altar, such as masses for the living and the dead, dispensations, church construction, rites, and ceremonies. They employ the same means used by the pagans, but with different names and forms. The indifference of Epicureanism and unbelief leads to the development of superstition in two ways, it permits and creates a necessity for its growth in religious and enthusiastic individuals. When people cannot have a rational belief, they turn to an irrational one. Consequently, the most superstitious countries are often the most unbelieving at a certain level of civilization, and a revolution in one direction is quickly followed by a reaction in the other. By reading between the lines of ancient history and philosophy, we can find parallels in the modern world, and vice versa. Whether we compare Greek philosophy to Christian religion or the practices of the Gentile world to those of the Christian world, the differences are more apparent in words than. The greater opposition between them seems to arise from comparing the ideals of one with the actions of the other. Against the errors of superstition and unbelief, Plato presents the simple and natural truth of religion. He believes that the best and highest, whether in the form of a person or a principle, such as the divine mind or the idea of good, serves as the foundation of human life. His faith or theology can be summarized as the belief that all things work together for good or evil in this world or another, where human actions are transferred. Unlike Socrates, he is completely free from superstition. To him, religion and morality are inseparable. He disapproves of heathen mythology, which, as he notes, was not tolerated in Crete and possibly not in Sparta either, although his words are not entirely clear. He does not encourage individual enthusiasm and believes that the establishment of religion can only be achieved by a great intellect. Like the Hebrews, he prohibits private rituals, as he seeks to avoid superstition. He suggests that all worship of the gods should take place in public temples, rather than people consecrating the events of their lives. He relies on human punishments rather than divine judgments, although he does not hesitate to repeat the old tradition that certain forms of dishonesty prevent a person from having a family. He believes that the ages of faith have passed and cannot be revived. However, he does not wish to eradicate the sentiment of religion, which he recognizes as common to all humans whether they are barbarians or Hellenes. He remarks that no one goes through life without eventually experiencing the power of religion. Additionally, it is worth noting that the greater the irreligion, the more intense the religious reaction often becomes. 
It is remarkable that Plato's description of the mind at the end of the law surpasses Anaxagoras and even Plato's own previous writings. Aristotle, in a well-known passage, Metaphysics, which echoes the Phaedo, comments on the inconsistency of Anaxagoras in introducing the agency of the mind while also resorting to other, likely material causes. However, Plato goes further and criticizes Anaxagoras for not denying the universal agency of the mind, but for denying its priority or eternity. Yet in the Timaeus, Plato himself acknowledges that God created the world from pre-existing materials. In the Statesman, he mentions the existence of evil seeds in the world, originating from a former chaos that cannot be eliminated. Even in the tenth book of the Laws, he admits the existence of two souls, one good and one evil. In the Mino, the Phaedrus, and the Phaedo, he speaks of the recovery of ideas from a previous state of existence. However, now he has reached a clearer understanding, he has discarded these notions. Through contemplating the priority of the human soul over the body, he has come to understand the nature of the soul itself. The power of the best, hinted at in the Phaedo and the Republic, now takes the form of intelligence or personhood, as seen in the Philebus. Unlike Anaxagoras, Plato no longer believes that the mind was introduced at a certain point in time to bring order to a pre-existing chaos. Instead, he sees the mind as prior to the chaos, eternal and constantly in motion, the source of order and intelligence in all things. This seems to be the final form of Plato's religious philosophy, which could be summarized as the starry heaven above and the moral law within, or perhaps more accurately, the starry heaven above and the mind prior to the world. The sections about retail trade, adulteration, and mendicity have a very modern character. Greek social life was more like our own than we might think. There was a similar division of social classes, the same aristocratic and democratic sentiments, and even in a democracy, a preference for land and agricultural pursuits. Plato can be considered the first advocate of free trade, as he prohibits the imposition of customs on imports and exports, although he was not fully aware of the significance of this principle. He attributes the disrepute of retail trade to the dishonest practices of traders and suggests that if a nobleman were to run a shop, which he hopes will never happen, retail trade might become honorable. However, he has not fully grasped the true reason for the discredit of retail trade, which lies in the essential distinction between buyers and sellers, with one class being dependent on the other to some extent. When he proposes to set prices that would allow for a moderate profit and regulate trade in various minute details, we must remember that this is not as absurd in a city of 5,040 citizens, where almost everyone would know each other, as it would be in our much larger population. In our own society, we do not allow every individual to charge whatever they please for many things, the prices of many goods are fixed by law. We often hear of wages being adjusted in proportion to employers' profits. The objection to regulating prices by law and thus avoiding the conflicts that continually arise between buyers and sellers of labor is not so much the undesirability of doing so, but rather the impossibility. Whenever free competition cannot be reconciled with social order or, as in the case of adulteration, with common honesty, the government may lawfully intervene. The only question is whether such intervention will be effective and whether the harm caused by interference may outweigh the harm it prevents. Plato suggests prohibiting beggars because in a well-ordered state, no good person would be left to starve. This prohibition could have been easily enforced in a small population. In our times, the problem of pauperism is much more difficult due to, one, the large numbers of people, two, the ease of mobility, and, three, the increasing compassion for human life and suffering. The only way to address this difficulty seems to be for modern nations to divide themselves into smaller communities with local knowledge, acting together in the spirit of ancient communities, like Aristotle's idea in politics. As a framework for a political system, Plato considers the laws to be a step down from the Republic, which was the ideal of his earlier years. He never imagines that he has reached a higher level of speculation. He is only descending to the level of human affairs, although he often returns to his original idea. Instead of the guardians of the Republic, who were the elder citizens, and all supposed to be philosophers, a special body is now proposed to review and amend the laws while preserving the spirit of the legislator. 
This body is the nocturnal council, who, although not specifically trained in dialectic, are not entirely ignorant of it, as they must understand the relationship between specific virtues and the general principle of virtue. Throughout the laws, Plato argues that temperance is superior to courage, peace is superior to war, and that the love of both must be part of the character of a good citizen. At the end, he summarizes this same idea in an abstract form. The true artist or guardian must be able to unify the many into the one, which, as he enthusiastically declares, is the most philosophical method ever devised by the wit of man, reminiscent of the Phaedrus or Philebus. However, the sense of unity and diversity can only be acquired through study, and Plato does not explain the nature of this study, which we can reasonably infer, although the word is curiously absent, to be like the dialectic of the Republic. The nocturnal council will consist of the priests who have achieved virtuous rewards, the ten oldest guardians of the law, and the current and former directors of education. Each member will choose a younger assistant for approval. The spectator, who is sent to visit foreign countries, will report to this council. The council is not an administrative body, but a gathering of wise individuals who will study legislation. Plato is open to changes in the law if experience shows them to be necessary, but he also wants to ensure that the original spirit of the Constitution is not forgotten. The laws of Plato represent the latest phase of his philosophy, showing both progress and regression in his views on life and the world. His theory of ideas in the next generation evolved into a theory of numbers, which we primarily learn about from Aristotle's metaphysics. The laws do not contain any traces of the speculative side of this theory, but Plato likely found practical value in applying number and measure to celestial movements and human life. However, the return to a doctrine of numbers represents a regression rather than an advancement, as the most barren logical abstraction is of a higher nature than number and figure. Philosophy is distant in the laws, confined to the members of the nocturnal council. The speculative truth that nourished the guardians in the republic is replaced by practical virtues for most citizens. The law, which is the written expression of the mind, replaces the spoken word of the philosopher. The state is founded on virtue and religion rather than knowledge, and virtue is no longer equated with knowledge but is understood in the common sense. However, there are both signs of progress and regression in the laws of Plato. The attempt to reconcile the ideal with real life is a step forward, as is the act of bringing philosophy down from heaven to earth, which can be attributed to both Plato and his teacher Socrates. The members of the nocturnal council are to continue studying the concept of unity and diversity and the nature of God. Education is the final concept with which Plato concludes the theory of the laws and begins the reality. Plato's increasing understanding of the challenges of human affairs and the element of chance that greatly influences them indicates not a narrower mind, but a more mature one that is more familiar with reality. It would be unfair to accuse him of lacking originality because he borrowed many provisions from Sparta and Athens. Laws and institutions arise from habits and customs, and they gain greater credibility and support if they have been passed down from antiquity rather than being mere literary inventions. Plato would be the first to acknowledge that the Book of Laws is not a product of his imagination, but a collection of regulations devised by inspired legislators like Minos, Lycurgus, and Solon to address the actual needs of people and have been proven effective over time. To fully understand the purpose of the work, it is necessary to examine how much of it is based on historical foundations and aligns with the actual laws of Sparta and Athens. The discussion of the historical aspect of the laws is reserved for this section. The writer has been greatly aided by the insightful essays of C.F. Hermann and J.B. Telfy in comparing the laws of Plato to the institutions of Crete and Sparta, as well as the laws and constitution of Athens. The laws of Plato are fundamentally Greek and do not contain any foreign or oriental elements, unlike Xenophon's Cyropedia. Their goal is to reconstruct the work of the great lawgivers of Greece in a literary form. They exhibit both Athenian and Spartan characteristics, with some provisions also borrowed from Crete and appropriately applied to a Cretan colony. However, our knowledge of Crete is limited, and the laws of Crete can only be compared to those of Sparta in one aspect, namely the communal meals. Most of Plato's provisions resemble the laws and customs of these three states, particularly the first two, which the Greeks attributed to Minos, Lycurgus, and Solon. 
A few details may have been borrowed from Seleucus and Karandas, who introduced laws against perjury and prohibited credit, respectively. Some provisions are Plato's own, inspired by his observations of flaws in the Athenian and other Greek states. The laws also include many minor provisions that are not found in typical legal codes because they cannot be precisely defined and are better left to custom and common sense. As Aristotle noted, the greater part of the work is taken up with laws, although this is not entirely true and applies more to the latter half of the work. The book is based on ethical and religious principles. The actual laws begin with I am praising the soul. Throughout the book, there is a recurring aspiration for the good, especially in books X, 11, 12, and whenever Plato discusses his highest themes. Plato prefaces most of his laws with an introduction that serves two purposes, to persuade and to threaten. These laws are meant to have the authority of legal statutes and the impact of sermons. In modern philosophical terms, Plato's book of laws can be seen as both an ethical and educational treatise, as well as a political and legal one. Although the laws incorporate elements from both Athens and Sparta, the borrowed elements differ significantly due to the contrasting nature and origins of the two governments. Sparta is more ancient and primitive, while Athens is suited to a more advanced stage of society. The relationship between the laws and the two states can be understood as follows. The foundation and overall structure of the work are more Spartan, while the specific details and elaborations are more Athenian. In Athens, the laws were written down and extensive, with over a thousand fragments collected by Telfi. Like Roman or English law, they contain numerous specific provisions. The Athenians were familiar with the laws that regulated daily life, as every citizen acted as their own lawyer and judge, deciding the rights of their fellow citizens based on the laws often after hearing arguments from the parties involved or their advocates. The invention of law, in the modern sense, is commonly attributed to Rome rather than Athens. However, it should be noted that even before the Twelve Tables, 451 BC, Athens had established regular courts and legal procedures, likely influenced by Greek colonies. It is reasonable to assume that many Roman institutions and customs, like Latin literature and mythology, were partly derived from Greece and had gradually spread from one side of the Ionian Sea to the other, particularly evident in the constitutions of Servius Tullius and Solon. There is no evidence to suggest that the laws of Sparta were written down in books or inscribed on marble or brass tablets in ancient times. It is also uncertain whether the Spartans would have been able to read them if they had been written. These laws were ancient customs, some of which predated the settlement in Laconia and whose origins are unknown. They occasionally received the endorsement of the Delphic Oracle, but their enforcement relied more on the necessity of self-defense, as the Spartans constantly lived in the presence of enemies. They belonged to an era when written law had not yet replaced custom and tradition. The old constitution was rarely affected by new enactments, which mainly concerned the duties of the kings or ephors, or the changing relationships between social classes over time. Consequently, there was a significant difference between the laws of Athens and Sparta. The Athenian laws were the product of a civilized state and did not differ in principle from modern legislation. On the other hand, the Spartan laws originated from an era in which people were held together and controlled by military force, and they retained many traces of their barbaric origins even as they evolved culturally. Nevertheless, the Spartan system represented the ideal of a primitive Greek state. According to Thucydides, it was the first to emerge from chaos and establish a stable government. It was essentially an army focused on military training for self-defense rather than conquest. The Spartans were not easily moved or excited, they were stoic, cautious, unambitious, and prone to procrastination. For many centuries, they maintained the same character that their legislator had impressed upon them. This unique system was partly a result of circumstances and partly the creation of an unknown individual in prehistoric times, whose educational ideal was military discipline. Through the force of his genius, he transformed a small tribe into a nation that became renowned in world history. The other Greeks marveled at the strength and stability of his work. Thucydides notes that the rest of Greece was more willing to undertake the colonization of Heraclea because they felt secure with the participation of the Spartans. 
In the early stages of history, the Spartan state appeared as a vision of armed men, unmatched by any other power in the world at that time. They had little understanding of the rights or duties between nations and lacked moral principles beyond patriotism and obedience to commanders. The Spartans were so trained to act collectively that they sacrificed the freedom and spontaneity of human life in favor of cultivating the qualities of soldiers and rulers. The Spartan state was a complex entity in which kings, nobles, citizens, perioesi, free non-citizens, artisans, and slaves had to find a way to coexist. All members of society were taught some form of military training. The strength of family bonds was weakened by enforced absences from home and communal meals. Sparta lacked vitality and growth, poetry and traditions of the past, art and intellectual pursuits. The Athenians, who emerged on the world stage centuries later, would have easily conquered Sparta if they had possessed the qualities that constituted the strength and weakness of their rival. The ideal of Athens is immortalized in the funeral oration attributed to Pericles by Thucydides. He compares the vibrant and enjoyable life in Athens with the rigid and serious lifestyle of the Spartans. The Athenians were versatile and adaptable, easily transitioning from land to sea and moving from place to place. They enjoyed their pleasures and yet, when it came time to fight, they were just as capable as the Spartans. Foreigners were welcome in Athens, and their ships reached the farthest shores, bringing wealth from all over the world. The Athenians had theaters and festivals, and they knew how to relax, but they were no less courageous or willing to sacrifice for their country than the Spartans. The Athenian way of life, as described by Thucydides, was a noble one, combining music and physical training, citizenship, and military service. Plato sought to infuse this spirit into his ideal state of Magnesia, along with the communal meals and discipline of Sparta. Both Athens and Sparta had deeply influenced Plato's thinking. He had heard of Sparta from afar, through common Hellenic fame, but he was a citizen of Athens, born into a noble family. He likely spent time in the law courts and may have had personal experience with the duties of the offices he is establishing. There is no need to question where he acquired his knowledge of Athenian laws, they were a part of his daily life. Many of his laws are recognized as Athenian laws, as evidenced by fragments preserved in the orators and elsewhere. More would likely be found to be Athenian laws if we had better information. It is possible that more Athenian laws would have been incorporated into the Magnesian Code if the work had been completed. However, the work has come down to us in a partially finished and unfinished form, with a beginning and end but lacking organization in the middle. The laws align with Plato's own description of them, comparing himself and his two friends to gatherers of stones with the creators of a composite work, who are gathering materials and partially assembling them, with some laws already fixed in place like stones while others are still lying about. Plato's own life coincided with Athens' rise to greatness and subsequent decline. He could not view the blessings of democracy in the same way as previous generations who did not witness the fall of Athens and only had the glories of Marathon, Salamis, and the rule of Pericles to look back on. On the other hand, the fame and prestige of Sparta, despite its many mistakes and crimes, had not completely faded by the end of Plato's life. Sparta was the only major Hellenic government that retained some semblance of its ancient form. Although the number of Spartan citizens had greatly diminished, she still held a certain authority and dominance until the rise of Thebes and Macedon, thanks to her final victory over Athens and the victories of Agesilaus in Asia Minor. Like Aristotle, Plato had in mind a moderate state that could avoid the pitfalls of both aristocracy and democracy. However, it is doubtful whether a legislator could create such a state although there have been historical examples of governments that maintain moderation for a time due to shared interests or origins, a balance of power within the state, or the fear of a common enemy. But in general, there comes a point in a state's history when the struggle between the few and the many must be resolved. No system of checks and balances, such as Plato proposes in the laws, could provide equilibrium and stability to an ancient state just as no legislator could withstand the tide of democracy in England or France in the past century or bring life to China or India. The foundation of the Magnesian constitution is the equal division of land. In the new state, as in the republic, there would be no poverty or wealth. 
every citizen would retain their allotted land and enough money for its cultivation, and no one would be allowed to accumulate property worth more than five times the value of their land. The equal division of land was a Spartan institution, not known to exist elsewhere in Greece. Its mention in Plato's Law suggests that it had ancient origins and was not introduced only during the reforms of Cleomenes III, as some have suggested. However, in Sparta, there were frequent complaints about the concentration of property in the hands of a few individuals, indicating that no provision was made for maintaining the equal division of land. Plutarch mentions a law introduced by the Ephor Epitadius shortly after the Peloponnesian War that allowed Spartans to sell their land, but Aristotle's references suggest that this issue had existed for much longer. In some countries, including Sparta, the initial equality among small landowners eventually gave way to inequality. Instead of a large middle class, there was likely even greater disparity in wealth among the citizens of Sparta than in any other Greek city-state. Plato recognized this danger and made improvements to the Spartan system. Like in Sparta, the land in Plato's ideal state would be worked by slaves, allowing the citizens to pursue other occupations. Groups of young men between the ages of 25 and 30 would embark on biennial journeys throughout the country. These men, along with their officers, would serve as magistrates, police, engineers, and administrators for the 12 districts of the colony. Their way of life can be compared to that of the Spartan secret police, known as the Cryptia, a term that Plato freely uses without any apparent awareness of the negative connotations associated with it in history. Plato also borrowed another significant institution from Sparta, or Crete, known as the Sicitia or Common Meals. These communal dining arrangements were established in both states, and Aristotle believed that they were better managed in Crete than in Sparta. In Plato's Laws, he appears to adopt the Cretan custom, which means that the state, rather than individuals, would cover the cost of the meals. This allowed members of the communal dining groups who could not afford their share to still retain their citizenship rights. However, this explanation contradicts the laws, which explicitly mentions contributions to the Sicitia from private estates. Plato goes further than the legislators of Sparta and Crete by proposing that women should also participate in the common meals. He aims to address the disorderly behavior of women in both states by subjecting them to the same military discipline already imposed on men. This extension of the Sicitia is something that ancient legislators hesitated to implement, and Plato himself acknowledges the difficulty of enforcing it. Like Sparta, Plato's new colony would not have walls, as he believed that a state should rely solely on the bravery of its citizens. Aristotle criticizes this notion as a fallacy or paradox unless it is seen as a poetic fancy. Plato also advocates for women to be ready to defend their country, encouraging them to arm themselves with shields and spears instead of seeking refuge in temples and altars. In his regulation of the Sicitia, property laws, and attempts to address the behavior of women, Plato demonstrates that while he draws inspiration from Spartan institutions and favors the Spartan way of life, he also seeks to improve upon them. Plato also adopts the Spartan aversion to the sea in his Magnesian state. However, he fails to consider that a non-maritime power would always be vulnerable to a maritime power that controls important trade routes. The Greeks, including the islanders and coastal cities, were compelled to develop naval forces due to their numerous islands, extensive coastlines, and conflicts with the Phoenicians, Carthaginians, and Persians. Plato's prejudice against the navy stemmed from his view that it nurtures democracy. Yet, he does not address how a city situated on an island, only 10 miles from the sea, with excellent harbors, could safely exist without one. Both the Spartans and the Magnesian colonists were prohibited from engaging in trade or commerce. To limit their interactions with foreign entities, they had their own currency. The Magnesians were only allowed to use the common Greek currency when traveling abroad, which required permission from the government. Like the Spartans, Plato feared the negative influences that could enter his state through foreign interactions. However, he also avoids the extreme exclusivity of Sparta and permits visitors of suitable age and rank from other states to come to his own. Similarly, he allows citizens of his state to travel to foreign countries and report back. Plato considers such international communication to be honorable and beneficial. Moving on to the Commonwealth of the Laws, 
there are more resemblances to the Athenian model than to Sparta. Comparing Plato's laws to those of Athens is easier because we have more knowledge about Athens than Sparta. Our understanding of Athenian law is still fragmentary, and it is derived from various sources. These sources include the orations of Anaphon, Andesides, Lysias, Isocrates, Demosthenes, Eschines, Lycurgus, and others, as well as works by Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, Plato, Aristotle, and later writers like Cicero, Plutarch, Alien, and Pausanias. Lexicographers such as Harpocration, Pollux, Hesychius, Suedas, and the compiler of the Etymologicum Magnum also contribute to our knowledge, although their writings span over 800 years, from the 2nd to the 10th century. 4. The Commentaries on Aristophanes, Plato, Demosthenes. 5. A Few Inscriptions. Our understanding of a subject derived from such diverse sources, most of which are of uncertain date and origin, is inherently precarious. No critic can distinguish the actual laws of Solon from those that were later attributed to him. Nor do the commentators and lexicographers attempt to determine how many of these laws were still in effect at the time they wrote, or when they became obsolete and could only be found in books. We cannot hastily assume that the regulations found in Plato's laws were also part of Athenian law, no matter how likely it may seem. There are two types of similarities between Plato's laws and those of Athens, I, in terms of institutions, and, two, in terms of minor regulations. 1. The overall character of the law's constitution bears a much closer resemblance to the Athenian constitution during Solon's time than to the one that followed, or the extreme democracy that prevailed in Plato's own era. Plato aimed to create a moderate state, distinct from a tyrannical regime like that of Syracuse or the rule of the Athenian assembly. He employed various means to instill moderation into the state. 1. The entire population was to be educated, while not all could be trained in philosophy, they were to acquire basic knowledge in music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. They were also to undergo military training, serving as archons and leaders. 2. The majority of them were, or had been at some point in their lives, magistrates, and thus possessed the experience gained from holding office. 3. Those who held the highest offices were to receive further education, not much inferior to that provided for the guardians in the Republic, although their studies were limited to the nature and divisions of virtue. Their philosophical education ended there. 4. The entire citizen body, 5,040 individuals, rarely, if ever, assembled, except for elections. The population was divided into four classes, each having the right to be represented by the same number of members in the council. This arrangement would result in giving the wealthier classes a disproportionate share of power, as they were likely to be fewer in number than the poorer classes. However, this tendency was mitigated by the complex system of selection through voting, prior to the final election by lot. The purpose of this system seems to be to allow the wealthy few to have the power to select from the many poor, and vice versa. 5. The most important body in the state was the Nocturnal Council, which was borrowed from the Areopagus in Athens, as it existed or was believed to have existed before Ephialtes and the Eumenides of Aeschylus, when its power was unimpaired. Plato appears to have faithfully copied the customs and procedures of the Areopagus in certain respects, both assemblies met at night. There was also a resemblance in more significant matters. Like the Areopagus, the Nocturnal Council was partly composed of magistrates and other state officials whose terms had expired. 7. The Constitution included several diverse and even opposing elements, such as the Assembly and the Nocturnal Council. 8. There was much less exclusivity compared to Sparta, the citizens were to take an interest in the governance of neighboring states and be aware of events in the rest of the world. All these factors served as moderating influences. A notable similarity between Athens and the constitution of the Magnesian colony is the use of the lot in the selection of judges and other magistrates. It is quite remarkable to us that such a method of election would be employed in any civilized state, or that Plato would transfer it to an ideal or imaginary one. Even the most extreme democracies in modern times have never considered leaving government entirely to chance. It is understandable that Socrates would mock it and ask, who would choose a pilot or carpenter or flute player by lot? Xenophon, Memorabilia. 
However, there were many reasons why this mode of selection was appealing to both the oligarch and the Democrat. 1. It seemed to acknowledge that all individuals were equal and that all members of the governing body, whether few or many, were on an equal footing in every sense of the word. 2. To the religiously inclined, it appeared to be a choice made not by humans, but by divine intervention, compare laws. 3. It provided protection against corruption and intrigue. It should also be noted that, although elected by lot, the individuals chosen were subject to scrutiny before assuming office. If found unqualified, they could be rejected even after their election, laws. Furthermore, they were liable to be held accountable after their term ended. In the election of counselors, Plato introduces an additional safeguard, they were not to be chosen directly by lot from all citizens, but from a select body previously elected by vote. In Plato's state, as we can infer from his silence on the matter, judges and magistrates performed their duties without receiving payment from the state. This ensured both their impartiality and their likely belonging to the higher class of citizens, compare Aristotle, politics. Therefore, it is not surprising that the use of the lot prevailed not only in the election of the Athenian council but also in many oligarchies and even in Plato's colony. The negative consequences of the lot were largely avoided if the magistrates elected in this manner did not receive pay from the state, unlike the dicasts in Athens. Another parallel is the popular assembly, which held supreme power in Athens but had only a diminished and secondary role in the laws. In Plato's writings, the assembly is described as an elective body with limited political and judicial power. However, in Athens, the assembly played a crucial role in the democracy, making decisions regarding war, peace, life, death, and the actions of generals and statesmen. No office or person was exempt from its control. Plato, on the other hand, minimized the importance of the assembly in his ideal community and narrowed its functions. He did not address the issue of central authority or the supreme power to resolve conflicts between lesser powers. Instead, he emphasized the nocturnal council, which resembled the Areopagus, but did not make it the governing body of the state. The judicial system in Plato's laws had similarities to that of Athens, but also significant differences. Plato often adopted the details of the Athenian system while rejecting its principles. In Athens, any citizen could be a judge and a member of the Heliaea, the great court. The Heliaea was usually divided into smaller courts, but there were instances where all 6,000 members of the court convened together. Plato noted that a few good judges were better than a large number. In capital cases, he limited the plaintiff and defendant to a single speech each, unlike the common practice in Athens of allowing two speeches per side. However, in private suits, Plato allowed two appeals, from the arbiters to the courts of the tribes, and from the courts of the tribes to the final or supreme court. This system did not exist in Athens. The appointment of the three courts in Plato's laws differed from Athens. The arbiters were chosen by the parties involved in the case, the judges of the tribes were elected by lot, and the highest tribunal was selected at the end of each year by the great officers of state from among their own ranks. These judges served for a year, underwent scrutiny, and voted openly, unlike the Athenian judges. Plato did not delve into procedural methods, leaving those details to younger legislators. In cases of murder and other capital offenses, Plato proposed a special tribunal, like the Athenian practice. Military offenses, like in Athens, were decided by the soldiers. Public causes in the laws, as in Athens, were voted upon by the entire population, as everyone was equally concerned. These causes were previously investigated by three principal magistrates. Plato also believed that all citizens should participate in private suits, as those who had no role in the administration of justice might feel excluded from the state. The wardens of the country, like the Forty in Athens, exercised judicial power in minor matters, as did the wardens of the Agora and city. Plato's laws had a better organized justice department compared to an ordinary Greek state. It followed more regular methods and had more distinct duties. The executive branch in Plato's laws, like in Athens, differed from that of modern civilized states. The main difference was that in ancient Greece, Government officials were not as distinct from other citizens as they are in modern times. 
the organization of government machinery was not as advanced as in modern states. The judicial, legislative, and executive departments were not as separate, and the general population was not as distinct from professional soldiers, lawyers, or priests. Aristotle also pondered the question of who should execute a sentence in his politics. It is likely that no police force existed in any Hellenic state to protect the lives and properties of citizens. Therefore, it was expected that every person would act as a watchman for others and be watched in return. The ancient Greeks did not seem to consider the principle of a division of labor in the administration of law and government. Every Athenian, at some point in their life, held various roles such as magistrate, judge, advocate, soldier, sailor, and policeman. They did not necessarily have private businesses, as a significant portion of their time was dedicated to public duties. This was also the case in Plato's laws. Citizens were expected to intervene in disputes if they were older than the combatants or to defend the victim if they were younger. They were obligated to come to the aid of a parent who was mistreated by their children and to prosecute the murderer of a relative. In certain cases, they were allowed to arrest offenders and even use force against abusive individuals. Any citizen over the age of 30 exercised magisterial authority, which could be enforced with physical punishment. In both the Magnesian state and Athens, thousands of individuals likely shared the highest government duties. In Plato's laws, a section of the council, consisting of 30 or 50 individuals, held office for a month or 35 days. It was almost as if, in our own country, the ministry or the houses of parliament were to change every month. The average ability of the Athenian and Magnesian councillors could not have been extremely high, considering there were so many of them. And yet they were entrusted with the performance of the most important executive duties. In these respects, the constitution of the laws resembles Athens far more than Sparta. All the citizens were to be, not merely soldiers, but politicians and administrators. There are numerous minor details in which the laws of Plato resemble those of Athens. These are less interesting than the preceding, but they show even more clearly how closely in the composition of his work Plato has followed the laws and customs of his own country. Evidence A. At Athens, a child was not allowed to give evidence, Telfi. Plato has a similar law, a child shall be allowed to give evidence only in cases of murder. B. At Athens, an unwilling witness might be summoned, but he was not required to appear if he was ready to declare on oath that he knew nothing about the matter in question, Telfi. So, in the laws. C. Athenian law enacted that when more than half the witnesses in a case had been convicted of perjury, there was to be a new trial, Anadikos Crisis Delphi. There is a similar provision in the laws. D. False witness was punished at Athens by loss of civic rights and a fine, Telfi. Plato is at once more lenient and more severe, if a man be twice convicted of false witness, he shall not be required, and if thrice, he shall not be allowed to bear witness, and if he dare to witness after he has been convicted three times, he shall be punished with death. Murder A. Uh, willful murder was punished in Athenian law by death, perpetual exile, and confiscation of property, Telfi. Plato, too, has the alternative of death or exile, but he does not confiscate the murderer's property. B. The parricide was not allowed to escape by going into exile at Athens, Telfi, nor, apparently, in the laws. C. A homicide, if forgiven by his victim before death, received no punishment either at Athens, Telfi, or in the Magnesian state. In both, Telfi, the planner of a murder is punished as severely as the perpetrator, and persons accused of the crime are forbidden to enter temples or the agora until they have been tried, Telfi. D. At Athens slaves who killed their masters and were caught red-handed, were not to be put to death by the relatives of the murdered man, but to be handed over to the magistrates, Telfi. So, in the laws, the slave who is guilty of willful murder has a public execution, but if the murder is committed in anger, it is punished by the kinsmen of the victim. Involuntary Homicide Ah, the guilty person, according to the Athenian law, had to go into exile and might not return until the family of the man slain were appeased. Then he must be purified, Telfi. If he is caught before he has obtained forgiveness, he may be put to death. These laws reappear in the laws. 
b. The curious provision of Plato that a stranger who has been banished for involuntary homicide and is subsequently wrecked upon the coast must take up his abode on the seashore, wetting his feet in the sea, and watching for an opportunity of sailing, recalls the procedure of the Judicium Fredium at Athens, according to which an involuntary homicide, who, having gone into exile, is accused of a willful murder, was tried at Friato for this offense in a boat by magistrates on the shore. C. A still more peculiar law, occurring both in the Athenian and Magnesian Code, states that a stone or other inanimate object which kills a man is to be tried, and cast over the border, Telfi. Justifiable or excusable homicide. Plato and Athenian law agree in making homicide justifiable or excusable in the following cases, 1. At the games, Telfi, 2. In war, Telfi, 3. If the person slain was found doing violence to a free woman, Telfi, 4. If a doctor's patient dies, 5. In the case of a robber, Telfi, 6. In self-defense, Telfi. Impiety. Death or expulsion was the Athenian penalty for impiety, Telfi. In the laws it is punished in various cases by imprisonment for five years, for life, and by death. Sacrilege. Robbery of temples at Athens was punished by death, refusal of burial in the land, and confiscation of property, Telfi. In the laws, the citizen who is guilty of such a crime is to perish ingloriously and be cast beyond the borders of the land, but his property is not confiscated. Sorcery. The sorcerer at Athens was to be executed, Telfi compare laws, where it is enacted that the physician who poisons and the professional sorcerer shall be punished with death. Treason. Both at Athens and in the laws, the penalty for treason was death, Telfi, and refusal of burial in the country, Telfi. Sheltering exiles. If a man receives an exile, he shall be punished with death. So, too, in Athenian law, Telfi. Wounding. Athenian law compelled a man who had wounded another to go into exile, if he returned, he was to be put to death, Telfi. Plato only punishes the offense with death when children wound their parents or one another, or a slave wounds his master. Bribery. Death was the punishment for taking a bribe, both at Athens, Telfi, and in the laws, but Athenian law offered an alternative the payment of a fine of ten times the amount of the bribe. Theft. Plato, like Athenian law, Telfi, punishes the theft of public property by death. The theft of private property in both involves a fine of double the value of the stolen goods, Telfi. Suicide. He who slays him who of all men, as they say, is his own best friend, is regarded in the same spirit by Plato and by Athenian law. Plato would have him buried dishonorably on the borders of the twelve portions of the land, in such places as are uncultivated and nameless, and no column or inscription is to mark the place of his burial. Athenian law enacted that the hand which did the deed should be separated from the body and be buried separately, Telfi. 14. Injury. In cases of intentional harm, Athenian law compelled the guilty person to pay double the damage, in cases of unintentional harm, simple damages, Telfi. Plato states that if a man wounds another in anger, and the wound is treatable, he shall pay double the damage, if untreatable or disfiguring, for times the damages. However, if the wounding is accidental, he shall simply pay for the harm done. 15. Treatment of Parents Athenian law allowed anyone to accuse another of neglect or mistreatment of parents, Telfi. Similarly, Plato instructs bystanders to assist a father who is attacked by his son and allows anyone to report children who neglect their parents. 16. Execution of Sentences both Plato and Athenian law give the winner of a lawsuit the power to seize the belongings of the loser if they do not pay within the specified time, Telfi. In Athens, the penalty was also doubled, Telfi, however, this was not the case in Plato's laws. Plato, on the other hand, punishes contempt of court with death, whereas in Athens it seems to have only resulted in an additional fine, Telfi. 17. Property. Ah, both in Athens and in the laws. A person who has disputed property in their possession must provide the name of the person from whom they received it, Telfi. Additionally, anyone searching for lost property must enter a house naked, Telfi, or, as Plato says, naked, or wearing only a short tunic and without a belt. 
b. Athenian law, as well as Plato, did not allow a father to disinherit his son without good reason and the consent of impartial individuals, Telfi. Neither grants any special claim to the eldest son on the paternal estate, Telfi. In the law of inheritance, both prefer males over females, Telfi. c. Plato in Athenian law enacted that a tree should be planted at a fair distance from a neighbor's property, Telfi, and that when a person cannot obtain water, their neighbor must supply it, Telfi. Both in Athens and in Plato, there is a law regarding bees, with the former stating that a beehive must be set up at a distance of at least 300 feet from a neighbor's property, Telfi, and the latter forbidding the luring of bees. 18. Orphans. A ward must take legal action against a guardian whom they suspect of fraud within five years of the end of the guardianship. This provision is common to both Plato and Athenian law, Telfi. Furthermore, Athenian law enacted that the closest male relative should marry or find a husband for a female heir, Telfi, a point that Plato closely follows. 19. Contracts. Plato's law that when a person makes an agreement which they do not fulfill, unless the agreement is of a nature which the law or a vote of the assembly does not allow, or which they have made under the influence of some unjust compulsion, or which they are prevented from fulfilling against their will by some unexpected chance, the other party may take legal action against them, according to Pollux, quoted in Telfi's note, also prevailed in Athens. 20. Trade Regulations Ah, lying was forbidden in the marketplace both by Plato and in Athens, Telfi. b. Athenian law allowed a legal action for recovery against a person who sold a defective slave as sound, Telfi. Plato's enactment is more specific, he only allows an unskilled person, i.e., someone who is not a trainer or physician, to take legal action in such a case. c. Plato diverges from Athenian practice in disapproving of credit and does not even allow the provision of goods on the deposit of a percentage of their value, Telfi. He enacts that when goods are exchanged by buying and selling, a person shall deliver them and receive the price of them at a fixed place in the marketplace, and be done with the matter, and that the person who gives credit must be satisfied whether they obtain their money or not, for in such exchanges they will not be protected by law. D. Athenian law prohibited an excessive rate of interest, Telfi, Plato allows interest in only one case if a contractor does not receive the price of their work within a year of the agreed-upon time and at a rate of 200% per annum for every drachma, a monthly interest of an obol. E. Both in Athens and in the laws, sales were to be registered, Telfi, as well as births, Telfi. 21. Sumptuary laws. Extravagance at weddings, Telfi and at funerals, Telfi, was forbidden in Athens and in the Magnesian state. There remains the subject of family life, which in Plato's laws combines elements of both Athenian and Spartan culture. Under this category, the condition of women and slaves can be included. Citizenship can also be added to family life. Like in Sparta, marriages are to be arranged for the benefit of the state and they may be dissolved for the same reason in the event of a failure to produce offspring as the interest of the state requires that each of the 5,040 lots should have an heir. Divorces are also permitted by Plato in cases of incompatibility, as they are in Athens by mutual consent. The duty of having children is also enforced by an even higher motive, expressed by Plato in the noble words, a person should strive for immortality and leave behind grandchildren to serve God in their place. Similarly, to Athens, a father is allowed to disown his disobedient son, but only with the consent of impartial individuals, Telfi, and the only lawsuit that a son can bring against a father is for incompetence. The class of older and younger men and women are still expected to regard each other, as in the Republic, as standing in the relationship of parents and children. This is a characteristic of Spartan character rather than Athenian. A unique reverence and tenderness were to be shown towards the elderly, parents or grandparents who were advanced in age were to be loved and respected like the image of a god and were believed to have more influence over their descendants than any lifeless statue. Great care was to be taken of orphans, they were entrusted to the fifteen eldest guardians of the law, who were to act as lawgivers and fathers to them, just as the archons did in Athens. Plato wanted to make the misfortune of being an orphan as little sad as possible. Plato, observing the disorder that had befallen half of humans in Athens and Sparta, intended to create a new way of life for them. 
he abandoned his fanciful theory of communism, but still desired to give women as much equality with men as possible. They were to be trained in the use of weapons and live in public. Their time was partly occupied with physical exercises, there was likely little family or private life among them. Their situation was meant to be better than that of Spartan women, who became hardened and common due to excessive physical training and lack of other education, and also better than that of Athenian women, who, at least among the upper classes, withdrew into a kind of secluded lifestyle similar to that of the East, but something better than either. They were to be the ideal mothers of perfect children, yet not completely consumed by the duties of motherhood, which were to be made as easy as possible for them, compare republic, but able to share in the dangers of war and be the companions of their husbands. In this aspect, more than anywhere else, the spirit of the laws reverts to the republic. When speaking of them as the companions of their husbands, we must remember that it is an Athenian, not Spartan, way of life that they are invited to share, a life of joy and brightness, not austerity and abstinence, which often degenerated into excess and vulgarity. During Plato's time, the issue of slavery greatly interested thoughtful individuals, and he himself pondered on how to best manage this troublesome piece of property. He acknowledged that slaves had often proven to be more loyal and helpful than brothers or sons in times of danger and were capable of providing important public services by reporting offenders, for which they were to be rewarded. Plato also held that a master who killed a slave to conceal a crime committed by the master was guilty of murder. However, slaves were not always treated with equal consideration. The punishments inflicted on them did not correspond to their crimes. They were to be addressed only with commands. Their masters were not to joke with them, as it would increase the hardship of their situation. Athenian law granted some privileges to slaves that Plato does not mention, they were allowed to buy their freedom from their master, and if they despaired of being liberated by him, they could demand to be sold, in the hope of falling into better hands. However, there is no suggestion in the laws that a slave who attempted to escape should be branded with the words Kate Chamey, Fugo, or that evidence should be extracted from them through torture, or that the entire household should be executed if the master was murdered, and the perpetrator remained undetected. These were provisions of Athenian law. Plato is more consistent than either the Athenians or the Spartans, as even in Sparta, the treatment of the helots was almost incomprehensible to us. On one hand, they were given weapons and served in the army, not only as attendants to their masters, but also, after being freed, as a separate group of soldiers called Neodemotes. On the other hand, they were victims of one of the greatest crimes in Greek history, Thucyd. The two great philosophers of Greece sought to free themselves from this cruel condition of human life but accepted its necessity. Plato expressed a noble and moving sentiment, inspired by their suffering, which can be quoted here, the right way to treat slaves is to behave properly towards them and to do them, if possible, even more justice than to those who are our equals, for he who naturally and genuinely reveres justice and hates injustice is revealed in his dealings with any class of people to whom he can easily be unjust. And he who, in regard to the nature and actions of his slaves, is untainted by impiety and injustice, will best sow the seeds of virtue in them, and this can truly be said of every master, tyrant, and anyone else who has authority over their inferiors. All the citizens of the Magnesian state were free and equal, there was no distinction of rank among them, as was believed to exist in Sparta. Their number was fixed, corresponding to the 5,040 lots. One consequence of this was the requirement that younger sons or those who had been disinherited should go out to a colony. In Athens, where there was not the same religious aversion to increasing the size of the city, the number of citizens must have been subject to considerable fluctuations. Several classes of people who were not citizens by birth were granted the privilege. Perpetual exiles from other countries, people who settled there to practice a trade, Telfi, anyone who had shown distinguished bravery in service to Athens, the Plataeans who escaped from the siege, medics and strangers who offered to serve in the army, and the slaves who fought at Arginusi, all of these could or did become citizens. Even those who were only of Athenian descent were considered citizens at different times. However, there were occasions when there was opposition to this inclusive expansion of the citizen body. This sentiment is reflected in Pericles' law, which stated that only those who were born to two Athenian parents could be considered citizens. 
adopted citizens never enjoyed full citizenship rights, such as the ability to be elected as an archon or priest. However, this restriction did not apply to their children if they were born to a citizen wife. Plato never considered granting citizenship to medics, let alone slaves. His treatment of medics was both more lenient and more severe than that in Athens. He did not impose any taxes on them but required them to behave properly. In Athens, medics were required to pay an annual tax and have a patron. On the other hand, Plato only allowed medics to reside in the Magnesian state if they pursued a trade. They were required to leave if their wealth exceeded that of the third class, or after 20 years of residence, unless they could demonstrate that they had greatly benefited the state. This privileged position is like that of the Isotelius in Athens, who were exempt from the Metoician tax. Plato's greatest concession to medics was granting them freedom, just as his greatest concession to slaves was granting them freedom. Furthermore, the laws of Plato can be considered from a broader perspective, as they contain principles of jurisprudence. These principles are not explicitly stated but are scattered throughout the text for the discerning reader to observe. Some of these principles are common to all courts of justice, derived from experience, while others are unique and characteristic. For example, the requirement for judges to sit at fixed times and hear cases in a regular order, the presentation of evidence, the disallowance of false witnesses, the punishment of corruption, and the right of defendants to be heard before conviction are rules that apply to courts of law in all times and places. However, there are also points that differ significantly between ancient and modern jurisprudence, and some of these points are of great importance. In Athens, it was not said, nor was it ever contemplated by Plato, that all men, including medics and slaves, should be equal under the law. Slaves had some legal protection, but it was not sufficient to safeguard them against the cruelty of their masters. It was a unique privilege granted by both Athenian and Magnesian law that a murdered man could pardon his murderer before dying, in which case no legal action would be taken against the murderer. This law is a remnant of an era when the punishment for offenses against a person was primarily the concern of the individual and their family, rather than the state. Plato's classification of crimes into voluntary, involuntary, and those committed out of passion only partially aligns with the modern distinction between murder and manslaughter. His attempt to analyze crimes is complicated by the Socratic paradox that all vice is involuntary. It is noteworthy that both in Plato's laws and in Athenian law, Theft is commonly punished by requiring the thief to return the stolen item twofold. The distinction between civil and criminal courts or suits was not yet recognized. Possession of property for a certain period granted a right of ownership. The religious aspect under which certain offenses were regarded often interfered with a fair and objective assessment of their guilt. Like our own legal system, Plato distinguishes between the intent to murder and actual murder. It is also forbidden both in Plato's laws and in Athenian law, to engage in libel in the marketplace or engage in personal attacks in the theater. In both Plato's laws and Athenian law, as well as in modern times, accomplices of a crime are punished along with the principal offender. Plato does not allow a witness in a case to act as a judge. Parties involved in a lawsuit are not allowed to take oaths. In both Athens and Plato's laws, Capital punishment for murder was not imposed if the offender was willing to go into exile. Respect for the deceased and duty towards parents are enforced by the law as well as public opinion. Plato proclaims the noble sentiment that the purpose of punishment is to reform the offender. Finally, he emphasizes twice, as if prophesying, that the crimes of the fathers should not be visited upon their children. In this regard, he is nobly distinguished from Oriental cultures and even from the spirit of Athenian law. This distinction is like the distinction between the Hebrew people in the age of Ezekiel and the Jewish people of earlier times. Plato's aim in his provisions is to align the practice of law more closely with reason and philosophy. He seeks to ensure impartiality and counteract the tendency of courts to become more popular assemblies while still acknowledging that every citizen has the right to participate in the administration of justice. This concludes Plato's writings and represents the final stage of philosophy that truly belonged to him. In the subsequent period, which we primarily learn about from uncertain hints provided by Aristotle, the spirit of Plato no longer prevailed. 
the doctrine of ideas gave way to a focus on numbers. Instead of progressing from the abstract to the concrete, Plato's theories were taken out of context and either affirmed or refuted with a frustrating literalism. The Socratic or Platonic element in his teachings was absorbed into the Pythagorean or Megarian philosophy. His poetry was transformed into mysticism, and his ethereal visions were subjected to logical analysis. His political theories lost their relevance after the freedom of Greece had disappeared. Among all his writings, the laws were the most distant from the teachings of the Platonic school in the next generation. Both his political and metaphysical philosophy were largely misunderstood by Aristotle. The best parts of his philosophy, his love for truth and his contemplation of all time and existence, were quickly forgotten. Some of his greatest ideas have been overlooked by humanity since they were first spoken. We have followed him throughout his forty or fifty years of writing, from his initial attempts to portray Socrates' teachings in a dramatic form, to the time when Socrates' character had vanished, and we have witnessed Plato's final reflections on Greece and philosophy. He, who was the last of the poets, only wrote prose in his Book of Laws, he himself had been influenced by rhetoric, which he had previously opposed in his earlier dialogues. The progression of his writings is also the story of his life, we have no other reliable account of his life. His writings are the true essence of the philosopher, stripped of the limitations of time and place. His great endeavor was first to understand abstract concepts and then to connect them. In his attempt to understand them, he entered a transcendental realm where he separated them from experience, and we moved away from the realm of science and into poetry or fiction. Mythological ideas temporarily obscured the gap between phenomena and existence, Mino, Phaedrus, Symposium, Phaedo. When Plato returned to reality, he encountered a difficulty that no longer troubles us. He could not comprehend how these stubborn, unmanageable ideas, residing alone in their abstract heaven, could be combined with each other, or applied to phenomena, Parmenides, Philebus, Sophist. What is a familiar process in our own minds appeared to him as the pinnacle of dialectical art. The difficulty that threatened to destroy philosophy in his own time has become meaningless and absurd. Through his conquests in the realm of the mind, our thoughts have expanded, and he has provided us with new dialectical tools of greater scope and power. We have tried to see him as he truly was, a great original genius struggling with limited knowledge, without a prepared system or a series of dialogues developing ideas he had long conceived. He was contradictory, constantly questioning as he went along, following the argument from one perspective to another, and thus arriving at opposing conclusions. He hovered around the light, sometimes overwhelmed by its brilliance, but always moving in the realm of ideal truth. We have also seen him in his decline, when the wings of his imagination began to droop, but his life experience remained, and he turned away from contemplating the eternal to take a final, melancholic look at human affairs. And so, after bringing forth noble children, Phaedrus, he ceased his literary labors. Over 2,200 years have passed since he returned to the realm of Apollo and the Muses. Yet the echoes of his words continue to resonate among humanity because, of all philosophers, he possesses the most melodious voice. He is the inspired prophet or teacher who can never die, the only one whose outward form adequately represents the beautiful soul within, he reflects the thoughts of those who came before him and anticipates those who come after him. Other philosophy teachers have withered away and turned to dust after a few centuries, but he remains fresh and vibrant, always generating new ideas in the minds of people. These ideas may be one-sided and abstract, but he possesses many facets of wisdom. He is not always consistent with himself because he is always moving forward and understands that philosophy encompasses more than what can be expressed in words, and that truth is greater than consistency. Those who approach him with the most reverent spirit will reap the most wisdom from him, while those who rely on ancient commentators will understand him the least. We can envision him in the groves of the academy, on the banks of the Elysis, or in the streets of Athens, alone or walking with Socrates, filled with thoughts that have since become the shared knowledge of humanity. Alternatively, we can compare him to a statue hidden away in a temple of Zeus or Apollo, no longer existing on earth a statue that bears the likeness of the gods themselves. Or we can imagine him, in another state of being, following the great company of heaven that he once beheld in a vision, Phaedrus. 
Thus, with a mixture of playfulness and seriousness, symposium, we linger around the memory of a world that has passed away, Phaedrus.